Ancient Anatolia. The history of the region's most powerful cities, kingdoms, and empires in antiquity. Written by Charles River Editors. Narrated by Victoria Woodson. Introduction. While the Bronze Age is recognized as one of history's most important phases, it's been hard for historians to precisely date. The idea of the Bronze Age comes from a three-age system developed in the 19th century through which archaeologists and historians believe cultures evolve. These three ages are the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age, and the concept of the system stems from the simultaneous development of museums in Europe during that time. In the Royal Museum of Nordic Antiquities in Denmark, Christian Jürgensen Thompson, the director of the museum, began classifying objects of stone, bronze or iron to better categorise and exhibit them. Each archaeological artefact was thus sorted according to their materials and further organised by shape and style. Through such methodology, working alongside archaeological reports, he was able to show how certain objects changed over time. This typology, combined with stratigraphy noted in archaeological reports, was useful to early archaeologists with no reliable method for dating artefacts. By understanding which object came before or after, early archaeologists had a relative dating system with which to assess the age of an object or culture. This kind of system was useful to the archaeologists who often encountered objects from above-ground burials that lacked stratigraphy. When this three-age system reached England, John Lubbock expanded on it by applying cultural anthropology to the ages. Over time, other researchers would gradually add their interpretations to the system, with many arguing for subdivisions of the Stone Age or the introduction of a Copper Age between the Neolithic and the Bronze Ages. Either way, the classification system was meant as a way for modern scientists to classify and understand prehistoric cultures, the final stage of which was the Iron Age, which ended when a culture developed the ability to record their history. Of course, given the rate of each culture's development, this means that when the historical period begins is not uniform or even universal. Troy is unquestionably one of the most famous and legendary cities of antiquity, yet it is also the most mysterious. While ancient cities like Rome and Athens survived, and the destruction of others like Carthage and Pompeii were well documented, the fame of Troy rested entirely on Homer's epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey. The poems were so famous in the ancient world that Augustus had Virgil associate Rome's foundation with the destruction of Troy and Aeneas's own Odyssey in the Aeneid. Augustus went so far as to have a new settlement, New Ilium, built in the region. While the epic poems have been read for thousands of years and are regarded among Western literature's most important, their depiction of the Trojan War between the Greeks and Trojans clearly included fictional elements. As a result, there has been much historical debate over whether the Trojan War actually happened. Up until the 19th century, many scholars merely regarded it as an ancient myth, but when Heinrich Schliemann used Homer's descriptions to guide his excavations, he found ruins in western Turkey of several ancient cities built atop each other, with the oldest dating to the 12th century BC. Further excavations have found early settlements on the spot dating as far back as 3000 BC. And while that hardly means Homer's tale is true, especially the constant divine intervention, it does suggest that there was a historical city of Troy that was destroyed in war. And the city of Troy associated with Homer's poems was the seventh city built on that spot. Of course, the war would likely have been fought over resources, not a woman whose face could launch a thousand ships. During the Late Bronze Age, from about 1500 to 1200 BC, the Near East was a time and place where great kingdoms and empires vied for land and influence, playing high-stakes diplomatic games, trading, and occasionally going to war with each other in the process. The Egyptians, Hittites, Babylonians, Assyrians, and several smaller Canaanite kingdoms were all part of this system, which was one of the first true global systems in world history, and also one of the most materially prosperous eras in antiquity. The major kingdoms are well known to most people, but among them were powerful neighbours, many of whom have been mostly overlooked. 
One of the successor states that bridged the gap between the Old Assyrian Empire and Middle Assyrian Empire was the Kingdom of Mitanni, which remains somewhat of an enigma to modern scholars and has therefore so far failed to gain the attention of wider, popular audiences. However, while it existed, Mitanni affected the course of history in the Near East just as much as any of the other major kingdoms, and there is little doubt that the kingdom was just as powerful and technologically advanced as its peers during its apex. The kingdom of Mitanni had a number of unique features in the region. The ethnic composition of Mitanni is relatively well known, but the background of the rulers remains a source of debate. The physical extent of the empire is also another problem historians face because the capital has never been positively identified and details of the nature of the Mitanni government remain in question. Furthermore, since few monumental structures have been uncovered, details about Mitanni religion and court life are mostly unknown. Thankfully, many of the Mitanni's contemporaries kept detailed records, and thanks to Egyptian, Hittite and Assyrian historical annals, along with Hurrian and Akkadian Mitanni administrative and legal texts, a picture of this brief Bronze Age empire can be painted. The Mitanni kingdom sprung from the Hurrian people to rule over the disparate Canaanites of the northern Levant, but within a few short generations its powerful neighbours to the west and east had obliterated it and all but erased its memory from history. The equally mysterious land of Arzawa is another late Bronze Age kingdom whose great power status has been questioned by some archaeologists and historians. Arzawa was a state or a collection of states in western Anatolia that challenged the Hittites for supremacy in the region. Although Arzawa never extended its borders beyond Anatolia, even at the apex of its military, diplomatic and economic power, it did draw the attention of the Egyptians and is mentioned in, in two of the famous Amarna letters. For that reason, many scholars have labelled Arzawa a late Bronze Age great power, but the designation has done little to flesh out the details of their enigmatic culture. Historians, archaeologists and philologists still argue over many elements of Arzawa and its people, including who they were, how powerful the kingdom was, and even where it was located. It is likely that not all of these questions will ever be answered, but an examination of Arzawa's culture and history, especially its relations with the Hittites, does help bring this Bronze Age culture into better focus. The Hittites dominated Anatolia for centuries, but remain somewhat enigmatic and perhaps little known to most people, but their influence on the ancient Near East is undeniable. From high on their capital of Hattusa in central Anatolia, the Hittites were able to conquer and control a kingdom that roughly comprised the area of the modern nation-states of Turkey, Syria, and parts of Iraq and Lebanon through a combination of brute military force and shrewd diplomatic machinations. Compared to some of their contemporaries, including the Egyptians, Assyrians and Babylonians, the Hittites were somewhat distant both culturally and geographically. The Hittites were an Indo-European, speaking in an ocean of Afro-Asiatic and Semitic groups. Their homeland was to the north of Mesopotamia, and it contained no major river like the Nile, Tigris or Euphrates rivers. The Hittite Empire was also far less enduring than its neighbours, as it only existed from about 1800 to 1200 BC, which was considerably shorter than most of the other major kingdoms of the Near East. With that said, the influence of the Hittites on the politics, economy and overall situation of the ancient Near East cannot be understated. The Hittites were a force to be reckoned with while they existed. The sources used to reconstruct Hittite history and chronology are many and varied, and since the Hittites were a literate people who developed a fairly sophisticated corpus of literature, ancient Hittite archives can be used to reconstruct events. Unfortunately, the Hittites were not keen about dating their sources, so most of the dates are dependent on ancient Egyptian sources. The Egyptian sources also provide excellent details on events that either the Hittites refused to mention in their own texts, have not been discovered yet, or have been lost to the ages. Of course, modern archaeology has also helped to fill in the knowledge about Hittite civilization, especially in regards to palace and religious life in the ancient capital of Hattusa. The transition from the Bronze to the Iron Age during the late 13th and early 12th centuries, B. 
BC arguably changed the structure and course of world history more fundamentally than any period before or since. And at the centre of this period of turmoil was a group of people known today as the Sea Peoples, the English translation of the name given to them by the Egyptians. Despite their prominent role in history, however, the Sea Peoples remain as mysterious as they were influential. While the Egyptians documented their presence and the wars against them, it has never been clear exactly where the Sea Peoples originated from, or what compelled them to invade various parts of the region with massive numbers. Whatever the reason, the Sea Peoples posed an existential threat to the people already living in the region, as noted by an Egyptian inscription. The foreign countries made a conspiracy in their islands. All at once the lands were removed and scattered in the fray. No land could stand before their arms, from Hatti, Kode, Karkemish, Arzawa and Alashia on, being cut off at one time. A camp was set up in Amuru. They desolated its people and its land was like that which has never come into being. They were coming forward toward Egypt while the flame was prepared before them. Their confederation was the Peleset, Tjeka, Shekelesh, Denyen and Weshesh, lands united. They laid their hands upon the land as far as the circuit of the earth, their hearts confident and trusting. Our plans will succeed. As with any historical matter from the ancient world, the sources can be a problem. The ancient Egyptians recorded their interactions with the sea peoples in both written texts and in pictorial reliefs, and thus provide the most complete contemporary description of them, but the nature of ancient Egyptian historiography was quite different than the modern concept, so the sources cannot be considered entirely reliable. Later Greek sources, both historiographical and mythological, can help fill in some more details, but those sources are suspect because they were written several centuries after the emergence of the Sea Peoples. Modern archaeology is beneficial in determining how people lived and possibly where they moved. But there are also problems when one relies too much on archaeological data because the dating of material culture is not an exact science. Finally, linguistic evidence is often employed to determine the geographic origins and eventual landing points of many of the Sea Peoples. But confusion often arises if a group's demonym refers specifically to their place of origin or final home. Naturally, the mystery surrounding the Sea Peoples has led to all kinds of theories aiming to identify them. While plenty of theories are plausible, there are other fanciful theories that have attempted to associate the Sea Peoples with the Atlantic Ocean, and even Troy. Thus, the transition from the Bronze to the Iron Age during the late 13th and early 12th centuries, BC arguably changed the structure and course of world history more fundamentally than any period before or since, and at the centre of this period of turmoil, was a group of people known today as the Sea Peoples, the English translation of the name given to them by the Egyptians. Despite their prominent role in history, however, the Sea Peoples remain as mysterious as they were influential. While the Egyptians documented their presence and the wars against them, it has never been clear exactly where the Sea Peoples originated from or what compelled them to invade various parts of the region with massive numbers. Whatever the reason, the Sea Peoples posed an existential threat to the people already living in the region, as noted by an Egyptian inscription. The foreign countries made a conspiracy in their islands. All at once the lands were removed and scattered in the fray. No land could stand before their arms, from Hatti, Kode, Karkemish, Arzawa and Alashia on, being cut off at one time. A camp was set up in Amaru. They desolated its people and its land was like that which has never come into being. They were coming forward toward Egypt, while the flame was prepared before them. Their confederation was the Peleset, Tjeka, Shekelesh, Denyen and Weshesh, lands united. They laid their hands upon the land as far as the circuit of the earth, their hearts confident and trusting. Our plans will succeed. As with any historical matter from the ancient world, the sources can be a problem. The ancient Egyptians recorded their interactions with the Sea Peoples in both written texts and in pictorial reliefs, and thus provide the most complete contemporary description of them. But the nature of ancient Egyptian historiography was quite different than the modern concept, 
so the sources cannot be considered entirely reliable. Later, Greek sources, both historiographical and mythological, can help fill in some more details, but those sources are suspect because they were written several centuries after the emergence of the Sea Peoples. Modern archaeology is beneficial in determining how people lived and possibly where they moved, but there are also problems when one relies too much on archaeological data because the dating of material culture is not an exact science. Finally, linguistic evidence is often employed to determine the geographic origins and eventual landing points of many of the Sea Peoples. But confusion often arises if a group's demonym refers specifically to their place of origin or final home. Naturally, the mystery surrounding the Sea Peoples has led to all kinds of theories aiming to identify them. While plenty of theories are plausible, there are other fanciful theories that have attempted to associate the Sea Peoples with the Atlantic Ocean and even Troy. Among all the early Iron Age people from the Near East, the Phrygians are perhaps one of the most misunderstood. They built a powerful and wealthy kingdom, but were overshadowed by their more powerful and wealthier neighbours, the Lydians. Although the Phrygians were literate, most of their surviving texts have been little use to modern historians who desire to reconstruct their chronology, so they are left to use often biased classical and Assyrian sources. Problems concerning nomenclature have also clouded the modern understanding of Phrygia and the Phrygians. The Greeks would often refer to numerous non-Phrygian peoples as Phrygians, and while the Persians acknowledged the Phrygians as a distinct people, they only considered them so as part of a satrapy or province in the vast Achaemenid Persian Empire. Although there are numerous inherent problems concerning any modern study of ancient Phrygia and the Phrygians, there are still a number of sources that can help illuminate the many aspects of Phrygian culture. The majority of the sources utilised in this study come from the ancient Greek historians, but the Assyrians also wrote about the Phrygians in their annals. The classical and Assyrian sources are augmented with archaeological and numismatic evidence from Phrygia. And finally, some of the Phrygian language inscriptions are also considered. The following study reveals that the Phrygians were much more than just their most famous king, Midas. They played an important role in the redevelopment of ancient Anatolia after the Bronze Age collapse and were at times a focal point in the battles between the Greeks and Persians. After the Sea People's raids of the late 13th and early 12th centuries, BC ravaged the eastern Mediterranean region and brought down the Hittite Empire. The Phrygians were one of the peoples who picked up the pieces and helped bring civilization back to the region. In the course of the centuries during the early Iron Age, the Phrygians developed an important, wealthy and vibrant culture that rivaled the Kingdom of Lydia but eventually fell victim to larger empires to their east and west. As the Phrygians' history suggests, few could compare with the Lydians in terms of wealth and opulence. From the early 7th century BC until the middle of the 6th century BC, the Lydians played an important role in the history of the eastern Mediterranean region as they took on the role of middleman between the empires of the Near East and the emerging Hellenic civilization in Greece. From their capital in Sardis, the Lydian kings traded and made alliances and war with numerous kings, tyrants and generals, which ultimately cemented their role as a brief but historically important people and kingdom in the ancient world. An examination of the Lydian people and their kingdom reveals that their power did not materialise overnight, but was instead a long process, dependent upon several factors. The primary factor contributing to Lydia's success was its wealth. The Lydians were fortunate enough to possess large deposits of precious metals within in their territory, but how they exploited and utilised those resources is what truly made them successful. They were the first people to invent a currency which not only allowed them to create a thriving economy within their own territory, but gave them tool with which to influence both their friends and enemies abroad. The wealth of Lydia impressed non-Lydians to the point that even the most sublime Greek philosophers who generally eschewed wealth praised the high culture of Lydia and the Lydian people in general and the greatness of their capital city of Sardis in particular. Lydia was also successful because its kings were shrewd, politically savvy men who knew the supreme art of diplomacy. The Lydian kings would make alliances based not only on their immediate interests, 
but also with a view to the future, as they would often play one kingdom against another. Ultimately, despite their wealth and guile, the Lydians found themselves the victims of the Achaemenid Persian juggernaut, which consumed their kingdom, along with many others, in the mid-6th century BC. But even after Lydia was conquered by the Persians, the Lydian people, and especially the city of Sardis, continued to play an important role in the history of the region. At one point in antiquity, the Achaemenid Persian Empire was the largest empire the world had ever seen. But aside from its role in the Greco-Persian Wars and its collapse at the hands of Alexander the Great, it has been mostly overlooked. When it has been studied, the historical sources have mostly been Greek, the very people the Persians sought to conquer. Needless to say, their versions were biased, and attitudes about the Persians were only exacerbated by Alexander the Great and his biographers, who maintained a fiery hatred towards Xerxes I of Persia due to his burning of Athens. The Macedonians targeted many of his building projects after their capture of Persepolis, and they pushed an even bleaker picture of the king, one of an idle, indolent, cowardly, and corrupt ruler. It was not until excavations in the region during the 20th century that many of the relics, reliefs and clay tablets that offer so much information about Persian life could be studied for the first time. Through archaeological remains, ancient texts and work by a new generation of historians, a better picture can today be made of this remarkable civilization and their most famous leaders. Unmasking Troy in some respects, the Iliad, the story of the War of Troy, Ilios to the Greeks, is arguably the greatest piece of Western literature ever composed. With murky origins, but in all likelihood dating to more than a thousand years before Christ, the Iliad has proven to have a staying power virtually unparalleled by any other literary work. Three millennia after it was originally composed, the tale of the Trojan War still has the power to captivate readers with its dashing poetry and its wonderfully crafted tale of honour, love, lust and revenge. Much about the Iliad to this day is hotly debated, whether it was the product of a single magnificent blind storyteller, Homer, as the Greeks believed, who then went on to produce a sequel of sorts, the Odyssey, whether Homer first composed the Iliad, but not the Odyssey, or vice versa whether some or all of the characters and events depicted are mythological, or whether they have some basis of fact, and whether Homer himself existed at all, or was merely a convenient blanket name for an unspecified number of poets, who all added their own twists, tweaks and tales to a story that grew with each passing year. What we do know for certain, however, are two things. First, regardless of who devised the story, the Iliad was not transcribed until centuries after its creation, but was instead memorised by poets who would recite parts or the entire poem at banquets and public holidays and passed down by word of mouth. Most importantly, we now know the ancient city of Troy did indeed exist. The ancient Greeks themselves, who gifted the world this epic piece of literature, certainly believed that the Iliad was historical fact. Even the sceptics who doubted the more far-fetched moments in the poem, which features frequent direct interventions from the gods themselves on the battlefield and quasi-invulnerable warriors slaughtering hordes of enemies, did not doubt that the broad narrative of the events matched historical fact. Indeed, many of the great Greek city-states were fiercely proud of their respective mentions in the stanzas of the Iliad. These included mighty Sparta, whose fiery king Menelaus started the whole affair when his beautiful wife Helen was stolen by Paris, thus giving rise to the saying that Spartan women were the most beautiful in all of Greece, and Mycenae, whose high king Agamemnon reminded the once great city of the glory days when it controlled a coalition holding sway over virtually all of Greece, all the way to small towns like Phthia, home of Achilles, and Ithaca, the kingdom of Odysseus. Almost all of Greece could proudly cite a great name who had fought in the most famous of all wars, and the value of tracing a city's ancestry all the way back to the Trojan War proved so enduring that a full millennia after the poem was first composed, the Roman Emperor Augustus encouraged his court poet, Virgil, to compose an epic in the style of the Iliad and Odyssey, which would integrate them into the foundation myths of Rome. Thus the Aeneid, 
the tale of how Prince Aeneas, one of Hector's cousins, fled from the burning city of Troy and journeyed across the Mediterranean before eventually settling in central Italy and starting the line of the legendary Roman king Romulus, was born. To this day, the story of the Trojan War clearly continues to captivate audiences despite being thousands of years old, having been tackled by dozens of writers of historical fiction with varying degrees of success. The Iliad was also adapted in recent years into a major Hollywood blockbuster, Troy, which went on to achieve global commercial success, despite scholars lamenting some radical departures from the original poem. In the 21st century, both the Iliad and the Odyssey are required reading in schools and are often studied in the original Greek or in Latin or Italian translations. However, despite an enduring fascination with the Iliad, which can be found as a common thread throughout the history of Western literature, in the wake of the Roman Empire's heyday, belief in the historicity of the Iliad gradually waned and was replaced by a significant degree of scepticism. Indeed, for much of the 18th and 19th centuries, the general consensus was that Troy had never existed at all, and that the entire poem was completely fictional, until one visionary archaeologist, Heinrich Schliemann, travelled to Asia Minor and almost literally used the Iliad as his reference textbook to unearth the remains of what he firmly believed was Troy. Today, the scholarly consensus, although debated, tends to hold that much of what occurred in the Iliad was historically correct, as borne out by the archaeological evidence found in Troy itself. Although the history of Troy is both long and troubled, and does not merely encompass the events of the Iliad, the city was sacked more than once during its existence and was not completely destroyed at the end of the Trojan War. It is worth summarising those events, as narrated by Homer, to give readers some insight into the tale that first made Troy legendary. The story of the Trojan War is not merely enclosed in the Iliad, which only encompasses just a small facet of the epic conflict. The Iliad picks up after the Greek armies have already landed before the city walls and ends with the funeral games of the Trojan hero Hector. However, the narrative can be pieced together from flashbacks in the Odyssey and ancillary works, many of which did not survive antiquity, and together these works flesh out the story to provide a background to the Iliad's events and explain Troy's tale right up to the famous sack of the city. The Greeks and Romans took the historicity of the Iliad for granted, although the Odyssey, with its mythological beings, was given a slightly healthier dose of scepticism, but this belief waned during the Middle Ages, and eventually the Iliad was considered to be little more than a myth. If Troy had existed, popular scholarly belief held, it was certainly long gone and it was unlikely to be in Anatolia, where tradition had long placed it. Some even presumed that Troy had actually once stood somewhere on mainland Greece. One 15th century writer noted that the Turks were still capitalising on the fame of Troy by directing would-be tourists to a site they claimed had the remains of the famous city. Spanish traveller Pedro Tafur wrote, I travelled by land for two days to that place which they say was Troy but found no one who could give me any information concerning it, and we came to Ilium, as they call it. This place is situated on the sea opposite the harbour of Tenedos. The whole of this country is strewn with villages, and the Turks regard the ancient buildings as relics and do not destroy anything, but they build their houses adjoining. That which made me understand that this was indeed ancient Troy was the sight of such great ruined buildings and so many marbles and stones and that shore and the harbour of Tenedos over against it and a great hill which seemed to have been made by the fall of some huge building. Of course, Tafur had been brought to more recent Roman and Greek ruins closer to the Aegean than the actual location of Troy. Ultimately, the concerted efforts of Homeric scholars and amateur archaeologists Heinrich Schliemann Wilhelm Dorpfeldt and Frank Calvert were to prove that notion false. The main architect of the discovery of Troy was the German, Heinrich Schleimann, who, like many pioneers, was an eccentric with a coloured past. Born in 1822 in Nebukau, Germany, he was one of the first modern archaeologists, and according to one popular story, Schleimann first became enamoured with Homer's opus when he heard a drunkard reciting it in a grocery store. 
A more credible story suggests that it was Schliemann's father, a widower, who first encouraged the young Heinrich's love for the classics by reading to him from the Iliad. It was often claimed by Schliemann, late in his life, that at age eight he had already declared he would excavate the city of Troy himself. Schliemann was initially enrolled in a prestigious school, but after his father was accused of embezzlement of clerical funds, he was forced to transfer to a less respected institution, which in turn he had to depart from when his father ran out of money to pay for the tuition. With little prospect of continuing his scholarly career, Schliemann became a grocer's apprentice, but after four years of unrewarding labour, he had to give up that career when he injured himself, lifting a heavy weight in the stockroom. Schliemann, then aged 19, moved to Hamburg and took up a position as a cabin boy on a schooner named Dorothea. However, on Schliemann's first voyage, just twelve days out to sea, the Dorothea was struck by a gale and sank. Schliemann, along with a scattering of other survivors, was swept onto the Dutch shore, clinging to a spar. From there, he made his way to Amsterdam, where he became a bookkeeper. This was the start of a long and profitable career, which saw Schliemann travel to Germany and Russia. It was during this period, using a six-week system of his devising, that Schliemann learned Russian and Greek, the first of fourteen languages which Schliemann became proficient in before his death. This was an immensely advantageous asset in his business ventures, which also, due to his mastery of Greek, became the bedrock for his future study of the Iliad. In 1851, Schliemann moved to America after hearing that his brother, who had made himself rich in the California gold rush, had died and left him a substantial sum as an inheritance. Schliemann became a banker in the US, acquiring American citizenship, but he also began claiming to have been present at events he had been nowhere near, such as being at a dinner with President Fillmore and the San Francisco Fire of 1851. The following year, he sold his business and moved to Russia, where he met and married Ekaterina Lishin, though their relationship was far from a happy one. Two years later, the Crimean War broke out between Russia and the alliance of England, France and Turkey. Schliemann embarked upon an extremely lucrative career as a merchant during the war, selling gunpowder ingredients such as saltpetre and sulphur, as well as lead for bullets, to the Russian military. In 1858, two years after the war's end, he was rich enough to quit work entirely. It was at this point that the wealthy 36-year-old began to indulge his stated lifelong dream the search for Troy. Between 1858 and 1866, he travelled extensively, studying for a brief period at the Sorbonne and spending more and more time away from his increasingly estranged wife. In 1868, Schliemann visited Pinarbasi in Turkey, which diplomat and local landowner Frank Calvert believed to be the location of Troy. While Pinarbasi was close to the correct location, it was the wrong settlement and Schliemann was unconvinced by Calvert's findings. He then toured the Greek islands and mainland, visiting the sites of classical antiquity and publishing a thesis in ancient Greek, offering a topographical analysis of Ithaca, Odysseus's legendary home. The University of Rostock awarded him a doctorate, even though it was later suggested that he had plagiarised much of his thesis from other works and simply translated them into Greek. Regardless. Schliemann then returned to Pinarbasi, where he consulted with Calvert, and eventually the two men concluded, based on their interpretation of the Iliad's description of the Trojan plain and the location of the two rivers which flowed through it, that the nearby hill at Hisalik was the true site of Troy. Hisalik was an artificial hill, meaning that the earth there had been built up over generations due to human activity on the site, and it was located less than five miles from the Aegean Sea. Calvert had attempted to convince the British that Hisalik might be the right site in an effort to get their assistance, but the British refused to budge. In Schliemann, Calvert found a person who had both the resources and the will to excavate the site there. Schliemann and Calvert began digging on Hisalik, which was part owned by Calvert and the Turkish government. The excavation quickly yielded ruins which an excited Schliemann declared could not be Troy, but must instead be a subsequent city. However, the location was exact. 
If they dug down through the various archaeological layers to the lowest inhabited point, Schliemann believed, they would hit Homeric Troy itself. Using the Iliad, a quasi-mythological account of a war that took place thousands of years earlier, as a geographical textbook, the two men had done the impossible. They had found Troy. As Schliemann wrote, I have proved that in a remote antiquity there was in the plain of Troy a large city, destroyed of old by a fearful catastrophe, which had on the hill of Hisarlik only its Acropolis, with its temples and a few other large edifices, southerly and westerly direction on the site of the later Ilium, and that consequently this city answers perfectly to the Homeric description of the sacred site of Ilios. The digging went on for months, during which Schliemann grew increasingly lonely since he had divorced Ekaterina earlier that year. Eventually his friend, the Archbishop of Athens, introduced him to his niece, the seventeen-year-old Sophia Engastromenos, whom he later married, despite the vast age gap between them. Meanwhile, as Schliemann settled down to married life, the excavation of Troy continued. Schliemann insisted that the upper levels of the city were worthless to him, because they were too recent, and he and his men dug hurriedly through them, destroying invaluable archaeological evidence in the process. Due to his high-handedness with ancient artefacts and buildings, Schliemann fell out with Calvert, who accused him of being blinded by his own dreams. Calvert was so disgusted by Schliemann's behaviour at the site that in 1872 he published a paper stating that there was a thousand-year gap in the extant chronology of the excavated city, in which he believed the actual city of Homeric Troy fell. Schliemann, however, had reached the lowest construction level and firmly believed that he had found the city of Priam and Hector. In 1873, his beliefs were given further credence when he unearthed a hoard of gold and jewels amid the ruins of Troy, which he dubbed Priam's treasure, and paraded for the world to see. He even wrote about how he sent workers on break, so he and his wife could instead dig the treasure out themselves. While the men were resting and eating, I cut out the treasure with a large knife. This required great exertion and involved great risk, since the wall of the fortification beneath which I had to dig threatened every moment to fall on me. But the sight of so many objects, every one of which is of inestimable value to archaeology, made me reckless. I never thought of any danger. In fact, different objects within the treasure clearly dated to different centuries, and thus did not constitute one treasure. But nevertheless, his wife Sophia modelled several of the pieces in a famous photograph, and Schliemann also fabricated a tale, which did nothing but damage his reputation, of how he and his wife dismissed the workers and carried the treasure away in her shawl, despite the fact that his wife was not even present at the time. The following year, Schliemann published his notorious study, Trojan Antiquities, describing his findings, and he was promptly sued by the Turkish government who claimed that the treasure had been discovered on state land. With the authorities coming to seize the treasure, Schliemann obtained Calvert's help in smuggling it out of Turkey, from whence it made its way to the Pergamon Museum in Berlin and, in the wake of World War II, to the Pushkin Museum in Russia. In the process of these early excavations, the excavators unearthed thousands of ancient artefacts, including gold jewellery that ranged from bracelets to earrings and necklaces, as well as brooches. There were also everyday artefacts, such as bowls and vases, as well as weaponry that included swords, daggers and axes. Schliemann even claimed to find a coin with an image depicting Hector and an inscription that read, Hector of Troy. One of the issues that arose regarding what was found during these excavations is the fact that Schliemann fabricated so frequently, or as scholar David Trail put it, Schliemann was a pathological liar. It's been hard to verify what Schliemann found, what Schliemann smuggled out of the country, and which items among Schliemann's claimed findings actually never existed. Due to his efforts, Schliemann was able to dupe the Turkish government by buying out their claim to the items simply because the government had no idea how much existed. On top of all that, Schliemann sought all the glory by downplaying the efforts of others like Calvert, and it obviously worked because he remains the individual prominently associated with the discovery of Troy to this day. 
For obvious reasons, Schliemann quickly became persona non grata in Turkey, so he left the country and journeyed to Greece, where he proceeded to excavate other Homeric sites, chiefly Mycenae, the home of Agamemnon, and Ithaca, home of Odysseus. These excavations led to several important discoveries, most notably the famed gold funeral mask, which Schliemann dubbed the Mask of Agamemnon. Despite having no evidence it had any association to the famous king, Schliemann exclaimed, I have gazed on the face of Agamemnon. In 1878, having patched matters up with the Turkish government, Schliemann returned to the hill at Hisarlik to continue his excavation, this time joined by French Orientalist Emil Burnouf and a German scholar Rudolf Virchow. A third excavation followed in 1882, and finally a fourth in 1888, which carried on until 1890. During the last excavation, Schliemann worked with the brilliant German archaeologist Wilhelm Dorpfeld, with whom he also argued regarding the importance of preserving the layers above the one he believed was Homeric Troy. Dorpfeld suspected all along that this was not even the correct site at all. Despite the repeated digs, Schliemann was unable to unearth anywhere near as much treasure as he had uncovered in 1873, and Priam's treasure remained the only find that had any value aside from archaeological merit. In 1890, following the worsening of a chronic ear infection, Schliemann left Troy first for Athens, and then, when his condition deteriorated, to mainland Europe. Despite the advice of his physicians, Schliemann continued to travel throughout Europe, reaching Naples in December. Although he managed to make a trip to Pompeii, his condition took a dramatic turn for the worse, and he died in Naples on December 26, 1890, at the age of 68. He was buried in Athens, as he had wished. Schliemann was clearly not a perfect individual. A con man and a trickster, he made his fortune by what essentially amounted to war profiteering and his unsubtle approach to archaeology, not to mention his stubborn belief that he was right and all others were wrong, meant that he did incalculable damage to the very city he had spent his whole life trying to discover. However, despite these shortcomings, it is still fair to say that without him, Troy might never have been found at all, or at least not for a long time. It was his visionary reliance on the Iliad as a textbook which led to the excavation of the hill at Heisalik. Following Schliemann's death, excavation work was taken over by Dorpfeld. Mindful of Calvert's assertion that a thousand-year gap existed in the archaeological chronology of the excavation, and that the ruins Schliemann had identified as Homeric Troy was in all likelihood inaccurate, Dorpfeld took a far more scientific and methodical approach to the excavation. Dorpfeld confirmed that there were several Troys, and he discovered the existence of an even more ancient settlement beneath the site unearthed by Schliemann, all built upon the ruins of the previous city. This suggested that another, far more recent layer of ruins was in fact Homeric Troy. Moreover, during his excavation, Dorpfeld discovered a section of ancient walls which was weaker than the rest, suggesting it had been the object of a rather rushed repair. This section's location and general appearance corresponded perfectly with a description given by Homer of a weaker section of the walls of Troy in the Iliad, leading Dorpfeld to conclude he had stumbled across Homeric Troy itself. Dorpfeld proceeded with the excavation under this assumption and subsequently unearthed more than 300 yards of wall, including a sizable stone bastion, which he assumed must be the much-mentioned Great Tower of Ilios from Homer's poem. Additionally, further confirmation of the fact that it was Dorpfeld and not Schliemann who had found Homeric Troy came from the discovery of several large caches of Mycenaean pottery within this level of the ruins. This find, coming as it did from a period when Mycenae was at the apex of its power, would suggest that Troy was not only known to the Mycenaeans, but enjoyed a close degree of contact with them. The only doubt which clouded Dorpfeld's conclusion that he had found the city described in the Iliad was that the damage to walls and edifices was consistent with that caused by an earthquake, rather than by an invading army. Indeed, one of Schliemann's conclusions for stating that the more ancient ruins he excavated were actually Homeric. Troy was that the walls and buildings appeared to have been scorched, as if by a great fire, 
the kind of damage depicted by Homer. In the wake of Dorpfeld's survey, the site was further explored from 1932 to 1938 by Carl Blagan, who concluded that there had been a total of nine cities erected at Hisarlik and the surrounding plain, with Hisarlik being the city's acropolis. These became known as Troy 1 through 9, and Blagan theorized that the site had been almost continually inhabited from approximately 3000 BC until the reign of Augustus in the 1st century AD. Furthermore, he identified almost 50 sublevels within the nine different strata, indicating subsequent redevelopments to existing structures. According to this division, Schliemann's Troy, now considered to be incorrect, was Troy II, circa 2600 BC, while Dortfeld's was classified as Troy VI, circa 1600 BC. After Blegen's excavations, the site lay relatively untroubled for almost 50 years, until in 1988, a joint archaeological expedition by the University of Tübingen and the University of Cincinnati, overseen by Professors Manfred Kaufmann and Brian Rose, began excavations at the site once more. Working on the basis of the observations made by preceding scholars, Kaufmann and Rose set to work, and their teams unearthed sizable amounts of bronze arrowheads in the ruins of Troy Seven, suggesting the city had been the site of a huge battle. Furthermore, finds of scorched buildings and bodies indicated a violent sack of the city which led to its abandonment around 1200 BC. The Different Troys Troy has not been a fortunate city. Over the course of its history, spanning approximately three millennia, it saw more than its share of tragedy and catastrophe as witnessed by the fact that it was abandoned and rebuilt at least nine times. The rebuilding followed various disasters, and it was bad enough that the site was eventually abandoned in antiquity. By contrast, Rome, which is approximately 3,000 years old, has been continuously inhabited since at least the Bronze Age, despite being sacked several times, and suffering other major calamities like fires during its history. Of course, while all the focus has been on discovering the famous city that was the scene of the Trojan War, there were many other settlements on that site, and each has its own story as well. Founded sometime around 3000 BC, Troy I was a flourishing early Bronze Age settlement with impressive fortifications for the period, suggesting that the legend of the unbreachable walls of Troy truly had ancient roots. Troy's strategic location on the Dardanelles Straits, what was known in antiquity as the Hellespont, proved invaluable for its commercial concerns. All shipping wishing to pass from the Black Sea area to the Aegean or vice versa was forced to negotiate the narrow gap of the Hellespont, whose approach Troy commanded. Presumably, at this time Troy also employed a powerful navy to better guard the straits and take full advantage of their location as a trading hub. Founded around 2600 BC, Troy II was the city discovered by Schliemann. To this day, it still bears the location names which he ascribed to it based on the Iliad, despite the fact later excavations demonstrated that Troy VII is almost certainly Homeric Troy, though to a lesser degree, Troy VI is also a possibility. What served to convince Schliemann this was Homeric Troy, besides the remnants of massive walls, and the evidence of widespread destruction presumably caused by an attack, was the discovery among the ruins of this level of a colossal gate, unlike any of the three previously unearthed during the excavation. This edifice was believed by Schliemann to be the Skaean Gate, since its geography was roughly correct. The Skaean Gate was the scene of many ferocious battles between Trojans and Greeks in the Iliad. It was before this gate that Menelaus defeated Paris, and the spot where Achilles cut down Hector. It was in a mad attempt to scale it that Achilles met his end at the hands of Paris. However, as appealing as this notion is, the Skian Gate of Troy II is approximately 1,200 years too old to be the correct structure. Troy III was founded sometime around 2300 BC in the wake of the unknown event which destroyed Troy II. This city lasted approximately 150 years before it was abandoned once more, but scholars are still not sure what caused this particular decline. During this period of history, Troy was a thriving trading hub, as it had been in the previous millennia and a half. Indeed, 
as shipping technology reached progressively greater heights, Troy's wealth increased as more and more trade began to take the faster seaborne route rather than the laborious and costly overland roads. Troy IV lasted from approximately 2100 to 1950 BC and was occupied almost immediately following the abandonment of Troy III, with little time between the two. Like its predecessors, Troy IV continued to be a flourishing mercantile hub, which is interesting because while Homer depicts the later Troy as an exceedingly wealthy and powerful city, the Greek army was able to land its thousand ships on the beaches before the plain of the Scamander with no opposition whatsoever from the Trojan navy, which is treated as if it didn't exist. Although this might be for narrative purposes, it is unlikely that Homer would have foregone the opportunity for depicting a climactic sea battle, making the lack of a Trojan navy, if their position of strength was control of the Hellespont, a particularly surprising feature. Presumably something happened to reduce or make redundant the Trojan navy in the period before Troy VII. Troy V, dated circa 1900 to 1700 BC, was a wealthy and powerful city in its own right. But early in the 1900s, BC, it faced a grievous threat. The Hittites, an aggressive civilization from Anatolia, moved north and west towards the Aegean Sea, sacking and destroying several major cities along the way. The Hittites were a particularly fearsome menace because their rise signified the end of the Bronze Age. They were the first nation to develop the use of iron tools and, above all, weapons. Bronze weapons were problematic in battle because they tended to break, bend or lose their edge, particularly swords, spears were marginally more effective, whereas iron weapons were far more powerful. Although Schliemann's apologists point out that Homer extensively references bronze armour and the wall of bronze of Greek and Trojan shields, bronze armour remained the norm for a long period after the rise of the Hittites, despite the period being termed Iron Age and despite the fact weapons were usually made of iron. Additionally, such perishable military items as arrowheads, although these would have been recovered if possible, were likely crafted out of inexpensive bronze. There is no evidence of widespread carnage taking place during the 1900s BC, but there appears to have been a drastic cultural change with powerful Hittite influences observed by archaeologists regarding the architecture and everyday items recovered. While it is possible that Troy was simply an enclave surrounded by Hittite cities, it seems far likelier that Troy simply capitulated without much of a fight before the inexorable Hittite advance and was subjugated by the Hittite culture. Dorpfeld's Troy VI, which he believed was the city Homer had composed his poem about, dates from around the 1600s BC to approximately 1250 BC. As previously mentioned, Dorpfeld was led to conclude that he had unearthed Homeric Troy due to the discovery of a vast set of walls far larger than those unearthed by Schliemann. Troy II's walls were a little more than three feet wide at the base, which, while impressive for the period, were nonetheless dwarfed by those of Troy VI. These walls, coupled with a bastion which Dortfeld assumed was the Great Tower of Ilios, and a section of wall which was weaker than the rest, as described by Homer, led to Dortfeld's assumption. However, subsequent archaeological evidence confirmed that Troy VI was destroyed by a vast earthquake rather than by the actions of an invading army, and once it had been destroyed, it stayed vacant for a very brief period of time before being reconstructed almost entirely. Chaotic alleys and haphazard roads gave way to a more orderly system. Thus, presumably, a city that had grown piecemeal was levelled and the survivors reconstructed it with logical planning. Almost certainly the city of which Homer's Iliad spoke, Troy seven dates from the 13th century BC to around 950 BC. Archaeologists have determined that four sublevels existed within Troy 7, specifically Troy 7a, 13th century BC, Troy 7b1, 12th century BC, Troy 7b2, 11th century BC, and Troy 7b3, until 950 BC. Troy 7 was walled and had towers along the walls that were over 30 feet high. One of the site's excavators, Manfred Kaufmann, suggested Troy 7 covered over 50 acres of land and was probably home to upwards of 10,000 people, making it, 
by the standards of its day, a large and important city. The Troy of Homeric legend appears to have been the first of the Troy Sevens, the city which was reconstructed in the wake of the earthquake which levelled Troy VI. This Troy suffered extensive destruction around 1190 BC, which matches the ancient Greek historiography that placed the construction of the ancient walls of Troy around 1282 BC and its destruction by Agamemnon's army in 1183 BC. Many buildings from this Troy were found to have been scorched by fire or toppled, and human remains were found throughout the site, with one having apparently sustained a significant number of battle wounds. Additionally, bronze arrowheads were also recovered in this layer, suggesting a battle had taken place there. The 1988 excavation also revealed that the extent of walls was far vaster than the previous excavations had revealed, suggesting a city that was far more sizable than initially believed. Despite the ravages inflicted by the Greeks, however, the city was not wholly abandoned, or if it was, it did not remain so for long. The remains of Troy 7 B1 date to around 1120 BC, and this Troy was destroyed by fire, which was always a risk for antiquity's big cities due to the many open fires, combustible building materials, and no organised fire brigades. Troy 7 B2 likewise was ravaged by flames, whereas Troy 7 B3 was abandoned sometime in the mid-10th century BC for unknown reasons, possibly the consequence of a plague. It is reasonable to assume that given Troy's catastrophic history, despite its advantageous position, the location would have begun to be regarded as cursed by the region's inhabitants. This might explain why the ruins of Troy remained vacant for more than two centuries until signs of habitation and construction reappear with Troy 8 sometime around 700 BC. Once again, however, disaster seems to have struck. Within a relatively brief period of time, Troy 8 was abandoned by its inhabitants, and it remained abandoned for almost 300 years. Troy 9 marks the shift from the Greek Ilios to the Roman Ilium. It was founded in approximately 20 BC by the Romans, presumably under the auspices of the Roman Emperor Augustus, who was a great admirer of Homer, and commissioned Virgil to create a foundation myth for Rome based upon the Homeric template, the result of which was the Aeneid. While part of the reason behind Troy's resettlement was undoubtedly political, the re-establishment of a city which was sacred to the Greeks, as evinced by Alexander the Great's sacrifices at its ruins, the Romans took full advantage of Troy's strategic position near the Hellespont. With the backing of the powerful Roman navy to ensure supremacy over the local waters, Troy became a sizable and powerful city in its own right, bolstered by the wealth of levies collected from trading vessels and acting as port and commercial hub between Europe, Asia and Asia Minor. Troy remained a key city in Anatolia under Roman rule until the designation of Constantinople as capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. Located less than 300 miles away from Troy on the Bosphorus Straits, which were far easier to control because they were far narrower, Constantinople quickly became the commercial, cultural and political hub of the Eastern Roman Empire, rivaling even Rome in the West. As a result, Troy's fortunes rapidly declined, and with no more mercantile money filling the city's coffers, its population gradually dwindled until it was abandoned almost completely by the end of the 4th century AD. Of the foundation myths which Troy and the Iliad inspired, the Aeneid is by far the most famous. Supposedly descended from the goddess Aphrodite, who frequently shielded him from harm, and related to Hector, Priam and Paris, Aeneas was depicted in the Iliad as a minor character, despite his status. Virgil, however, did not invent the tale of Aeneas settling in the area where Rome would eventually be founded by his alleged grandson Romulus, but instead collated together a number of other poetic works and legends to produce his own opus. The Julio-Claudians, the dynasty whose most prominent early scions were Julius Caesar and Augustus, traced their descent to Aeneas, and thus Romulus. Supposedly, following the sack of Troy, Aeneas fled the city with his father Anchises carried on his back and dragged his infant son by the arm, and he and his crew fled in a ship and danced about the Mediterranean in a series of adventures to rival the Odyssey. Eventually, 
they washed up on the shores of Latium, from whence they trekked inland to the hills where Rome would one day rise, and settled there with the goodwill of Latinus, king of the Latins. Of course, even though law has it that Aeneas was Romulus's grandfather through his mother Rhea Silvia, this could not have been accurate. If Troy fell in 1183 BC and Rome was founded in 753 BC, the gap is obviously far too wide. As the Aeneid suggests, the Romans viewed the Trojans more sympathetically than the Greeks, primarily because they were not Greek. The Romans were at odds with the Greek city-states for much of their early history, and the Romans could commiserate with the Trojans being subjected to invasion when their only fault had been to shelter Helen. Thus, the popularity of Trojans was widespread throughout the Roman era, with even minor characters getting their chance to shine. One popular legend has it that Idomeneus, king of Crete, was hit by a storm on his way home and promised Poseidon he would sacrifice the first living being he encountered if his ship weathered the gale. The storm passed, and Idomeneus returned to Crete only to find his young son waiting upon the shores to be the first to greet him. True to his word, Idomeneus sacrificed his son to Poseidon. But this murder so infuriated the other gods that they sent a pestilence upon Crete, forcing Idomeneus into exile. From there he journeyed to Calabria, Italy, where he is said to have founded the Gens Salentina, the original inhabitants of the region of Salento in southern Italy. Foundation myths relating to Troy were not confined to the Roman era either, showing the breadth and power of Troy's influence. Dynasties all across Europe flocked to attain some legitimacy by claiming some form of Trojan descent, with the legendary kings of Britain being said to descend from Brutus, Aeneas's grandson, and thus, obliquely, they were related to the Julio-Claudians of Rome. Likewise, the Palemonides, a dynasty of Lithuanian nobility who in the Middle Ages feuded bitterly with the Teutonic Knights, claimed descent from the Julio-Claudians all the way through to Aeneas and Aphrodite. Indeed, if legend is to be believed, the Trojan diaspora in the wake of the Greek invasion populated half of Europe. Based upon a passage in the works of the ancient historian Jordanes, who asserted, rather dubiously, that the Goths sacked Troy in the wake of a war with Agamemnon, the Franks, who like the Goths were a Germanic tribe that moved into Western Europe under pressure from other tribes further east and settled in France, claimed descent from the legendary Trojan kings. According to Fredegar, one of the earliest Frankish historians, Priam was the first king of the Franks. It is worth noting that this was no mere idle boast to fill a gap in the historical record and provide the Frankish kings with some much-needed ancient pedigree. For much of the Frankish nobility, this was a genuine article of faith. Such was the enduring power of this myth that in 1714, when the scholar Nicolas Frerret set out to prove that the Franks, and thus the current French dynasty of Bourbon and Valois, had been Germanic rather than Trojan in origin, he was incarcerated in the Bastille. In fact, the myth of Troy reached further than anyone might ever have thought possible. The legendary Scandinavian poet Snorri Sturluson, who composed the famed epic Prose Edda, argued in the poem's prologue that several famous Nordic gods and heroes were descended from Trojan warriors. Thus, for example, he claimed that Memnon, a Trojan ally who came late to the war and was slain by Achilles in battle according to several accounts, actually survived the war and moved north through Europe, setting up a series of kingdoms as he went before settling in Scandinavia. According to Sturluson, he fathered none other than the god of thunder, Thor. During the Middle Ages, due in part to the resurgence in popularity of literature from ancient Rome and Greece as ecclesiastical and noble literacy spread in the wake of the Dark Ages, Troy was particularly popular. Around the year 1155, approximately 2,000 years after the Iliad itself, French poet Benoit de Saint-Maur composed his celebrated Roman de Troyes, an epic poem that mimicked the style of the Iliad's Latin translation, along with such works as the Odyssey and the Aeneid, but deferred to 12th century stylistic conventions which dictated that, according to the tenets of courtly love, some form of impossible love triangle in the fashion of Lancelot Guinevere Arthur existed between the protagonists. In this case, the lovers involved were Briseis, 
the daughter of Chalcas, the Trojan soothsayer who defected to the Greeks, the Trojan prince Troilus, and the Greek warrior Diomedes. Although the woman at the apex of the triangle was originally named Briseis, this changed to Chryseis in later versions and eventually to Cressida in Shakespeare's celebrated The Romance of Troilus and Cressida, further proof of how far-reaching and all-encompassing Troy's influence is upon Western culture. Clearly Troy has never failed to capture the imagination, and the debate about it remains heated and even somewhat acerbic today, with some scholars going so far as to argue, convincingly if erroneously, that it never was located in Anatolia at all. According to Iman Wilkins, a controversial author who published a study named Where Troy Once Stood, the origins of the Iliad are not Greek, but English. Wilkins argued that Troy stood in modern England and that the two factions, the Greeks and the Trojans, were actually two rival groups of Celts. Wilkins has gone so far as to identify several locations in Cambridgeshire and Brittany as being the ones mentioned in Homer's epic. This fascinating, though almost certainly misplaced, study shows just how pervasive Troy's legend is. Today, the mythical city's ruins, which were safeguarded by UNESCO when their status was upgraded to a World Heritage Site in 1998, remain a powerful draw for tourists, scholars, aficionados and hobbyists. With a further excavation utilising the latest state-of-the-art techniques, not previously available to archaeologists underway as of 2006 and presumably more in the future, it's safe to assume even more of the site will be unearthed, and scholars will discover even more about the city that witnessed such high drama. The Iliad continues to be a powerful force in the collective imagination, with literally hundreds of reimaginings from direct translations to historical epics and graphic novels, most notably David Gemmell's Troy series, and Rosemary Sutcliffe's magnificently illustrated Black Ships Before Troy. Yet this obsession with the Iliad is by no means a modern fad. From the ancient Greeks onwards, Various civilizations have attempted to draw a connection with what was undoubtedly one of the most famous cities in antiquity. Regardless of the ongoing developments and the discoveries of recent and future excavations, it is unquestionable that Troy and the legend of the Trojan War continue to fascinate and captivate generations of readers for centuries yet to come. Hittite and Assyrian Trade Networks Despite being located next to so many neighbours, some of whom were powerful in their own right, such as Arzawa and Ahiyawa, it was the Hittites who eventually dominated the region and became a world power. Ironically, the road to their status as a power was arduous, and it began simply with an Assyrian trading post. In the late 3rd and early 2nd millenniums BC, the Assyrians, who lived to the south of the Hittites in northern Mesopotamia, developed sophisticated trade networks that snaked across central Anatolia and Mesopotamia. The Assyrian capital of Assur was the central point of the network that traded in textiles from Babylonia, tin from the east, and silver and gold from Anatolia. A lot has been learned about this ancient merchant system, from the discovery of more than 20,000 tablets that Assyrian merchants left in the Anatolian city of Kanesh, the early centre of Hittite culture and the origin of the name they gave to their language, Nessi. There were two types of Assyrian trading towns. The Karum, which meant key or harbour in Akkadian, was the primary trading centre of a city, while the Wabatum was a smaller trading centre that functioned in a subordinate manner to the nearest Karum. One of the most interesting aspects of the Assyrian trade network was that it was carried out largely by private entrepreneurs. The Assyrian king was not directly involved, and it's unclear why the Assyrian king did not take a more dominant role in the merchant activities of his people during the old Assyrian period. Scholars have theorised that Assyrian kings might not have wanted to upset a system that worked, or that the kings were not yet powerful enough to influence such intricate networks. The journey from Asher to Kanesh lasted about 50 days, and was impossible during winter, because the passages through the Taurus Mountains were blocked due to ice and snow. During trading seasons, Assyrian merchants carried the tin and textiles on donkeys that they all traded, including the donkeys, when they arrived in Anatolia for silver or gold. These merchants would then bring those goods back to Asher. 
In turn, the Hittites would see more than just material and economic benefits from the Assyrian trade network. The earliest Hittite inscriptions coincide with their involvement in the Assyrian trade networks, which leads some modern scholars to conclude that the networks were the catalyst for Hittite literacy. This theory is more than plausible when one considers the spread of knowledge along other important trade routes throughout history. The Silk Roads of the late ancient and early medieval world were established primarily to transport exotic and manufactured goods between Asia and the West, but many concepts, including writing and numerous religions, also travelled along the roads. No doubt the Hittite merchants were impressed not only with the wealth of the Assyrian merchants, but also their elevated level of culture, of which writing was a paramount symbol in the ancient world. Ultimately, the culturally and economically lucrative Assyrian trade routes came to a sudden end with the arrival of a new ethnic group to the region, the Hurrians, around 1780 BC. The Hurrians would later play a significant role in the history of the Hittite kingdom and the entire Near East, but at the time they appeared as simple and violent interlopers. The Origins of the Hittites Although modern scholars knew about the Hittites through the Bible as well as Egyptian and various Mesopotamian texts, the culture remained enigmatic for a long time because the language was unknown. In fact, when historians discovered the ruins of ancient Hattusa in the late 19th century and the thousands of cuneiform tablets with Hittite inscriptions that were in it, it still took decades to decipher the language. Norwegian scholar J. Knutsen was the first to decipher the Hittite language in 1902, which he termed Arzawan, and it was called as such for some time. Eventually, Arzawan was determined to be an Indo-European language, which proved to be an interesting discovery in itself, since most of the neighbouring kingdoms spoke languages that were either Semitic or derived from Afro-Asiatic. The cultural linguistic origins of the Hittites can be a bit confusing when one considers the numerous names for their language and some of their Anatolian neighbours. The Hittites called their language Nesili, while the Egyptians and Mesopotamians referred to them and their language as Hittite, and their land as Hatti. Technically, the Hittites spoke Arzawan, but Arzawa was also the name of a kingdom that neighboured Hatti, and those people also spoke the same language as the Hittites. During the era of the Hittite civilization, there were three written Indo-European languages that coexisted in Anatolia, Hittite, Luwian, and Palic. The earliest Hittite inscriptions are dated to around 1900 BC, which makes the language the oldest written form of any Indo-European language. Almost as important as the Hittites' Indo-European background was their homeland in Anatolia. Anatolia, which is today known as Turkey, is a mountainous region rich in metal deposits that were economically important in the ancient Near East. Archaeological excavations have revealed that by 6000 BC, before the Hittites had even entered the region, Anatolian metalsmiths had mastered the intricate techniques of smelting and had begun to produce copper tools. The mineral-rich mountains of Anatolia would help play a role that propelled the Hittites and their neighbours to economic and political power. But before the Hittites became the hegemonic power in Anatolia, they would have to contend with a number of other kingdoms who also coveted the valuable minerals of the Anatolian mountains. Modern scholars know about most of the Hittites' Anatolian neighbours through a combination of Hittite, Egyptian and Mesopotamian texts but the precise location of the kingdoms remains somewhat problematic. Due to the lack of any maps that have survived from the period, and also the overall absence of cartographic methods or knowledge by the Hittites and any of their contemporaries, the Greeks were the inventors slash discoverers of cartography. Modern scholars are left to locate the various non-Hittite Anatolian kingdoms based on historical texts that describe known mountain passes, rivers and other geographical landmarks. This has occasionally resulted in differing opinions. For example, the most important Anatolian neighbour of the Hittites, Arzawa, is believed by some of have been located in southwestern Anatolia, while other scholars find fault with this assessment, even though they agree that it was located somewhere in western Anatolia. The Luka lands are another region often referred to in the Hittite texts, whose precise location continues to elude modern historians. 
Most believe that the Luca lands were somewhere in western Anatolia, but how far west and how much area was encompassed by the Luca is an open question, although it is now believed that Luca may have been the Hittite term for Luwian. If Luca meant Luwian, then the actual geographic space may have fluctuated as Luwian speakers migrated through Anatolia. Scholars believe that the Kingdom of Milawanda was also located near the Luca lands in northwestern Anatolia. Hittite sources reveal that they probably also had contact with early Greek cultures in the form of the Achaean and Mycenaean peoples. Moreover, Hittite texts refer to a land of Ahiyawa, which is believed to have been either along the southwest Anatolian coast or on the adjacent islands where early Mycenaean settlements have been found. Some historians believe that the similarity in the words Ahiyawa and Achaean is evidence, along with archaeological revelations, that the Hittites were in contact with the early Greeks. The Hittites may have also known and negotiated with the legendary city of Troy, which is now known to have been located in northwest Anatolia. The Hittite Old Kingdom Although the Hittites were a literate people and kept a large number of documents, Recreating the chronology of their empire has remained difficult. Most of the extant Hittite inscriptions were written in the 14th and 13th centuries BC, and it remains unclear if these were copies of earlier documents or if they were merely set in previous periods for propaganda purposes. The issues confronting people's understanding of Hittite texts is not confined to the history of the Hittite kingdom either as it is a problem that experts of any ancient Near Eastern society continue to face. In large measure, this is because of the fact that while the Hittites and their contemporaries kept detailed historical records, their concepts of history were vastly different than the modern one. Today's historiographical methods are largely influenced by the Greeks, who were the first people to write narrative and critical histories, whereas the Hittites and their contemporaries did not write history for edification purposes, but instead mixed myth and theology with historiography. As a result, modern historians like Mario Liverani have cogently argued that ancient Near Eastern texts must be viewed as sources of knowledge of the people who wrote them, not necessarily as accurate portrayals of the events described. Given these general problems concerning ancient Near Eastern historiography, in addition to more specific issues relating to Hittite historiography that will be discussed in more detail below, modern scholars have reconstructed Hittite chronology into two periods, the Old and New Kingdoms. This is the case despite the fact nobody is sure of the empire's precise chronology. For instance, there are no Hittite primary sources that detail the period from the end of the Assyrian trading settlements until the emergence of the Hittite state. Nonetheless, a fairly reasonable view of Hittite chronology can still be put together. The first king of the Hittite Old Kingdom was the eponymously named Hattusili I, who led the conquest of the central Anatolian city of Hattusa. One of the earliest Hittite historical texts, known as the Anita text, is written in both the Hittite and Akkadian languages and reads like a literary autobiography, detailing how Anita first became the Hittite great prince. Although Hattusili I was descended from a different family than Anita's, the text was viewed by the king as extremely important since it established the precedence of rule in the Hittite world and was actually written down during Hattusili's life, not Anita's. The Anita text demonstrates that Hattusili saw the importance of legitimizing his royal family, but experts believe there was already a defined political structure in Hattusa before the dynasty was established. The elders of the various cities, high priests and military commanders in Hittite society all formed an assembly, known in Hittite as the Panku, which advised the king on important matters. The Panku may have been an ancient Indo-European tradition, similar to the Germanic tutor, that the Hittites brought with them into Anatolia. Regardless, Hattusili I subsequently established a dynasty and royal tradition to go along with pre-existing Indo-European traditions and thereby formed a kingdom that would last hundreds of years. Perhaps the most important thing the first Hittite king did was to choose Hattusa as the capital. In the ancient Near East, certain cities played crucial roles in the cultural and political lives of ruling dynasties, 
sometimes to the point, as in the case of Babylon, that dynasties were identified with the city where they resided. Besides Babylon, some of the great cities of the ancient Near East were Memphis, Thebes, Byblos, Ur, Asher, and Hattusa. The Hittite capital may not have been as old or as enduring as the other cities, but Hattusa was for a time on par with any of the other great Near Eastern cities as the heart of the vibrant Hittite empire. In fact, modern knowledge of the Hittites can all be traced back to Hattusa, as it was the location of the greatest number of textual and archaeological remains. Indeed, the city has been excavated continuously by German archaeologists since 1906. Hattusa was located both within the centre of Anatolia and the middle of the Hittite territory in a strategic hilltop position. As such, Hattusa was the centre of Hittite religion, discussed further in depth below and it was ideally located in the middle of Anatolia's agricultural breadbasket. Hattusa was different from the other major cities of the ancient Near East in one major respect. It was landlocked and not located on a major river. At first glance, such a situation may seem like a liability, which it was in terms of trade, but for the most part its central position meant that the Hittites could move their armies more efficiently from one theatre of operations to another. As a landlocked capital, Hattusa was also safe from naval attacks from other kingdoms, so if the Hittites' enemies wanted to invade their capital, they would have to trek through the middle of the kingdom to get there, which was most unlikely. As Hittite power grew during the Old Kingdom, the royal city of Hattusa became more important and even wealthier. From his citadel overlooking Hattusa, Hattusili I launched the first major Hittite attacks into the Near East, first conquering the cities between Hattusa and the Mediterranean. Hattusili I was able to take the port city of Alala, which served as a port for the ancient and prosperous city of Aleppo. Archaeological work at Alala has confirmed that the attack and subsequent sacking took place between 1650 and 1600 BC, which would probably place the event during the reign of Hattusili I. The reasons for Hattusili I's military ventures outside of Anatolia are not clear, but there were probably numerous factors. The limited agricultural production of Anatolia, along with the population growth, may have spurred the Hittites covet the more fertile North Levantine Syria region. Other intangible factors may have been in play too. For example, the warrior culture and militaristic nature of Hittite society no doubt propelled the early Hittite kings to strike out in order to appease their storm god, and the material riches of the older cultures of the Levant and Mesopotamia may have been a motivating factor. Hattusili I also assaulted the Arzawan kingdom in Anatolia, perhaps for their tin supply, but he was ultimately forced back east when the Hurrians attacked that flank of the Hittite kingdom. Either way, Hattusili I established the precedent of an active warrior Hittite king that most of his successors followed or at least attempted to follow, and the Hittite Old Kingdom witnessed its greatest extent of power and wealth under Hattusili's successor and grandson, Musili I who followed the same pattern of aggressive foreign policy with much more success, as he was able to sack Aleppo in 1595 BC and take control of the southeastern trade routes as far as the middle Euphrates River region. Masili I then did what no Hittite king did before or after him by successfully marching against and sacking Babylon. The Babylonian Chronicle, which was essentially the history of Babylon compiled by Babylonian priests, gives a brief mention of Masili I's campaign. At the time of Samsuditana, the Hittites marched against Akkad. Musili I's reign was cut short when he was assassinated by his brother-in-law, Hantili I, who then ruled a relatively stable kingdom, but the peace soon dissipated, and Hatti was plunged into a dark age. The Hittite Dark Age lasted approximately 70 years and was marked by a number of violent coups, as well as the steady loss of all the lands gained by previous rulers. The Dark Age ultimately ended with the accession of Telepinu to the throne around 1525 BC. Today, historians know so much about what led to the Dark Age and its details because the events were meticulously recorded in what is now known as the Edict of Telepinu. 
The edict presents the king as the saviour of the Hittite kingdom, who restored order and glory to the empire. The text reads, But, as Massili reigned as king in Hattusa, his sons, his brothers, his in-laws, the people of his clan and his soldiers were gathered around him in harmony, and he held the land of the enemy conquered with his strong arm. He conquered the lands in their entirety and made them into the frontiers of the sea. He went to Aleppo and destroyed it, and the captive population of Aleppo and their possessions he brought here to Hattusa. But after that he went on to Babylon and destroyed Babylon. He fought against the Hurrians and the captive population and their possessions he displayed in Hattusa. Hantili was cupbearer at that time and had Harapsili, the sister of Masili, as his wife. Zidanta led Hantili on, and they planned an evil deed. They murdered Masili and shed blood. The edict then goes on to describe how Masili's assassins met similar fates as the Hittite state crumbled. It continues, As soon as Hantili was old and about to become a god, Zidanata murdered Pisani, the son of Hantili, together with his sons, and also the noblest of his servants he murdered. And Zidanta also ruled as king, and the gods sought the blood of Pisani, and made Amuna, his own son, into his enemy, and he murdered his father Zidanta. Eventually, Telepinu put an end to the fratricide and regicide that was rife at the Hittite court, and established order once more by defeating his foreign enemies and codifying new laws. As soon as I, Telepinu, seated myself on the throne of my father, I campaigned in Hasua, en route to Komajin, and destroyed Hasua. My troops were also in Zizlipa, and there was a battle in Zizlipa. Further, he who becomes king and plans evil against his brother or his sister, you are the assembly for him. Simply say to him, that matter is a blood deed. Consult the tablet. Earlier the blood deed was great in Hattusa, and the gods have imposed it on the great family. If he is found guilty, then he shall be beheaded. But he shall not be killed secretly, as with Zuru, Danua, Tahuwaili, and Tarushu. Evil shall not be done to his house, his wife, and his children. If a royal son acts criminally, he shall also pay with his head. But no evil shall be done to his house and his children. For whatever reason royal sons may be executed, it has no meaning for their houses, their fields, their vineyards, their slaves, their slave girls, their cattle, and their sheep. Thanks to these efforts, Telepinu is viewed as one of the greatest Hittite kings, but before he could end the orgy of violence in the Hittite Dark Age, a new and powerful state came to power in Hatti's backyard. While the Hittites had been preoccupied with killing each other during the middle of the second millennium BC, the Hurrian people coalesced and formed a powerful kingdom in northern Mesopotamia and the Levant known as Mitanni. For a brief period, Mitanni was one of the most powerful kingdoms in the ancient Near East, and it was a perpetual thorn in the Hittites' side for over two hundred years. Like the Hittites, the Hurrians had somewhat enigmatic origins. Although not an Indo-European speaking people, they worshipped Indic gods and introduced the chariot, which was developed by Indo-Europeans, into the ancient Near East. The Indo-European element of Hurrian culture may have been introduced when a Hurrian king hired Indo-European mercenaries, who then subsequently overthrew the king and established their own dynasty. Despite sharing some vague cultural similarities, the Hittites and Hurrians engaged in numerous wars that eventually resulted in the destruction of the Mitanni state. The Hittite New Kingdom The period of the Hittites' greatest influence on the ancient Near East is referred to as the New Kingdom, which began with the rule of Tudalia I in the late 15th century, but it was Supaluliuma I, who ruled from about 1370 to 1330 BC who truly made the kingdom a strong, militaristic empire. There is an abundance of texts that document his reign, but most are dated to a much later time during the reign of Hattusili III, about a century later. Supiluliuma The first came to the throne while the mighty Amenhotep III ruled in Egypt, and Kadishman Enlil I sat on the throne in Babylon. Known for his military endeavours, Supiluliuma first conquered lands the Hittites had lost in Anatolia during the Dark Age, before he turned his attention south to Mitanni. At the same time, 
Sopiluliuma was also a diplomat who saw the virtues of providing for his people through peaceful means. Instead of attacking Babylon and overextending his empire as Mersili I did, Sopiluliuma I contracted a marriage with the Babylonian king's daughter. Perhaps Sopiluliuma I hoped to one day make a claim to the throne of Babylon, or one of his potential future sons from the Babylonian princess could. But all of his sons appear to have been born to a Hittite queen. Despite Sopiluliuma, the first's diplomatic relations with Babylon and other great powers of the ancient Near East, it was military prowess that made the Hittite state strong and cemented its reputation in history. Not surprisingly, the Hittite army was a well-oiled machine that was employed surgically to root out problems across its empire and expand its borders. At the head of the army, as commander-in-chief, stood the Hittite king, who also often led his troops into battle. Behind the king marched his troops, but at the head of the troops were the elite charioteers. Hittite chariots, like those of most of their contemporaries from other kingdoms, consisted of a wooden frame covered with leather, but they were different from their contemporaries in one notable respect. The axle was attached to the middle of the body rather than the rear. The design of the Hittite chariots meant that they were much slower than the chariots of their adversaries. But they had an advantage because three men, instead of the usual two, could ride in the chariot. A Hittite chariot team would consist of the driver, a shield-bearer, and a warrior who usually fought with a stabbing spear. Conversely, the Egyptians used lighter chariots that could only hold two men, the driver and a shield-bearer, with the driver also serving as an archer. The elite Hittite chariot forces were supported by a larger infantry force that wore helmets and carried shields. Body armour, as seen from reliefs, appears to have been a leather sleeveless jacket that was worn over a corslet that was possibly bronze. The infantry would fight in a phalanx with long spears and then daggers when the phalanx was broken. While Egyptian charioteers used bows, it appears that only light infantry used the bow in the Hittite army, and, based on pictorial representations from Egyptian reliefs, it seems they never used composite bows. For the most part, the Hittites had roughly the same military technology as their contemporaries, but the Hittites' kings were able to get the most out of those weapons to forge an empire. After Supaluliuma, the first reasserted Hittite hegemony over Anatolia, he turned his attention south to the kingdom of Mitanni. His first attack on Mitanni was unsuccessful, but during the second attack he sacked the capital city of Washukani, which ultimately led to the murder of the Mitanni king Tushrata at the hands of his own people. Supaluliuma I then made the wealthy Syrian cities of Karkimish and Aleppo vassal states and subjugated Mitanni to a similar status. The successful campaign was documented in a treaty between Supaluliuma and the new Mitanni king, Kurtiwaza. I, the son Supaluliuma, the great king, the king of the Hatti land, the valiant, the favourite of the storm god, went to war. Because of King Tusrata's presumptuousness, I crossed the Euphrates and invaded the country of Isua. I, the son Supaluliuma, the great king, the king of the Hatti land, the valiant, the favourite of the storm god, reached the country of Alsa and captured the provincial centre Kutmar. To Antaratal, of the country of Alsa, I presented it as a gift. I proceeded to the provincial centre Suta and ransacked it. I reached Wasukani. The inhabitants of the provincial centre Suta, together with their cattle, sheep and horses, together with their possessions, and together with their deportees I brought to the Hatti land, Tusrata the king, had departed. He did not come to meet me in battle. With the Hittites' primary enemies defeated, Supiluliuma was able to concentrate on advancing his kingdom's interest peacefully once more, and an olive branch came to him from Egypt in a most unusual way. There are no known primary documents dated before and during most of Supaluliuma's reign that indicate any animosity existed between the Egyptians and Hittites, but that would change at the end of the Hittite king's rule. An extant Hittite text, dated to the reign of Mersili II, demonstrates that an Egyptian queen, probably the widow of the young king Tutankhamun, requested Supaluliuma send one of his sons to Egypt for her to wed. The letter reads, 
While my father was down in the country of Carchemis, he dispatched Lupakis and Tesub Zalmas to the country of Amka. They proceeded to attack the country of Amka and brought deportees, cattle and sheep home before my father. When the people of the land of Egypt heard about the attack on Amka, they became frightened because to make matters worse, their lord Bibururias had just died. The Egyptian queen who had become a widow sent an envoy to my father and wrote him as follows. My husband died, and I have no son. People say that you have many sons. If you were to send me one of your sons, he might become my husband. I am loath to take a servant of mine and make him my husband. When my father heard that, he called the great into council. Perhaps they have a prince. They may try to deceive me and do not really want one of my sons to take over the kingship. The Egyptian queen answered my father in a letter as follows. Why do you say, they may try to deceive me? If I had a son, would I write to a foreign country in a manner which is humiliating to myself and my country? The letter was most unusual, because although Egyptian kings quite frequently married foreign princesses, they never allowed their own princesses to marry foreigners. This may have played a role in what happened to the Hittite Prince Zananza. A 9,000-man Hittite army marched south to the Levantine city of Amka with the Hittite Prince Zananza, who was presumably set to marry the Egyptian queen, but things did not go as planned. Details of what happened were written down in the Plague Prayer of Mursili II. The text states, My father sent foot soldiers and charioteers who attacked the country of Amka, Egyptian territory. Again he sent troops, and again they attacked it. When the Egyptians became frightened, they asked outright for one of his sons to take over the kingship, but when my father gave them one of his sons, they killed him as they led him there. The Zananza affair put the Egyptians and Hittites on a collision course and was probably the ultimate reason for Sopiluliuma's death. After the prince's death, the Hittites and Egyptians engaged in battle, but the events after the war were what had the most adverse impact on the Hittites. Egyptian prisoners of war who were infected with the bubonic plague passed the disease to Hittite soldiers, and they then brought the virus with them back to Anatolia. It is believed that the plague was the cause of Supaluliuma's death, as well as the death of his son and successor, Anuanda. The nature of the plague remains somewhat mysterious since it was manifested long before the advent of modern medicine, but primary sources from both Egypt and Hatti helped to determine the disease's pathology. Two medical papyri from Egypt's 18th dynasty describe the virus as the Canaanite illness which may help assign its ultimate origin in the Levant, but does little to describe its general nature. For a description of the plague's effects on society, one has to turn to the plague prayer of Mursili, the second once more. The text states, Hattian storm god, my lord, and ye Hattian gods, my lords, Mursili, the great king, your servant, has sent me with the order, Go, to the Hattian storm god, my lord, and to the gods, my lords, speak as follows. What is this that ye have done? A plague ye have let into the land. The Hatti land has been cruelly afflicted by the plague. For twenty years now men have been dying in my father's days, in my brother's days, and in mine own since I have become the priest of the gods. When men are dying in the Hatti land like this, the plague is in no wise over. As for me, the agony of my heart and the anguish of my soul I cannot endure any more. When I celebrated festivals, I worshipped all the gods. I never preferred one temple to another. The matter of the plague I have laid in prayer before all the gods making vows to them and saying, Hearken to me, ye gods, my lords. Drive ye forth the plague from the Hatti land. Although no description of the plague's physical effects on humans is described, the general chaos caused by the disease and the length of time it lasted, twenty years, has led many to deduce that it was a form of the bubonic plague. In fact, Gedeka argued that the Zananza plague was one of several outbreaks and was the reason why the Egyptian king Amenhotep I withdrew Egyptian forces from the Levant for several years. Despite the devastation in Hatti that was caused by the plague, Mursili II was able to eventually re-establish Hittite power in the region. Mursili II started his reign the same way many of his Hittite predecessors did, by attacking the Anatolian rival kingdom of Arzawa 
and as a result of his efforts, Musili II was able to place a pro-Hittite king on the Arzawan throne, which effectively made the kingdom a vassal of the Hittites. To add insult to injury, Musili II deported many of Arzawa's inhabitants and then defeated another Anatolian rival, Ahiyawa. With most of Anatolia once more placed under Hittite rule, Masili II then turned his attention northwards to the always troublesome Gascar people. The Hittite king's efforts were at least temporarily successful, as he was able to reduce the threat the Gascar posed to Hattusa and thereby focus the Hittite army to the south. Musili II successfully saved the Hittite Empire from drifting into oblivion after the disaster of the bubonic plague, but it was his successor, Muwatali II, who extended Hatti's borders the furthest south. At the same time, despite Muwatali II's successes in the Levant, the Hittite king suffered setbacks in Anatolia at the hands of the Gascar people, a threat that forced Muwatali II to temporarily move the capital from Hattusa further south. This resulted in fewer extant records from his reign. Muwatali II's imperial activities in the Levant would be more successful, but it would also lead the Hittites into a famous battle with the Egyptians. In 1286 BC, the Egyptians were expanding their influence northwards in the Levant, while the Hittites were moving south and encroaching on Egyptian vassal states, resulting in one of the best documented battles of the ancient world the Battle of Kadesh. At the time, the Egyptian pharaoh, Ramses II, wanted nothing less than to destroy the Hittite Empire and claim their territory for his own, and it was toward that end that he led his troops into the Levant in 1274 BC. Ramses had the details of his march inscribed after the battle. Now then, his majesty had prepared his infantry, his chariotry, and the sherdan of his majesty's capturing, in the year five, second month of the third season, day nine, his majesty passed the fortress of Sile and entered Canaan. His infantry went on the narrow passes as if on the highways of Egypt. Now, after days had passed after this, then his majesty was in Ramses Mary Ammon, the town which is in the valley of the cedar. His majesty proceeded northward. After his majesty reached the mountain range of Kadesh, then his majesty went forward, and he crossed the ford of the Orontes with the first division of Ammon named. He gives victory to Yuzamart Re Setepenre. His majesty reached the town of Kadesh. The division of Ammon was on the march behind him. The division of Re was crossing the ford in a district south of the town of Shabtuna, at the distance of one Ita from the place where his majesty was. The division of Patar was on the south of the town of Arnaim. The division of Seth was marching on the road. His Majesty had formed the first ranks of battle of all the leaders of his army, while they were still on the shore in the land of Amuru. Ramses led his troops deeper into the territory of their enemy, but unlike the battle the pharaoh had fought with the sea pirates, this time it was the Egyptians who were trapped and ambushed. Ramses and his men caught and interrogated some spies that set him down a fatal path. When they had been brought before Pharaoh, his majesty asked, Who are you? They replied, We belong to the king of Hatti. He has sent us to spy on you. Then his majesty said to them, Where is he, the enemy from Hatti? I had heard that he was in the land of Caleb, north of. They of Tunip replied to his majesty, Lo, the king of Hatti has already arrived, together with the many countries who are supporting him. They are armed with their infantry and their chariots. They have their weapons of war at the ready. They are more numerous than the grains of sand on the beach. Behold, they stand equipped and ready for battle behind the old city of Kadesh. After receiving that information, Ramses attempted to quickly marshal his forces to Kadesh, but in the process he created a gap between the different divisions of his army in his haste. The trap was sprung by the Hittite forces just outside Kadesh, and the Ra division of his army, was hit by an initial charge from Hittite chariots and routed before the battle had even properly begun. Surrounded and swiftly outnumbered, most of the Egyptian soldiers were killed in the ensuing chaos and the pharaoh himself was forced into retreating in order simply to survive. What is known of the rest of the battle is that Ramses rallied his forces, 
fought on through the battlefield in order to evade capture and death, and managed to get away with only with a fraction of his troops. The majority of his army was slain on the field of battle that he left behind him. The Battle of Kadesh was a devastating ambush, a strategic defeat, and the end of the pharaoh's campaign of conquest. The hopes Ramses had held for claiming for Egypt both the city and territory around Kadesh were lost, but Ramses had survived, and when he returned to Egypt, he set out to test the adage that history is written by the winners. Ramses erected monuments, commissioned inscriptions, and oversaw the decoration of reliefs, all proclaiming the Battle of Kadesh as a major victory. His personal heroism and skill as a warrior were praised on inscriptions at such locations as Abydos, the Ramesseum, Karnak, Luxor, and Abu Simbel. Rameses had personal details inscribed that claimed, No officer was with me, no charioteer, no soldier of the army, no shield-bearer, and I was before them like Seth in his monument. I found the mass of chariots in whose midst I was, scattering them before my horses. In Luxor it was written, his majesty slaughtered the armed forces of the Hittites in their entirety, their great rulers and all their brothers. Their infantry and chariot troops fell prostrate, one on top of the other. His majesty killed them, and they lay stretched out in front of their horses. But his majesty was alone, nobody accompanied him. If the inscriptions were to be believed, the great warrior had single-handedly ensured his own survival, even with all the odds stacked against him. Ramses successfully used propaganda inscribed onto the monuments and in the public places of Egypt to ensure that the people he ruled would deem him a victorious leader, even when he himself was faced with defeat. The scale of the battle and the tactics used reveal that Bronze Age armies were as sophisticated as many military operations from later periods in history. The number of men in both armies totaled around 40,000, which were probably divided roughly equally between the Egyptians and Hittites. One of the more interesting aspects of the Kadesh texts details how the Egyptian army was divided into four divisions. The four divisions were named for important gods of the Egyptian New Kingdom, Seth, Re, Pitar, and Amun. The Amun division was the strike force and led personally by the pharaoh. It is unknown if the Hittite army was also divided into divisions, but one can assume that with an army of around 20,000 men, it would have been logical to do so. Although the Battle of Kadesh texts are written from and to an Egyptian audience, and therefore painted a much more heroic picture of the Egyptian King Ramses than was really the case, details of Hittite military manoeuvres can be gleaned from the documents. According to the texts, Ramses led the Amun division far ahead of the other three Egyptian divisions in order to quickly capture the town of Kadesh. Perhaps his own arrogance and hubris was to blame for the action, or maybe he honestly thought the town was abandoned, but he and the Amun division learned when they arrived that the Hittite army was already there. The text states, Lo, while his majesty sat talking with the princes, the vanquished chief of Hatti came, and the numerous countries, which were with him. They crossed over the channel on the south of Kadesh, and charged into the army of his majesty while they were marching, and not expecting it. Then the infantry and chariotry of his majesty retreated before them, northward to the place where his majesty was. Lo, the foes of the vanquished chief of Hatti surrounded the bodyguard of his majesty, who were by his side. When his majesty saw them, he was enraged against them, like his father, Montu, lord of Thebes. He seized the adornments of battle and arrayed himself in his coat of mail. He was like Baal in his hour. Then he betook himself to his horses and led quickly on, being alone by himself. He charged into the foes of the vanquished chief of Hatti and the numerous countries which were with him. His majesty was like Seth, the great in strength, smiting and slaying among them. His majesty hurled them headlong, one upon another, into the water of the Orontes. Beyond the bluster and hyperbole on the part of the Egyptian king, two facts are revealed. The Hittite forces were already in the city, and Rameses' reinforcements were far behind. The inscriptions reveal that in the next phase of the battle, the Hittites surrounded the Egyptian king, who was only saved by Levantine reinforcements from the vassal city of Amor. The text reads, 
the arrival of the recruits of Pharaoh, life, prosperity, health, from the land of Amor. They found that the force of the vanquished chief of Hatti had surrounded the camp of His Majesty on its western side. His Majesty had been camping alone, no army with him, awaiting the arrival of his officers and his army, and the division with which Pharaoh, life, prosperity, health was, had not finished setting up camp. Now the division of Re and the division of Patar were on the march. They had not, yet, arrived, and their officers were in the forest of Bui. Then the recruits cut off the foe belonging to the vanquished chief of Hatti, while they were entering the camp, and Pharaoh's officers slew them. They left not a single survivor among them. Of course, the truth was that the battle allowed Muatali II to consolidate Hittite power in the Damascus region. Furthermore, the Hittite king was also able to retake Hattusa and the city of Nerik, the cult center of the important storm god from the Gaska people. Nonetheless, the strength and vitality of Muatali II's reign ultimately gave way to another brief period of unrest in the Hittite kingdom. Muatali II was succeeded by Musili III in the early 13th century, and he was soon usurped by his uncle, Hattusili III. Texts reveal that although Hattusili III was not in the line of succession and therefore a pretender to the throne, he usurped and exiled his nephew because he feared for his life. Shortly after exiling his nephew, Musili III lost most of the lands in western Anatolia that his predecessors worked so hard to acquire, and control over the southeastern trade routes to Mesopotamia were also tenuous until the new Hittite king decided to follow a foreign policy path that was initiated by Supaluliuma I, diplomacy. Hattusili III quickly made an alliance with Babylon and then made overtures to Egypt, which was still ruled by the enduring Ramses II. The Hittites and Egyptians eventually agreed to a peace treaty and alliance, which was sealed with a diplomatic marriage, because the two kingdoms saw a mutual enemy in the growing power of the Assyrian kingdom in northern Mesopotamia. The alliance between the Hittites and Egyptians was commemorated in inscriptions and reliefs in Egypt in the Karnak Temple and demonstrates the importance of diplomatic marriages in the region during Bronze Age. The text first articulates the friendship and amity between the two kings. Behold then, Hattusili, the great chief of Hatti, is in treaty relation with the great ruler of Egypt, beginning with this day, in order to bring about good peace and good brotherhood between us forever. While he is in brotherhood with me, his is in peace with me, and I am in brotherhood with him, and I am in peace with him forever. Since Muatali, the great chief of Hatti, my brother, succumbed to his fate, and Hattusili sat as great chief of Hatti upon the throne of his father. Behold, I am together with Rameses Meriamun, the great ruler of Egypt, and he is with me in our peace and our brotherhood. It is better than the former peace and brotherhood which were in the land. After the formalities and niceties of the first part of the inscription, details are then related that pertain to an actual military alliance between Hatti and Egypt. The text reads, if another enemy come against the lands of the great ruler of Egypt, and he shall send to the great chief of Keta, saying, Come with me as reinforcement against him. The great chief of Hatti shall, and the great chief of Hatti shall slay his enemy. But if it be not the desire of the great chief of Hatti to come, he shall send his infantry and his chariotry, and shall slay his enemy. The alliance between the Hittites and Egyptians was then sealed in much the same way that many alliances were at the time. A diplomatic marriage. Since the Egyptians refused to marry their women to foreign kings, it was Ramses who married a Hittite princess in a union that would tie the two royal houses together. The text states, The daughter of the great chief of Hatti marched in front of the army of his majesty in following her. They were mingled with foot and horse of Hatti. They were warriors as well as regulars. They ate and they drank, not fighting face to face. Between them, after the manner of the god himself, King Ramses. The great chiefs of every land came, they were bowed down, turning their back in fear when they saw his majesty. The chief of Hatti came among them to seek the favor of King Ramses. Although the Hittites and Egyptians never activated the alliance in defense of one another, 
the two kingdoms never again engaged each other in war either. This helped bring about a long period of time marked by the great powers. For about a 500-year period, from the middle to the later 2nd millennium BC, the most powerful kingdoms of the ancient Near East developed a system that interconnected people over thousands of miles through economic and diplomatic activity. The great powers of the ancient Near East consisted of Babylon, Hatti, Egypt, Mitanni, and, after Mitanni's collapse in the mid-14th century, Assyria. The kings of the great powers and the rulers of numerous lesser powers would communicate with each other through documents that were written in the cuneiform script in the Akkadian language, the lingua franca of the Bronze Age. Under the Great Powers system, a new international elite class emerged, whose members probably had more in common with each other than with the subjects of their own kingdoms. A letter from Supiluliuma, the first to the Egyptian king Akhenaten in the mid-14th century, demonstrates how the Hittite king respected his contemporary, even if they were rivals. The text reads, I herewith send you as your greeting gift, one silver writen, a stag, five mean is its weight, one silver writen, a young ram, three mine is its weight, two silver discs, ten mean is their weight, as two large Nikiptu trees. The letter from the Hittite to the Egyptian king is then juxtaposed with a letter Supiluliuma, the first wrote to the Levantine king of Ugarit, who was clearly an inferior. Nick Madu, king of Ugarit, saying, You are not hostile with us against his majesty. But Nikmadu, for his part, refused to become hostile to the sun and the sun. The great king noted the loyalty of Nikamadu, and now Supiluliuma, the great king, the king of the land of Hatti, has verily made a treaty with Nikmadu, king of the land of Ugarit, saying, The tribute to the sun, the great king your lord, is twelve minas and twenty shekels of gold, one cup of cold, a mina in weight, as the primary tribute, four linen garments, one large linen garment, five hundred shekels of blue-purple wool, five hundred shekels of red-purple wool for the sun, the great king, his lord. For the most part, the system worked as the great states rarely faced each other in war directly, but the Levant became the stomping grounds for numerous proxy wars between the constituent members. The Egyptians, Hittites and Babylonians fought border battles with each other over colonies, but they also traded rare commodities and sometimes royal princesses. Nonetheless, despite Hattie's membership in the Great Powers Club, it was not enough to stop the waning power of the Hittite kingdom. The Hittite king Tudalia IV embarked on an ambitious program to rebuild the kingdom, but the growing juggernaut of Assyria slowly ate away at Hittite control in the Levant. Although the expansion of the Assyrian state during the era was fairly gradual, the rule of Ashur Ubalit I in the mid 14th century BC is generally viewed as the start of the Assyrian expansion. Ashur Ubalit I was able to take advantage of troubles outside the Assyrian kingdom by annexing territories to Assyria's east after the Hittites attacked the kingdom of the Mitanni, and by the rule of the Assyrian king Tukulti Ninurta I. The Assyrians had consumed the Mitanni kingdom east of the Euphrates River and were well on the way to wiping out that entire kingdom. The late second millennium BC was a period of unrest in the Near East, especially as the Bronze Age was swept away and replaced by the Iron Age. The transition to the Iron Age proved to be especially violent, and it brought about the end of the Great Powers Club. A mysterious coalition of warrior tribes known collectively as the Sea Peoples ravaged the coastal kingdoms of the eastern Mediterranean, and they destroyed the kingdoms of Ugarit and Hatti, and nearly destroyed Egypt as well. Since they were located further inland from the Mediterranean coast, the Assyrians did not suffer as much from the Sea Peoples' attacks. But that empire was not totally immune to the general situation either. A group of Semitic speaking people, known as the Arameans, began to attack and ravage numerous Mesopotamian cities around this same time. The Aramean raids became the primary focus of Tiglath-Pilas's reign, a fact mentioned in the historical annals. With the help of Assur, my lord, I led forth my chariots and warriors and went into the desert, into the midst of the Alami, Arameans, enemies of Assur, my lord, I marched. 
the country from Suhi to the city of Karkemish, in the land of Hatti, I raided in one day. I slew their troops, their spoil, their goods and their possessions in countless numbers I carried away. The rest of their forces, which had fled from before the terrible weapons of Assur, my lord, and had crossed over the Euphrates. In pursuit of them, I crossed the Euphrates in vessels made of skins. Six of their cities, which lay at the foot of the mountain of Beshri, I captured, I burned with fire, I laid waste, I destroyed them. Their spoil, their goods and their possessions, I carried away to my city, Assur. Still, despite tiglath pileser's best efforts, the Aramean hordes eventually reduced the Assyrian Empire to its original heartland around Asher by 1050 BC. The Arameans and the general collapse of the period may have reduced the land the Assyrians held, but Robert Drews has argued that their use of infantry helped them survive the collapse, whereas others, such as the Hittites, did not. The historian's history of the world described Assyrian infantry. The spear of the Assyrian footman was short, scarcely exceeding the height of a man. That of the horseman appears to have been considerably longer. The shaft was probably of some strong wood, and did not consist of a reed like that of the modern Arab lance. Hittite Literature and Historiography The scope of Hittite literature, like that of most of their Near Eastern contemporaries, included mythology, administrative documents, and historical texts. When the first catalogue of Hittite texts was compiled in 1971, it contained around 25,000 extant texts, but that is believed to only represent about 15% of the original archives. The majority of the texts were discovered in the Great Temple of Hattusa, and a number were also recovered in the ruins of the Royal Citadel. Although the number of texts is many and diverse in their literary genres, the natures of the texts present some inherent problems to modern scholars in terms of reconstructing Hittite chronology, some of which have already been briefly discussed above. Most of the texts were written in the last hundred years of Hattusa's existence, which means that most of the historical annals are copies of earlier records. Also, many of the works that are considered literature in the modern sense, such as fictional tales, are also copies from earlier Mesopotamian texts. In terms of epics or myth cycles, the Hittites carried on Mesopotamian traditions by copying tales such as the Epic of Gilgamesh in their scribal schools, albeit with a notable Hittite flavour. Hittite scribes copied the Mesopotamian tales in Akkadian cuneiform, but also Hittite and Hurrian, and they would change some of the settings from southern Mesopotamia to northern Mesopotamia, which was a region more familiar to the Hittites. Although the Hittites recorded aspects of their religion in writing, mainly cult rituals and prayers, one of which was discussed above, they wrote down few true epic native myths. A large number of the extant Hittite documents are administrative in nature, and although perhaps not as exciting to read as the mythological or historical texts, they tell modern historians much about the Hittite government and society in general. Many of these administrative documents concern the proper behaviour of palace and temple servants, priests and soldiers. One particular document that relates the daily life of temple servants depicts a regimented routine with an emphasis on purity, both spiritually and physically, with severe penalties for those who fail to follow the rules. The text reads, Furthermore, let those who prepare the daily loaves be clean, let them be bathed and groomed, let their body, hair and nails be removed, let them be clothed in clean dresses, while unclean, let them not prepare the loaves, let those who are agreeable to the God's soul and person prepare them. The baker's house in which they prepare them, let that be swept and scrubbed. Furthermore, let a pig or a dog not stay at the door of the place where the loaves are broken. Are the minds of men and of the gods generally different? No. Further, you who are temple officials be very careful with respect to the precinct. At nightfall promptly go to be in the temple, eat and drink, and if the desire for a woman overcomes anyone, let him sleep with a woman but as long as you let him stay, and let everyone promptly come up to spend the night in the temple. Whoever is a temple official, all high priests, minor priests, anointed or whoever else is allowed to cross the threshold of the gods, let them not fail to spend the night in the temple one by one. Further, 
Be very careful with the matter of fire. If there is a festival in the temple, guard the fire carefully. When night falls, quench well with water whatever fire remains on the hearth. But if there is any flame in isolated spots and also dry wood, if he who is to quench it becomes criminally negligent in the temple, even if only the temple is destroyed, but Hattusa and the king's property is not destroyed, he who commits the crime will perish together with his descendants. Hittite administrative documents remain an important part of modern scholarship, but perhaps the most important genre of Hittite literature, in ancient as well as modern times, consist of historiographical texts. Although the Hittites kept excellent annals of the deeds of their kings, they never numbered the numerous same-named kings, which is a more modern convention. Hittite historical texts also never give the date or length of a king's reign, which has made it tough to reach a consensus regarding the precise length of some king's reigns. For example, the length of Superluliuma, the first's rule, is placed at between 22 and 40 years, depending upon the expert. The Hittites also left no true king list, as their contemporaries did in Babylon, Egypt and Assyria. The king list of the above mentioned peoples were quite simple and usually consisted of a proper chronological ordering of the kings, along with the length of their reigns. These empires also occasionally added additional information about their rulers in documents called annals, and while they didn't keep king lists, the Hittites were adept at recording the annals of their kings, beginning in the Old Kingdom when Hattusili I left a bilingual Hittite Akkadian cuneiform account of his military endeavours. Some historians believe that the Hittite historiographical tradition may have influenced the Assyrians to write their detailed royal annals, which provides the basis for most modern chronologies of the first millennium BC in the Near East. Hittite Myth and Theology the Hittite kings were truly proud of their conquests, but in order to understand the reasons for their militant character, it's necessary to look to their religion. Unfortunately, knowledge of Hittite religion is limited due to the nature of the extant texts. While a fairly solid view of Hittite religion can be gleaned from the variety of texts that have survived, no known text relates a detailed cosmological origin, so scholars are left with many blanks in that respect. The Hittites followed a religion that combined both Indo-European and other theological elements. At the centre of the religion were the storm god and his consort, the sun goddess, and the storm god, who was only referred to as such in the extant texts, and never by a specific name, was derived from the Hittites' Indo-European origins. Elemental and storm deities were common throughout the religions of many different Indo-European peoples, including Thor, the Norse god of thunder, Zeus, the supreme god of the Greeks who was associated with lightning, and Indra, the Aryan god of war, also associated with storms. This all points to a similar theological origin, having come somewhere from the Indo-European homeland. Conversely, the sun goddess is believed to have been a native, non-Indo-European deity, who the Hittites accepted when they entered Anatolia. Although solar gods were common among ancient Indo-European peoples, Apollo of the Greeks, Sol of the Romans, and Agni of the Aryans are just three examples. The Hittite solar goddess is notably different in that it was a female. The importance of the sun goddess, who was also associated with fertility, continued throughout Hittite history and beyond, as she evolved into the goddess known as Sibylle during the Greco-Roman period. Although Hittite religion, being partly Indo-European, may have had some different theological and historical origins than its contemporaries in Egypt, Mesopotamia, and the Levant. It shared one feature that was paramount in all of the religion of the ancient Near East, the importance of cult and ritual. The central role that cult and ritual played in Hittite religion can be understood as a symbiotic relationship that the divine and man had with each other. The gods were dependent on the offerings made by priests, who in turn could only live in a stable world that the gods and goddesses provided. The rituals were many and varied, and usually involved festivals that occurred annually on the Hittite calendar, but the Hittites diverged from the ritual practices of their ancient Near Eastern neighbours by placing a heavy emphasis on the idea of contamination. 
The Hittites believed that evil spirits lurked around every corner and sought to pollute the living spiritually and physically, and that death carried the greatest risk of pollution to those who touched the corpse. The idea of pollution caused by a corpse was not present in the theologies of any of the Hittites' Near Eastern contemporaries, and in fact was antithetical to the Egyptian philosophy towards the corpse, which held that a body needed to be scientifically preserved in order to ensure a proper afterlife. As such, some believe that the Hittite theological view of the pollution of the corpse may be another ancient Indo-European theological holdover. Many ancient Indo-Europeans, most notably the Romans, Aryans and Vikings, believed that a corpse was not only unclean, but that it also held the soul of the dead and therefore needed to be released through fire. The ancient Persians also believed that corpses were unclean vessels that held the soul of the deceased, but instead of cremating their dead, to them fire was sacred and could not touch any impurities. They exposed the corpse. The proper rituals were carried out by the priests, and the highest of all priests was the Hittite king. Hittite religious rituals were carried out throughout many Anatolian towns but those of the major cults, such as the Storm God and Sun Goddess, were primarily done in the capital of Hattusa. The king fulfilled two roles in the spiritual and theological world of the Hittites by serving as high priest and hero. In the role of hero, the living king led his troops into war and served as a conduit to the great Hittite kings of the past. The living king also acted as the high priest of the religion, and while not viewed as a god the way the Egyptians saw their king, he was believed to attain divinity upon his death. The primary religious duties of the living king were to visit the numerous shrines and temples within Anatolia and officiate over festivals, as well as to maintain a high level of purity as discussed above. The king's religious duties were usually very public for the most part. Private prayer, although important, played a subordinate position to that of temple rituals. Although the Hittites did not believe their living kings were divine, they thought that kingship was divinely inspired. One particularly lurid Hittite myth describes how Anus, the divine king of heaven, defeated his enemy Kumbaris in a particularly humiliating way. The text reads, Nine in number were the years that Alalus was king in heaven. In the ninth year Anus gave battle to Alalus, and he vanquished Alalus. He fled before him and went down to the dark earth. Down he went to the dark earth, but Anus took his eat upon the throne. As long as Anus was seated upon the throne, the mighty Kumabis would give him his food. He would sink at his feet and set the drinking cup in his hand. Nine in number were the years that Anus was king in heaven. In the ninth year Anus gave battle to Kumabis, and like Alalus, Kumabis gave battle to Arnus. When, he could no longer withstand Kamabis' eyes, Anus he struggled forth from the hands of Kamabis. He fled Aons, like a bird he moved in the sky. After him rushed Kamabis, seized Anus by his feet and dragged him down from the sky. He bit his knees and his manhood went down into his inside. When it lodged there, and when Kamabis had swallowed Anus's manhood, Kamabis he began to speak. Thou rejoices over thine inside because thou hast swallowed my manhood. Rejoice not over thine inside. In thine inside I have planted a heavy burden. Firstly, I have impregnated thee with the noble storm god. Secondly, I have impregnated thee with the river Aransahas, not to be endured. Thirdly, I have impregnated thee with the noble Tasmisus. Three dreadful gods have I planted in thy belly as seed. The king's association with the storm god coincided with the queen's linking to the sun goddess. In Hattusa, all of the rituals were carried out in the primary temple complex, which was situated in a prominent position in the lower city beneath the royal palace. The ruins of Hattusa's temple complex are some of the best preserved archaeological finds of the Hittite culture, which has helped historians discover important information about their religion. The temple was entered through an elaborate, colossal gateway that was designed along the characteristic Hittite architectural style, and a courtyard stood between the entrance and the innermost sections of the temple. A small building stood on the far side of the courtyard, which served as a ritual cleansing house, and beyond that were the shrines of the storm god and sun goddess. The shrines were made of granite, 
unlike the limestone that comprised the rest of the temple, and they housed the divine statues of the deities. The housing of divine images in the most sacred precincts of temples was a practice common to most peoples of the ancient Near East, as the deities were believed to at least partly reside in the images. Inside the temple, festivals from the Hittite calendar took place, with the most important being the New Year's festival, which was held for the storm god. A Hittite text reveals part of what the festival entailed. These are the words of Kellus, the anointed, of the storm god of Nerik. What follows is the cult legend of the Puruli festival of the storm god of heaven, the version of which they no longer tell. May the land flourish and prosper. May the land be well protected. If it flourishes and prospers, they will celebrate the Puruli festival. The storm god and the dragon Iluyankas came to grips in Kiskilusa. The dragon Iluyankas vanquished the storm god. The storm god besought all the gods, Come ye to my aid, let Inaras prepare a celebration. The Collapse of the Hittite Empire The Hittite religion was truly complex, and by all accounts they were pious people, but their piety and gods would not be enough to keep their empire from collapsing. Although the final blow levelled on the Hittite Empire may have come in the form of foreign invaders, the disintegration was slow and began within the confines of Anatolia. During the reign of the last Hittite king, Supiluliuma II at the end of the 13th century BC, internal discord made the Hittite state weak, even as Supiluliuma II set out to restore internal stability in Hatti, and also to devote resources to the mortuary shrine of his father and other religious establishments. However, despite the Hittite king's best efforts, supply routes in the eastern Mediterranean were threatened, which forced the last Hittite king to resort to an extremely rare military move, naval warfare. Most of the Hittite sea battles began during the reign of Tudalia IV and took place off the coast of Cyprus, all with limited success. The internal situation became so bad in Hatti that there was apparently a food shortage, and the once proud Hittites were forced to accept an emergency grain shipment from their Egyptian allies. A text from the Karnak temple dated to the reign of the Egyptian king Merempta reads, They spend their time going about the land, fighting, to fill their bodies daily. They come to the land of Egypt to seek the necessities of their mouths. Their desire is my bringing them like netted fish on their bellies. Their chief is like a dog, a man of boasting, without courage. He does not abide bringing an end the pedda tissue, whom I cause to take grain in ships, to keep alive that land of Hatti. Some experts believe that the Hittites' own efficiency in military matters was their ultimate undoing, as the forced removals and resettlements of rebellious populations helped contribute to a situation that sent groups of people, both large and small, across the region and thus disrupted supply lines and trade networks. The population movements, which began as a trickle in the late 13th century BC, eventually coalesced into a tsunami known today as the Sea Peoples. This helped bring down the old Bronze Age system and the Great Powers Club mentioned earlier, and it ushered in the Iron Age. Although there is still plenty of debate over the nature of the Sea Peoples and the extent they played in the collapse of the Mediterranean Bronze Age system, None dispute that the enigmatic wandering peoples did extensive damage to trade routes and kingdoms in the region, and no Bronze Age kingdom suffered more than the Hittites. The Sea Peoples followed an east-to-west trajectory as they headed towards Hatti, first destroying the northwest Anatolian trade routes and the Hittites' rival, Arzawa, with them. Some historians believe that the Hittites saw the writing on the wall and abandoned Hattusa before the Sea Peoples arrived. Under this hypothesis, the Hittite elite evacuated Hattusa before the vanguard of the Sea Peoples, who thus found a desolate city that they then put to the torch. This theory is interesting and may be true, but either way, the fundamental fact remains that the Hittite capital was destroyed and the empire along with it. When the smoke cleared, Hatti was no longer standing, and excavations at Hattusa have revealed signs of utter destruction to the point that the site was completely abandoned for centuries. Despite the Sea People's utter destruction of the Hittite Empire, the Hittite name would live on for several hundred years. 
Although the Hittite capital and empire were destroyed, the memory of the great Anatolian culture lived on and inspired later generations of rulers in the ancient Near East. Some of the surviving elites who fled Hattusa probably ended up in the northern Levant cities of Carchemish and Imar. These cities, which were once vassal states of the Hittite Empire, carried on the Hittite name and some aspects of Hittite culture, but they were a mere shadow of the Hittites of the past. That said, these Levantine Hittites, referred to by modern scholars as Neo-Hittites, created a new script known as Hieroglyphic Hittite. The language of Hieroglyphic Hittite, like true Hittite, was Indo-European, but it was written in a script that used a pictorial type script unlike the cuneiform script employed in classic Hittite. Most scholars believe that the Neo-Hittite culture was essentially a combination of the remnants of the Hittite elites along with the local Levantine elite class. The most influential people in the region during the first millennium BC, the Assyrians, Eurasians and Hebrews, referred to the local Syrian rulers as kings of the Hittites. The first mention of the Hittites in the Bible also came during this period, which was in a context that was a far cry from the days of Sopiluliuma II. The Book of Kings in the Bible reads, And all the cities of store that Solomon had, and cities for his chariots, and cities for his horsemen, and that which Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem, and in Lebanon, and in all the land of his dominion, and all the people that were left of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, which were not of the children of Israel, their children that were left after them in the land, whom the children of Israel also were not able utterly to destroy, upon those did Solomon levy a tribute of bond service to this day. Although the Neo-Hittites were able to carry on the original language of the Hittite to a certain extent, they were unable to come close to matching the territorial or military power of their ancestors because they were forced to contend with the greatest military power that the ancient Near East had ever seen, the Assyrian Empire. By the reign of the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser, the first in the late 12th century BC, the Assyrians had extended their influence into the former homeland of the Hittites, and the well-documented and detailed Assyrian annals mentioned the numerous lands that were subdued by the Assyrian war machine. Among the lands the Assyrians conquered was Hatti, as it was still called by the Assyrians. The annal of tiglath Pileser, the first states, I subdued the land of the Shubari, with its haughty and insubmissive people, and upon the land of Altsi, and the land of Purukutsi, which had withheld their tribute and tax, I laid the heavy yoke of my sovereignty, and I ordered that they should bring tribute and tax year by year to my city Assur into my presence. Through my own valour, and because Assur the Lord had put into my hand a mighty weapon which subdues the insubmissive, and commanded me to extend the frontiers of his land, four thousand men of Kaski and of Urumi, soldiers of the land of Hatti, who were in revolt and had seized the cities of the land of Shubati by their own strength, cities which were subject to Assur, my lord. They heard of my coming against the land of Shubati. The brilliance of my valour overwhelmed them. They were afraid to fight, so they embraced my feet. Thus, the land of Hatti would never regain the independence or status that it enjoyed during the Hittite Empire. With the Assyrians growing in power in northern Mesopotamia and extending their influence into Anatolia, the Neo-Hittites were forced to relegate their activities to the Levant. As the Bible suggests, the Neo-Hittites were clearly in an inferior position to the Israelites since they were forced to pay tribute to the same people who once paid tribute to Hattusa. However, while the Neo-Hittites may have been relegated to an inferior political position in the first millennium BC, Another passage from the Book of Kings reveals that they may not have lost their zeal for warfare. The passage states, And they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians, and when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo! The king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Ultimately, the role that the Neo-Hittites played in the affairs of Israel was probably minimal 
given that there are few verses in the Bible that mention them, and any revival that the Neo-Hittites hoped to make of the grand old empire was finally brought to an end when the Assyrians destroyed the state of Uratu in 743 BC. From that point forward, the Levant and most of the Near East became part of the vast and growing Assyrian Empire. The Rise of Arzawa Despite the relative abundance of sources dating back to the mid-second millennium BC, locating Arzawa on a map has proven to be a very difficult proposition for a number of reasons. The primary reason is that the people of the Late Bronze Age did not use cartography for the most part, and therefore the places mentioned in the Hittite texts that pertain to the specific names of locations are nearly useless. This problem is further compounded by the fluid nature of borders in ancient times and the fact that Azawa was the combination of an Azawa proper and several other countries that formed a confederacy known collectively as Azawa. The nature of archaeology in eastern Anatolia has also hindered the discovery of major Azawan sites. Therefore, the precise location of Azawa is still debated by historians, even as they all agree that it was located in Anatolia. Modern archaeological methods and technologies have helped uncover temples, tombs and even entire cities, but no matter how advanced these methods and tools are, they are only as good as what the land will allow. In locations with high water tables, such as the Nile River Delta, important sites remain under the rich soil that the locals use for fields, while in other places, such as Turkey, urban sprawl prevents many excavations. This has been one of the problems for locating Arzawa, because no matter how good a location may seem, it is usually buried beneath sites from the era of classical Greece, which themselves are buried under layers of medieval and modern urban landscapes. With that said, it seems likely that Arzawa was somewhere in western Anatolia, because many Hittite texts indicate that Arzawa's capital city, Apasa, was located near the sea leading historians to assume that the entire country or federation likely bordered the Aegean Sea. Another early attempt to locate Arzawa was made by an eminent German Hittitologist named Albrecht Goetze in 1957. Goetze placed Arzawa in western Anatolia, as all subsequent scholars have, but he placed it more southerly in Pamphylia, on the Mediterranean Sea coast. These early studies have since given way to more detailed theories by experts in ancient Anatolian studies. Nawiz McSweeney recently made a strong argument that Arzawa extended west of the Anatolian plateau to the Aegean Sea, but that it did not include the Trode region to the north or the Lycian Highlands in the south. Also recently, J.G. McQueen outlined possible locations for Arzawa, believing it was further north than what previous historians thought. McQueen offered two possible locations for the centre of Arzawa, either the Turkish Lakes region of southwestern Anatolia or Lydia, which is further north. The coastal area for the first possible location would either have been Pamphylia or Lycia, while the northerly possible location's coast probably would have been on the Aegean, around the location of classical Ephesus. In either case, McQueen believed the Sehar River divided the Arzawan lands from the non-Arzawan lands to the north. Another problem scholars have faced is the nature of the state's political composition. Rather than a state ruled by a single dynasty, Arzawa was a confederation of kingdoms that shared common political interests, namely opposing the Hittites. The member states would occasionally change, but there were usually four states that comprised the core. Mirakualia, Hapala, Sehar Riverland, and Arzawa proper. The identification of Arzawa as the name of the West Anatolian Confederation and a separate kingdom was first proposed in the mid-20th century, and a German Hittitologist named Suzanne Heinhold Kramer synthesized these studies in her 1977 book, Arzawa. Even before her groundbreaking publication, Notable English-speaking experts attempted to place Arzawa proper and its confederates within Western Anatolia. McQueen argued in a 1968 article that Arzawa was probably located along the Astapa River, but where that river was remains a mystery. It's possible that the Astapa River is the body of water now known as the Meander River. McQueen added that Mira was likely between Arzawa and Hatti, which most historians agree on. 
1974 article, Bryce added that Arzawa proper must be located on the Aegean coastline due to its capital city, Apasa, being mentioned as a coastal city in Hittite texts. That also seemed to be corroborated by Arzawan correspondence with Egypt, given that the existence of that correspondence would mean the Arzawans were able to avoid Hittite interference during their short but important relationship with the new kingdom of Egypt. In a 1986 article, Bryce argued that Hapala was likely adjacent to the Hittite buffer zone known as the Lower Land. He based this theory on Hittite texts from the early 14th century BC that concerned the Arzawan king Maduwata, who ruled in the late 15th century BC or early 14th century BC. Hapala served as a buffer between Arzawa and Hatti. As mentioned earlier, most scholars believe territory along the Seha River was the northernmost state in the Arzawan Confederacy. Adding to the confusion of Arzawa's location is the fact that another Anatolian coalition opposed to the Hittites coexisted temporarily with Arzawa. Although Asuwa shared a similar name and some other features with Arzawa, it was located to the north of Arzawa and included the Trode. Asuwa was also later used as an ethnic identifier of Luwian-speaking peoples in western Anatolia and is likely where the Greeks derived the word Asia to refer to Anatolia, Ionia and Asia Minor. Since most of the documentary evidence of Arzawa comes from Hittite texts, little is known about the nature of the relationship between Arzawa and Asuwa. Determining who the Arzawans were is a question that has been almost as thorny as precisely locating Arzawa's position, in part due to some of the same problems. Incomplete archaeological studies of the Arzawan lands have left many questions about Arzawan culture, and the ethnicity of the Arzawan people is complicated by the nature of the Confederacy's composition. After all, if the Confederation was comprised of several different kingdoms, cultural variation was likely. In fact, some have argued that although there was an Arzawan culture, it was not very distinct from its neighbouring kingdoms. Any discussion of an ancient culture usually begins with its language, because identifying the language of a cultural group can place it in a greater linguistic cultural group, which can further aid historians, archaeologists and philologists in determining the group's origins, cultural practices and worldview. The dominant language in Arzawa proper and the other kingdoms that comprised the Arzawan Confederacy, was Luwian, which was an Indo-European language. More specifically, Luwian was a member of the Anatolian branch of the Indo-European linguistic family, along with Hittite, Lycian and Lydian. This is important information that helps put the Late Bronze Age into a clearer historical context. Although the Hittites, Arzawa, and the numerous other polities in Anatolia competed for resources and power. They shared similar origins and can therefore be viewed as members of a greater civilization, much the same way the competing states of Mesopotamia hailed from the same civilizations. This means that the Arzawans likely shared many cultural elements with their Anatolian neighbors, including the Hittites. But given the manner in which they opposed each other, it's apparent the Arzawans and Hittites viewed themselves differently. There is no doubt that the Arzawans and Hittites viewed themselves as politically distinct peoples, and there was a language difference, but just how different they were culturally is difficult to ascertain. An interesting Hittite legal text shows that the Hittites did view the Arzawans as somewhat culturally distinct, referring to them as Luwians. The text reads, if any Luwian steals a person, man or woman, from Hattusa and carries him to the country of Arzawa, but his master traces him out, he shall be declared liable for his estate. If in Hattusa any Hittite steals a Luwian and carries him to the country of Luwia, they would formerly give twelve persons. Now he shall give six persons and pledge his estate as security. If any Hittite steals a Hittite slave from the country of Luwia and carries him to the Hatti land, but his master traces him out, he shall give him twelve shekels of silver and pledge his estate as security. If anyone steals the slave of a Luwian from the country of Luwia and carries him to the Hatti land, but his master traces him out, he shall receive just the slave, there will be no compensation. The first line of the text clearly indicates that the Hittites viewed the Luwians as synonymous with Arzawa, and it also demonstrates that the Arzawans and Hittites apparently shared similar legal ideas, 
as runaway slaves being returned by the leaders of foreign countries would require at least a basic legal understanding and agreement. At the same time, this legal text also raises more questions about the nature of Arzawan culture. As the study of Hittitology progressed in the 20th century, Arzawa and its language was relegated to an afterthought of Hittite history and archaeology by those who did know about it. Many of the authors who did write about Arzawa thought that it was at the vanguard of a pan luwian culture that was opposed to Hittite encroachment. Although McSweeney believed that Arzawa was the primary bulwark against the Hittites' western advance in Anatolia, he thought Arzawa was a multi-ethnic, multilingual political organization, more than a nation-state or a kingdom representing a homogenous group. Therefore, the search for a distinct Arzawan culture must go beyond language and focus more on material culture and religion. Pottery identification is a common method that archaeologists use to assign specific cultures to a dig site, as ancient cultures often produced unique pottery and ornamental types that indicate who produced the artefacts and when they were produced. Although archaeologists have uncovered plenty of pottery and other small artefacts from known Arzawan sites, most reflect Hittite styles. Of course, the lack of an Arzawan artistic style, or at least the lack of its discovery, does not mean that the Arzawans were devoid of artistic inspiration, only that they probably looked to other places to emulate. Like all people in the ancient Near East during the Late Bronze Age, the Arzawans were polytheists, who worshipped a pantheon that was similar to, if not the same as the other groups living in Anatolia. A storm god was their most important deity, and although there is little direct evidence of the Arzawans' rituals and practices, there are Hittite texts that indicate they were known for their use of magic. A number of Hittite texts recount how male and female Arzawans directed Hittites on the proper use of magic. These are the words of Uhamua, the Arzawa man. If people are dying in the country, and if some enemy god has caused that, I act as follows. Afterward they bring fodder for the god's horses and mutton tallow, and while doing so, they speak as follows. Thou hast harnessed horses, let them eat this fodder and let their hunger be satisfied. Let also thy chariot be greased with this mutton tallow. Turn toward thy land, O storm god, in favor turn toward the Hatti land. Another Hittite text explained how an Arzawan woman offered a ritual against impotence. Part of it read, These are the words of Pisuatis, the Arzawa woman who lives in Parasa. If a man possess no reproductive power or has no desire for women, I bring libations to Ulyliasis on his behalf and entreat him for three days. On the first day I prepare as follows. Rations for one man are assembled and to it the following is added. Three sweet sacrificial loaves of flour and water weighing one tarnish, figs, grapes, the god's meal, a little of everything, the fleece of an unblemished sheep, a pitcher of wine, the headdress or the shirt of the male sacrificer in question, they are put upon the rations. A virgin takes up these materials, and the sacrificer, having taken a bath, walks behind them. Then he bathes again. We shall take the materials to another place in the open country. We shall remain standing while the sacrifice holds the rations up. I shall build a gate of reeds. During the three days on which he is entreating the deity, he tells all the dreams which he has, whether the deity appears to him, and whether the deity sleeps with him. The Hittites also practiced augury to determine how important events should be undertaken, and it is likely that the Arzawans also consulted oracles and augurs. A number of Hittite oracular texts mention Arzawa in passing, but one from the reign of Mursili II, whose relationship with Arzawa will be discussed more thoroughly later, specifically states that similar religious rituals were performed in Hatti and Arzawa. Part of the text reads, should Zuwahalati and Mabili worship the gods and thereafter treat the furnishings of the king, should they then lure away the deities? Until Mashuiluwa and Zaparti Negna arrive with the materials for the ritual and the perform the Mantalia ritual with his majesty in the style of Hattusa and of Arzawa, should they turn the deity over to his majesty there? Should he divide him there? The oracle text clearly states that the Mantalia ritual was performed both in Hatti and Arzawa, and that it involved the deity, or cult statue, presumably the storm god, which was the head of both people's pantheons.
The Arzawans shared with the Hittites not only a belief in ritual magic and religion, but also the idea of the king's divine right to rule the kingdom. Unlike the Egyptians, neither the Hittites nor the Arzawans believed their kings were gods, but they did believe their kings were divinely appointed by and associated with the storm god, while Hittite and Arzawan queens were associated with the sun goddess. Arzawan kingship was most clearly articulated on a rock-cut relief in the Karabel Pass, Turkey, which is today known as the Karabel Relief or Karabel Rock Inscription. The Karabel Relief is the only major piece of monumental Arzawan art, but it has assisted historians in unlocking a few of the mysteries about Arzawa's culture and chronology. The relief was originally comprised of four parts and was nearly five feet wide and eight feet high. The lone human figure in the relief carries a bow and a spear and is accompanied by a Luwian language hieroglyphic inscription that identifies the figure as Tarkas Nawa, the king of the Arzawan Confederated Kingdom of Mira and the king of the Arzawan Confederacy in the 1320s BC. Although the inscription on the Karabel relief only identifies Tarkas Nawa as the king of Mira and states nothing else about his time on the throne or how he became ruler of all Arzawa, the imagery does relate important information about the nature of Arzawan kingship. Once again, it is helpful to look across Anatolia to the better documented Hittite concept of kingship in order to assess if Arzawan kingship was similar. The most striking feature of the Karabel relief is King Tarkasnawa's stance and weapons. He holds a weapon in each hand, showing all who would see the relief that Tarkasnawa was a virile, active king who was not afraid to fight alongside his men on the battlefield. The idea of a hero king was apparently common throughout Anatolia, as the Hittites reinforced this idea in their texts. The idea of a warrior king imbued with the power of the storm god was the driving force of Arzawan kingship, and Arzawan kings, like their Hittite counterparts, personally led their troops in battle. The final element of Arzawa's history to discuss is the degree to which it was urban. Throughout most of history, a society's level of progress is often considered to be synonymous with its level of urban development. The more urban a society is, the more advanced it is. Of course, this is not always necessarily the case, but generally speaking, the most sophisticated cultures in terms of organization, wealth, population, and military influence have had prominent urban centers. The Mongols and other nomadic and semi-nomadic groups from the steppes may have been the exceptions to this general rule, but even most of the successful steppe civilizations eventually became sedentary and developed urban centers. In this regard, the Confederacy of Arzawa, and Arzawa proper in particular, were seemingly no different. Although the nature of Arzawa's political confederacy may have been somewhat unique among its late Bronze Age peers, it was more or less an urban society with a capital city named Apasa. Apasa was mentioned in numerous Hittite texts, and though it is never stated as explicitly being the capital of Arzawa, the fact that it was mentioned more than any other Arzawan city, and the fact that Arzawan kings resided there strongly, suggests it was the seat of Arzawa's government. Locating Apasa in modern times has been as difficult as locating Arzawa itself, but based on descriptions of it in the Hittite texts, there is a consensus that it was located somewhere on the coast. Some believe Apasa was actually the city of Ephesus, which would place it, and therefore Arzawa proper, on the central Aegean coastline. In addition to being the seat of Arzawa's government, Apasa apparently became a destination for Hittite exiles and fugitives. The enemies of the Hittites considered Apasa to be a safe location far from the reach of Hittite power, and there's every reason to believe that throughout Arzawa's history, the kings of Arzawa were only too happy to accept Hittite fugitives, especially nobles and those with standing, and use them as political weapons against their Anatolian rivals. Once high-ranking exiles and fugitives arrived in Apasa, they probably experienced a palace culture that was quite similar to the one in Hattusa. Likewise, Arzawan village life was also probably quite similar to Hittite village life. One other urban centre worth mentioning is Milawanda, which some historians believe corresponded with classical Miletus, also on the Aegean coast. 
Milawanda's origins and pre-classical history are mysterious, as modern archaeological studies have indicated both Arzawan and Mycenaean influences. Milawanda may have been the seat of the Ahiyawa state, which many believe to have been a Mycenaean kingdom. Milawanda possibly changed hands between Arzawa and Ahiyawa, but either way, it was later raided and likely levelled by the Hittite King Mursili II, who ruled from about 1330 to 1295 BC. Compiling an accurate chronology of Arzawa's history is just as difficult as locating its exact location in Anatolia, due to the lack of archaeology and the fact that what has been excavated resembles Hittite material culture. One could be forgiven for thinking this offers something of an advantage, as it could be logical to assign periods to Arzawan artefacts based on the known periods when similar Hittite artefacts were created. This may be the case occasionally, but the dearth of overall material makes this difficult, and the uneven nature of Arzawan archaeology makes the prospect almost impossible. If archaeologists could excavate a passer, perhaps Arzawa's chronology would be clearer, but it currently sits far below Ephesus. The major obstacle to compiling a complete chronology is the dearth of written records. Historians have been able to construct chronologies for most of the major kingdoms in the Near East during the Late Bronze Age, as well as some of the minor kingdoms, thanks to a plethora of written sources. Most of the kingdoms had high degrees of literacy and kept document collections in royal archives and libraries, such as the Hittite royal archives in Hattusa. Unfortunately, no Arzawan royal archive has yet to be located, and most of the Luwian language texts from Arzawa are short and detail little about the confederation. Thus, scholars are forced to look elsewhere for chronological and historiographical texts about Arzawa, namely the Hittites and Egyptians. Although the Arzawa confederation existed by at least the 15th century BC, Arzawa proper existed before then, and the Hittite sources mention contact with Arzawa. Hattusili I, who ruled from about 1650 to 1620 BC, was the first king of the Hittite Old Kingdom, and his reign left behind a written record that describes Hittite expansion in Anatolia, but also losses in the northern Levant and Mesopotamia. Hattusili attacked Arzawa during his time in power, possibly to gain control of the tin supply and routes that snaked through Anatolia. Tin, along with copper, was used to create the alloy bronze, which was used to make weapons, armour and ornaments throughout the Bronze Age. Anatolia was known for its rich tin deposits, and although the Hittites had control over deposits in central Anatolia, they apparently hoped to monopolise the entire Anatolian tin trade. While the Hittites were busy with Arzawa in western Anatolia, the Hurrians made incursions into south-central Anatolia, setting back Hattusili's imperial ambitions a bit. That might help explain that while Hattusili I placed Arzawa under his rule for a brief period, the level of control that the Hittites exerted is questionable. It is likely that the Hittites devoted most of their resources to controlling and maintaining the lucrative tin routes, but beyond that, they probably had little control over Arzawa. As the Hittites continued to fight with the Hurrians and other Anatolian kingdoms to the south and in the Taurus Mountains, the Arzawans took the opportunity to reassert their independence. It likely didn't require a widespread rebellion. The few Hittite garrisons that were stationed to protect the trade routes were likely called back to fight the Hurrians, and the Arzawans simply filled the vacuum. There is very little documentation of Hittite Arzawan relations after Hattusili I, largely because the Hittites entered an interregnum period that lasted from about 1500 BC until the Hittite New Kingdom began, with the rule of Tudalia I from about 1430 to 1400 BC. The Confederation of Arzawa is believed to have started sometime in the mid 15th century BC just as the great powers of the Near East were expanding their borders and building the Late Bronze Age system. It is during this time that Arzawa's chronology becomes a bit clearer thanks to Hittite documents. By the mid-15th century BC, a man named Kupanta Kurunta ruled Arzawa, but it's unclear whether he came from Arzawa proper or one of the smaller constituent kingdoms. What is known, though, is that he was an enemy of Hatti and that the Hittites were willing to install different vassals on their border with Arzawa 
in order to protect their flank. An interesting and important geopolitical situation unfolded on the frontier between Arzawa and Hatti in the early 14th century BC that was recorded by the Hittites. The texts involve official correspondence between a man who would later become king of Arzawa, Maduwata, who ruled in the late 15th century and early 14th century BC, and an unnamed Hittite king, either Anuwanda I or Tudalia II. Many of the texts in the archives mention Ahiyawa, but the ones most relevant for early Arzawa's chronology are often collectively referred to as the Indictment of Maduwata. The dating of the texts has moved forward in time a bit, as mid-20th century scholars place the date of the events and Maduwata's reign a few decades earlier. But there is a consensus on the order of his rule and the Arzawan kings who followed him, thereby establishing a fairly solid chronology. Maduwata's entry into the historical record begins once he fled Arzawa after Ahiyawa raids forced him into exile. The Hittite texts are quite clear on the matter and even name the king of the Ahiyawans. Atarisia, the ruler of Ahia, chased you, Maduwata, out of your land. Then he harassed you and kept chasing you, and he continued to seek an evil death for you, Maduwata. He would have killed you, but you, Maduwata, fled to the father of my majesty and the father of my majesty saved you from death. He got rid of Atarisia for you. Otherwise, Atarisia would not have left you alone, but would have killed you. The texts do not state what Arzawan kingdom Maduwata came from, a sign that it was not important to the Hittites. What was important to them came next, as they attempted to turn Maduwata's misfortune into their advantage. The Hittite king installed Maduwata as a vassal or puppet ruler of the small kingdom of Zipasla in order to provide a buffer against Arzawa, and the Hittites forced Maduwata to take an oath, presumably on the storm god, to stay loyal to the Hittite state as long as he sat on the throne of Zipasla. The kingdom of Zipasla was probably close to the major Arzawan kingdom of Hapala and the lesser kingdom of Pitasa. The Hittite texts demonstrate that Maduwata was aware of his somewhat diminished status and the fact that Zipasla was a minor kingdom between the greater kingdoms of Arzawa and Hatti. But Maduwata said as follows to the father of my majesty, You, my lord, have given me the land of Mount Zipasla to occupy, so that I am the border guard and the watchman of this land. And whoever speaks of a matter of hostility before me, or whenever, I myself hear of a hostility from some land, then I will not conceal that person or that land from the father of his majesty, but I will indeed always write about them. Maduwata played the role of a loyal vassal for a time, but he was also using that time to make his move in Arzawa. He was an ambitious ruler who had no desire to rule a minor buffer state and be the Hittite's lapdog, so after some time on the throne of Zipasla, he began making moves against the king of Arzawa, Kupanta Kurunta. The problem was that his oath to the Hittites all but expressly forbade such intrigues. I have now given you the land of Mount Zipasla, so occupy it alone. You shall not occupy in addition another river valley or another land on your own authority. The land of Mount Zipasla shall be your march. Be my servant and your troops shall be my troops. Of course, oaths were routinely broken in the ancient world and were only as good as the force that the stronger party had to back the oaths up. In the case of Maduwata and the Hittites, the former was building an army that could rival the Hittites. Maduwata's next move was to attack Kupanta Karunta and Arzawa, despite that move not being sanctioned by the Hittites, and thus deemed a violation of the oath. According to the Hittite texts, Maduwata's war against Arzawa did not end well for him. But Maduwata seized the entire land and then he mobilized it en masse with its troops. He went in battle against Kupanta Karunta, but when Kupanta Karunta heard about it, he proceeded to turn loose the troops of the land of Arzawa. Then the troops of the land of Arzawa went against Maduwata and disposed of absolutely all of the troops of Maduwata. Maduwata fled alone. In regard to the army, the few men who escaped, they also disposed of all of it. Although he broke his oath, Maduwata was not punished by the Hittites. Instead, the Hittites sent troops to the region to save the recalcitrant king from losing his small kingdom to Kupanta Karunta. 
And when the father of my majesty heard, then he sent Piseni, the nobleman, together with infantry and chariotry to the aid of Madawata. And they went. But when they came to him, they found Madawata's wives, his children, their civilian captives, and goods of Kupantakurunta, up in Salawasi. And these, too, they gave to Madawata. And Kupantakurunta was kept apart by himself, and Kupantakurunta fled alone. All of this they disposed of, and they installed Madawata in his place once more. The Hittites must have figured it was beneficial to keep Madawata on the throne of the Zippusla Buffer State, in spite of his behavior. The Hittites may have further thought that after rescuing Madawata and his family from the hands of the Arzawan king, he would be grateful and accept his role. However, Madawata's ambitions would not be satiated until he attained his goal of conquering Arzawa or becoming its king in some other manner. After losing on the battlefield to Kapanta Karunta, Madhuwata decided to employ other measures to reach his goal, namely guile and diplomacy. Madhuwata's next opportunity came when the city of Dalawa rebelled against the Hittites. Madhuwata wrote to the Hittite governor in charge of the region that he would attack Dalawa, while the Hittites would attack another rebellious city called Hindua. In reality, Madhuwata was leading the Hittites into a trap, as a Hittite document explained. Then because Madawata did not go to Dalawa for battle, but in fact wrote away to the people of Dalawa saying, The troops of Hatti have just gone to Hindua for battle. Block the road before them and attack them. Then they deployed the troops of Dalawa on the road. They proceeded to block the way of our troops and routed them. They killed Kisnapili and Patahula, but Madawata laughed out loud about them. This betrayal was only one part of a complex plan put together by Madawata who also sought to make peace with old enemies. Madawata turned to his former enemy, Kupanta Kurunta, and offered his daughter in marriage for an alliance against the Hittites. This was a bold move by Madawata, but once the Arzawan king accepted, it meant that Madawata had a powerful new ally, and there was little the Hittites could do. One Hittite text noted, Kupanta Kurunta has sworn these things to Madawata, and he has the former's own begotten daughter in marriage, would Madawata be plotting evil against his son-in-law and his own daughter? Madawata had made plain that ancient Anatolian oaths weren't worth much, and he also leveraged the kind of political acumen needed to counter the Hittites by giving his daughter in marriage to Kupanta Kurunta. The Hittites apparently had little leverage after Madawata made these diplomatic moves, no doubt partially due to the troops they lost in the Dalawa affair so they could only write to the king and complain that he had broken his oath to them. By then, however, Madawata would not be deterred from his goal, and the Hittite texts go on to explain that Madawata did in fact realize his goal of conquering Arzawa and becoming its king. But Madawata transgressed the oath to the father of my majesty, and he took all the land of Arzawa, and he ruled it. Madawata placed the land of Hapala under oath as follows. Either I will smite the land of Hapala, or I will carry it off, together with civilian captives, cattle and sheep, and I will turn it over to your majesty. But subsequently you did not smite the land of Hapala, you did not capture it, and you did not turn it over to my majesty. Madawata took it for himself. Kupanta Kurunta was not mentioned again, so one can assume that he retained rule over a minor principality, while his new son-in-law became king of the Arzawa Confederation. It is unknown if Madawata initiated a dynasty based in Arzawa proper or if his successors came from the different constituent kingdoms of the confederation, but his rule did mark the beginning of a succession of nine rulers who were considered to be the kings of Arzawa. In the years after Madawata's reign, Arzawa's prospects would ebb and flow, usually correlating with the prospects of neighboring Hatti. The next two Arzawan kings, Tahundaradu and Anzapahadu, are not known for conducting any major military campaigns, but one of them was on the receiving end of Hittite aggression. When the Hittites were dealing with Madawata, they also had to contend with other hostile peoples on their borders, particularly the Gascar people from the Pontic Alps, who may have sacked the Hittite capital of Hattusa. The Hittites quickly rebuilt under the rule of Tudalia III from about 1360 to 1344 BC. 
and Tudalia III also focused on gaining backland the Hittites lost to other Anatolian peoples. Tudalia campaigned against Arzawa proper and the Arzawa Confederate Kingdom of Seha River land early in his reign, but the endeavor was probably a razia or a punitive operation more than a campaign of conquest. Tudalia III was a prototypical Hittite king, a warrior and priest who brought order to the realm. So when he died, Anatolia was once more thrust into a period of instability. The untimely death of a Hittite king often brought chaos to Hattusa, and that chaos usually extended throughout Anatolia and the Near East. In the early 14th century BC, the Mitanni kingdom was still the most powerful empire in the region of southeastern Anatolia, the northern Levant, and northern Mesopotamia. So while the Hittites fought with Arzawa, Mitanni took advantage of the situation. Tudalia III was able to keep both of the Hittites' primary foes in check, but his death brought another period of instability, and Arzawa, probably under the rule of Piyama Kurunda, took advantage of Hatti's weakness by expanding east to the Cilician Gates. For a short time, Arzawa actually became the strongest power in Anatolia, but fortunes changed as quickly as new rulers came to the throne, and when Supiluliuma came to the throne in Hatti, things changed once again. During his reign from about 1344 to 1322 BC, Supiluliuma led campaigns in the west and east, wresting back most of the land the Hittites lost to Arzawa and destroying the Mitanni capital of Washukani around 1340 BC. Even as the Hittites regained their strength for most of the 14th century BC, the Hittites made no major advances into Arzawa, which must have meant they didn't have the power to do so. In conjunction with that, the primary sources indicate that Maduata's successors, especially Tarhundaradu, had ambitions beyond Anatolia and attempted to integrate Arzawa into the Great Powers Club of the Near East in the Late Bronze Age. How successful they were remains an open question. The Great Powers system lasted from about 1500 to 1200 BC beginning near the start of the Late Bronze Age and ending with the Sea People's invasions across the eastern Mediterranean basin. Most of what is known about the Great Powers Club came after the Amarna Letters were discovered in Amarna, Egypt in 1887. The Amarna Letters are a collection of 300 clay tablets inscribed primarily in the cuneiform script of the Akkadian language, although a few others were written in other languages. The texts are diplomatic in nature, and because they were discovered in Egypt, most relate to Egyptian royal correspondence with other kingdoms in the Near East. The letters generally follow a formulaic template, and the language was similar throughout, with the kings of the larger kingdoms referring to each other as brother or great kings, while the correspondence between the great empires and the smaller kingdoms and colonies indicated a clear power hierarchy. In addition to the Amarna letters, the archives of Hattusa and various texts from Egypt, Babylon, Ugarit and other cities in the Levant have helped modern scholars determine who was a great power and who was a minor power in this system. Today, most experts agree that the core members of the great powers were Babylonia, Egypt, Hatti, Mitanni and Alashia, and Assyria later replaced Mitanni. The minor powers consisted of smaller city-states in the Levant, Anatolia and Mesopotamia, with Ugarit being among the most important. Elam was a major state at the time, but it was not in direct correspondence with most of the states, so it is not considered one of the great powers. This leaves two states that were possibly great powers, Arzawa and Ahiyawa. Before examining the primary sources that support Arzawa being included in the Great Powers Club, it is important to consider Ahiyawa's standing because it had direct contact with Arzawa, and although they were occasionally opposed to each other, their geopolitical fortunes were often directly tied together. Among the many important texts in the Hattusa archives was a text known as the Tawagalawa Letter, which was written by a Hittite king to a Mycenaean Ahiyawa king. The letter primarily concerned a Hittite rebel who had been raiding Hittite lands at the behest of the Ahiyawa king. And though Ahiyawa is never mentioned in the Amarna letters as a great power, the Tawagalawa letter indicates that the Hittites viewed them as such. I have used force, 
But now the message of my brother that came orally came to the great king. We will set this legal dispute down before ourselves. You, my brother, send me one of your servants. The one who brought you that message, that message is corrupted. I will set it down here separately, and let that man be beheaded. If your man has altered your message, let that man be beheaded too. Let them stew and the head that they cut off. And where will that bloodshed lead? Because your servant spoke this false message, he alone must die. If the message did not come from your mouth, then the servant. Did he not determine it on your behalf? If the great king, my peer, had spoken I, the servant would have it. Other evidence for an extensive Ahiyawa influence in the eastern Mediterranean and Anatolia include pottery in western Anatolia, which once more raises the question of where Ahiyawa ended and Azawa began. If Ahiyawa was considered a great power by the Hittites in the 14th century BC, it is likely the other great powers also considered Ahiyawa a peer, and other texts seem to indicate that Azawa was also a member of the elite club. There are no known extant diplomatic texts between Arzawa and Ahiyawa, and those that do exist between Arzawa and Hatti usually have a combative tone. But there are two Amarna letters that were exchanged between the Egyptian king Amenhotep III, who ruled from about 1391 to 1353 BC, and Arzawa's king Tahunderadu. The diplomatic letters provide more information about Arzawa's history from a perspective other than the Hittites, and offer some details about what was taking place at the time in the Anatolian kingdom. The two letters also offer some interesting discussion points about Arzawa's place in the Great Powers Club. Most notably, the two letters were written in Hittite cuneiform instead of Akkadian cuneiform, which was the diplomatic lingua franca of the Late Bronze Age. Some historians suggest this meant Arzawa was not a full member of the Great Powers Club, given that all other powerful members had scribes knowledgeable in Akkadian at their disposal. The letters also provide an interesting historical examination of modern philological studies. When the two Arzawan letters were discovered along with the other letters in Amarna, they were immediately placed off to the side as anomalies, because even though the letters employed the cuneiform script, the experts then looking at the documents were not immediately familiar with the language. The large cache of Hittite archives in Hattusa were not discovered until 1906, so scholars could only compare the two documents with a limited number of Hittite texts to determine that the two letters employed an Indo-European language. In 1902, Norwegian scholar J. Knutsen explained that the two were written in the Arzawan language. Once the tablets discovered at Hattusa in 1906 were published, scholars learned that the language of the two documents was actually Hittite, which opened new possibilities for the study of Arzawa. One final element of the letters worth pointing out is their order of publication. All Amarna letters were assigned numbers with the abbreviation EA for El Amarna of the original publication, and the numbers generally follow what the original translators, Knutsen among others, believed was the proper chronological order, but subsequent studies have revealed this was not always the case. Many scholars now believe that EA 31 was actually Tara Hundaradu's response to Amenhotep III's request for a marriage alliance, but that one or more letters are missing. EA 32 reads, Behold, concerning the fact that Kalbaya has spoken this word to me, let us establish a blood relationship. In this matter I do not trust Kalbaya. He has indeed spoken it as a word, but it was not confirmed on the tablet. If you really desire my daughter, how? Should I not give her to you? I give her to you. See to it now that Kalbaya returns quickly with my messenger, and write back to me on a tablet concerning this matter. May Nabu, the king of wisdom, and Ishtanush of the gateway, graciously protect the scribe who reads this tablet, and around you may they graciously hold their hands. You, scribe, write well to me, put down moreover your name. The tablets that are brought here always write in Hittite. There are probably letters missing whereby the kings established their credentials and exchanged pleasantries before the idea of a marriage alliance was broached. At first glance, this does appear to be the first letter of the two, but the mention of things to be done that you wrote me about 
strongly suggests this was not the first letter between the two kings. The letter went on to state, Nimuwarea, great king, king of Egypt, speaks as follows. Say to Tarhundaradu, the king of Arzawa, by me all is well. For my house, my wives, my children, my magnates, my troops, my chariot fighters, all my property in my countries, all is well. By you too may all be well. For your houses, your wives, your children, your magnates, your troops, your chariot fighters, your property in your countries, may all be very well. Behold, I have sent to you Irshapa, my messenger, with the instruction. Let us see the daughter whom they will offer to my majesty in marriage. And he will pour oil on her head. Behold, I have sent to you a sack of gold, it is of excellent quality. As to the things to be done that you wrote me about with the words, send it here to me. Now I will send it soon to you, but later. First, send back quickly your messenger and the messenger from me, and they must come, then they will come back to you, and bring along the bride price for the daughter. My messenger and your messenger who came, and send to me too people of the country Kashka. I have heard that everything is finished, and that the country Hattusa is shattered. And behold, I have sent to you as a greeting gift a consignment in the charge of my messenger, Irshapa, a sack of gold weighing twenty minas of gold, three light linen garments, three light line mantles, three linen huzi, one line kushiti, one hundred linen shawalga, one hundred linen hapa, one hundred linen mutaliasha, four large kukubu containers of sweet oil, six small kukubu containers of sweet oil, three chairs of ebony overlaid with beautiful sharp and gold, ten chairs of ebony inlaid with ivory, one hundred beams of ebony as a greeting gift. The letters indicate that Arzawa was clearly an important geopolitical player at the time, if not literally one of the great powers. After all, even though Amenhotep III never referred to Tarhundaradu as brother or a great king, he did ply the Arzawan king with plenty of expensive luxury goods. Perhaps there are texts yet to be discovered that include Arzawa and Ahiyawa among the great powers, but that prospect raises other questions about Arzawa's potential diplomatic reach. If Arzawa and Ahiyawa were neighbours, and if both were at least on the periphery of the great powers club, why are there no correspondence texts between them? Also, why are there no extant correspondence texts between Arzawa and Mitanni before the latter's collapse, which took place after these two documents were written? One would think that as Arzawa's influence grew, it would have made overtures to Mitanni since the Hittites were a mutual enemy. At this point, all that can be said for sure is that Arzawa was a powerful state in the early 14th century BC and had some relations with the great powers and Ahiyawa. The Amarna letters also reveal that Tarhundaradu may have been a bit more politically astute than was commonly thought. In one of them, Amenhotep III noted the Hittites were once again having problems, going so far as to say that Hattusa is shattered. This period likely coincided with the death of Tudalia III and the short period of chaos that followed, which was discussed earlier. Tahundaradu apparently saw an opening to not only expand Arzawa's borders, but also widen its diplomatic presence in the Near East. It is unknown if Tahundaradu ultimately sent his daughter to Amenhotep III, as there are no known letters between the two afterwards, and no Egyptian texts from Amenhotep's reign mention an Arzawan princess. Either way, in the years after Tahundaradu's rule, Arzawa moved closer to Ahiyawa while maintaining its adversarial relationship with Hatti. Arzawa's Decline Arzawa's geopolitical ascendancy and possible membership in the Great Powers Club was short-lived, and after Tarhundaradu's relatively successful and vigorous reign, Arzawa was ruled by a succession of unimpressive and mostly unimportant kings. Historians have narrowed down the number and names of these Arzawan kings, but the lengths of their reigns are hard to determine, and that poses a problem for the overall chronology of the kingdom. Between the end of Tarhundaradu's rule and the defeat of the last independent Arzawan king, Uhaziti at the hands of the Hittites, only about fifty years had elapsed, but eight kings had taken the throne of Arzawa. If the average reign for Arzawan kings during this time was just over six years, 
It could not have boded well for the Confederation's stability, but Arzawa still had one last burst of relevance left that it would attempt to unleash on Anatolia. Uhaziti, who ruled during the late 14th century BC, is renowned not only for being the last known independent ruler of Arzawa, but also for being its greatest leader since Tahunderadu. Due to its very nature, the Confederation required a strong ruler to keep the constituent states in line and ensure everyone was pursuing the same geopolitical objectives. Based on the Hittite sources, Uhaziti was a strong leader who put together the greatest pan arzawan confederacy in the kingdom's history. In addition to consolidating the confederacy in western Anatolia, Uhaziti attempted to make, or keep, Arzawa relevant geopolitically. It is unknown how long Tarhundaradu's relationship with Egypt continued, as events that took place in the Nile Valley, particularly the religious reforms initiated by Akhenaten in the mid-14th century BC during the Amarna period, overshadowed the political relations the Egyptians had with other groups for a few decades. With that said, Hittite texts suggest the Egyptians continued to court Arzawa during the reign of the Hittite king Supiluliuma, the first from about 1344 to 1322 BC. Arzawa was likely willing to reciprocate, and there was little the Hittites could do at the time. After Supiluliuma's rule, the Hittite throne passed to Anuanda, the second around 1330 BC. But he ruled less than a year, and was either assassinated or died from plague in the Levant. The situation in Hatti gave Uhaziti the chance to strengthen his position in Anatolia at the expense of the Hittites, but it brought the ire of a new Hittite king who was more than a match for Uhaziti. The Hittite king Mursili II, who ruled from about 1330 to 1295 BC, waited for the right time and place to strike, and his opportunity finally came when Arzawa and Ahiyawa aligned against Hatti. Although the governments of the late Bronze Age were autocratic monarchies, the rulers did have to follow a certain level of decorum. War can be a costly affair in terms of lives and other resources, so monarchs had to proceed with caution and corral as much support as possible from the nobles and military before embarking on any major military campaigns. This was especially the case in the often unstable Hatti, where kings were assassinated for not choosing the right friends. So when Musili decided to campaign against Arzawa, he needed a true casus belli before doing so. Musili's opportunity presented via a situation that normally would not have led to war. At some point, a group of Hittite exiles referred to in the texts as men of Atarima fled from Hatti to Arzawa for refuge. The Hittite texts offered little background about these men of Atarima, suggesting that their rank was of little importance, but their actions provided Masili II with a pretext to attack Arzawa, after Masili's request to Uhaziti to return the exiles was rebuffed. In the following year I went, the troops of the towns of Huarsanasa and Suruda fled before me, and entered the land of Arzawa. Then I sent a messenger to Uhaziti, writing to him, Give back to me those men, the troops of the towns of Atarima, Huasanasa and Suruda, who have come to you. But Uhaziti wrote back to me as follows, I will not give anyone back to you. Mursili II had likely planned for this war not long after he became king, or possibly before, because the war against Arzawa consisted of a two-season military campaign that was recorded in the annals for the third and fourth years of his rule. The damaged text may also indicate that Arnuanda had begun preparations. Meanwhile, it appears that Uhaziti was caught completely off guard by the attack. Given that the historical record was written by the Hittites, it come as little surprise that they typically overlooked the battles they lost, but even if they suffered some setbacks against Arzawa, the early tide was clearly in their favour. The Hittite annals described how Mursili destroyed one Arzawan town after another. Furthermore, I went forth to the town of Ishupita and attacked the town of Palhuisa. Behind Palhuisa, the enemy of the town of Peshuru met me in battle, and I fought with them. The sun goddess of Arina, my lady, the powerful storm god, my lord, Mazula, and all the gods ran before me, so that I destroyed the Peshurian enemy behind Palhuisa, and in addition burned down the town. At this point, 
Uhaziti still controlled a lot of territory, including the important Arzawan capital city of Apasa. So Mursili pushed his force west until catching up with the Arzawans at the Astapa River, which possibly marked the boundary between Ozawa and Hatti. Once they met there, the battle proved to be pivotal. The Hittite texts explained, When I had set out and arrived at Mount Lawasa, the storm god my lord made manifest his providence. He launched a lightning bolt, and my army saw the lightning bolt, as did the land of Arzawa. The lightning bolt travelled and struck the land of Arzawa, in particular, Apasa, the city of Uhaziti. Uhaziti fell on his knees and became ill, and being ill, he did not come against me in battle again. Rather, he dispatched his son Piyama Kurunta against me, together with infantry and chariotry. He met me in battle at the Astapa River, and I, my majesty, fought with him. The sun goddess of Arina, my lady, the powerful storm god, my lord Mezula, and all the gods ran before me, so that I defeated Piyama Kurunta, son of Uhaziti, together with his infantry and chariotry, and destroyed them. I pursued him and crossed the territory of Azawa and entered Apasa, city of Uhaziti. Uhaziti did not offer me resistance but ran away from me. He went across the sea to the islands and remained there. The text indicates that Uhaziti refused to engage Musili directly during the conflict, choosing to move throughout Azawa and its confederate kingdoms. Uhaziti likely resorted to hit and run or even guerrilla tactics because the mobilized Hittite army was so formidable. The Arzawan force then attempted to defend Apasa, but were driven out, forcing them to face the Hittites in one last battle. The battle near the Astapa River was not the end of the conflict, but Arzawa suffered another major blow off the battlefield when Uha Ziti died of an illness. The Hittite texts explained, when spring arrived, because Uha Ziti was still ill, he remained in the midst of the sea. His sons were with him, and Uhaziti died in the midst of the sea. Then his sons parted company. One remained right there in the midst of the sea, while the other, Tapala Zunawali, came out from the sea. Because all of Azawa had gone up to Paranda, Tapala Zunawali went up to Paranda too. The midst of the sea refers to islands, probably in the Aegean, and possibly those controlled by Ahiyawa, which Azawa was aligned with at this point. No more details are given about Uhaziti's death, so it is not known if he died from injuries sustained on the battlefield or some other ailment. What is known is that his successor, Tapalazunawali, was immediately chased by Masili to the fortified Arzawan city of Paranda. Tapalazunawali may not have even had a chance to be officially coronated as the king of Arzawa because his hands were full with the Hittites. According to the Hittite texts, Mursili did not immediately follow Tapalazunawali to Paranda, but instead participated in an annual Hittite religious festival. The texts didn't relate whether he returned to Hattusa to do so, or if he conducted the ceremonies in the field, but either way, the respite should have given Tapalazunawali time to mobilize the Arzawan forces. The Hittite documents continue. When I had finished with the annual festival, I went in battle to Paranda, and Tapala Zunawali came down from Paranda, together with his infantry and chariotry. He came against me in battle, and he met me in battle on his own ground. I, my majesty, fought with him. The sun goddess of Arina, my lady, the powerful storm god, my lord, Mezula, and all the gods ran before me, so that I defeated Tapala Zunawali, together with his infantry and his chariotry, and I destroyed them. I pursued him and proceeded to invest Paranda. I bottled it up and cut off its water. The time the Arzawans had to mobilize ultimately did not save them, nor did the advantage of defending their homes, and the historical records don't mention what ultimately happened to Tapalazunawali. His family was captured, and it seems that after he fled, leadership of Arzawa passed to Piyama Kurunta, who was living in exile in Ahiyawa territory when his brother was defeated. Seeing that Azawa was all but finished and Musili was triumphant, the king of Ahiyawa decided that protecting Piyamakurunta had become more trouble than it was worth. The Hittites claimed, Piyamakurunta, son of Uhaziti, he came out from the sea and he entered into exile with the king of Ahiyawa.
and I, my majesty, sent a messenger to him by ship, and he was brought out. The captives who were brought out with him, together with the captives of the cities of, and Lipa, all together were in number. I dispatched them to Hattusa, and they were led away. Azawa had been utterly defeated, but Mosili had to make sure that the once mighty confederacy would never again rise up against the Hittites. After defeating Arzawa on the battlefield, the Hittites went about eliminating Uhaziti's family. It remains a mystery if he had them all killed or held them as royal hostages in Hattusa, but he successfully eliminated Uhaziti's family from holding any power. Since Arzawa was a confederacy, Musili fragmented the lands by appointing different leaders who were loyal to the Hittites. Musili II divided Arzawa into three primary vassal states. Mira and Kualia, Apawia and the Seha River land, and Hapala. The Hittite texts explained, Then I went to the land of Mira. I have the land of Mira to Mashuilua, the land of Seha River to Manapatar Hunta, and the land of Hapala to Targasnali. I subjected these lands in place and imposed troop levies upon them, and they began to provide troops to me. And because I spent the winter in Arzawa, for two years the sun goddess of Arina, my lady, the powerful storm god, my lord, Mazula, and all the gods ran before me, so that I conquered Arzawa. Some of the population of Arzawa I brought back to Hattusa, and some I subjugated in place, imposing troop levies upon them, and they began to send me troops. Because I conquered all of Arzawa, the captives whom I brought to the royal establishment numbered altogether 66,000. Although the fate of Arzawa proper is not mentioned in this passage, it is safe to assume that it too was conquered and occupied, with one explanation for the lack of mention being that it was subsumed with Mira. With that, the Hittites had effectively conquered Arzawa and incorporated it into their empire. Although Mursili II conquered Arzawa, and made it a province in the Hittite Empire, the Arzawan people continued to exist. The Hittite king Muatali II, who ruled from about 1295 to 1272 BC, was a vigorous warrior king who embarked on notable campaigns in northern Anatolia, regaining a temple to the storm god that was temporarily lost to the Gasca people. His crowning achievement was fighting the Egyptian king Ramses II, to a stalemate in the Levant in 1286 or 1285 BC at Kadesh, a battle that is notorious for being a strategic draw or Hittite victory that the pharaoh subsequently turned into a propaganda victory across Egypt. Muatali II was also able to assert control over Azawa's former allies and confederates in the face of rebellions. By that point, Azawa's strength had long diminished and it was no longer able to take advantage of incursions into Hittite territory by other peoples. However, when Tudalia IV came to the Hittite throne in 1237 BC, the Arzawan saw it as a chance for one last try at independence. Mursili II spared the Seha River land of most of his wrath during his campaign against Arzawa, because its king, Manapa Tarhunta, begged for mercy and switched allegiances from Arzawa to Hatti. During the reign of Tudalia IV, though, the Seha River land, led by a man named Tahunta Radu, organized a rebellion along with the help of Arzawa proper and Wallarima. Tahunta Radu may have overthrown or assassinated Masturi, who was installed by Muatali II, but that can't be stated with certainty. A text from Hattusa related some of the details of the rebellion, a brief history of the Arzawan Confederation's relationship with Hatti, and Tahunta Radu's fate. Theus says Tabarna Tudalia, great king, the land of the Seha River offended once more for the second time, saying, The great grandfather of his majesty did not conquer us earlier by force of arms, and when the grandfather of his majesty conquered the Arzawa lands, he did not conquer us by force of arms. He would have conquered us, but we eliminated the offence against him. But afterwards, Tahunta Radu became hostile and relied upon the king of Ahiyawa. He took refuge on Eagle Peak. Then I, the great king, set out and captured Eagle Peak. I brought down five hundred teams of chariotry and so many infantrymen. I brought Tahunta Radu, together with his wives and children, to Hatti, and led him to Arina, city of the sun goddess. 
It is interesting to note that Ahiyawa once again played a role in the ongoing conflict between Hatti and the Arzawan states, taking the side of the weakened Arzawa against the ascendant Hittites this time. But even as Ahiyawa was attempting to gain a favourable position in the ongoing Anatolian conflict, the late Bronze Age system itself was living on borrowed time. Tudalia IV's campaign marked the end of Arzawa and its Confederate constituents' independence, but it did not necessarily mean the end of the state itself or its people. Although Mursali II claimed to have deported tens of thousands of Arzawans to the Hittite capital of Hattusa, there were likely many times that number still living in western Anatolia, so their culture lived on despite being under Hittite rule. Once again, however, this brings the conversation back to the nature of Arzawan culture and how similar it was to Hittite culture, so it is difficult to pinpoint how much longer it continued. To shed light on this, historians have looked to Egyptian texts for clues, and one major event around the year 1200 BC has been used to definitively mark the end of Arzawa. As mentioned above, Muwatali II and Tudhalia IV campaigned against some of Arzawa's former confederates, particularly the Sehar River land, but Arzawa proper was conspicuously absent from mention in Tudalia, the fourth's campaign. While that might have indicated Arzawa and its people had been eliminated or subsumed into the greater Western Anatolian culture by that time, based on an important Egypt text, it appears Arzawa continued to exist, possibly as both a country and a people. The Battle of Kadesh was commemorated by the Egyptians in inscriptions on numerous temples across Egypt as well as on papyrus. Both the Egyptians and Hittites were well organised into divisions comprised of infantry and chariots, totalling about 40,000 in each army. Both kings were also on hand to lead their forces into battle. The Egyptian sources detailed the units that comprised the Hittite army, one of which was Arzawan. One of the Egyptian texts described the combatants. They said to his majesty, Look, the vile chief of Kati has come together with the many countries who are with him, whom he has brought with him as allies, the land of Dardani, the land of Nahrin, that of Keshkesh, those of Masa, those Pidasa, the land of Karkisha and Luka, the land of Karkemish, the land of Arzawa. They are equipped with their infantry and their chariotry and with their weapons of war. They are more numerous than the sands of the shores. Look, they stand equipped and ready to fight behind Kadesh the Old. Arzawa is also listed in the papyrus bulletin as a nation with a chief. The Egyptians claimed, and the wretched chief of Kati stood among his troops and chariots. Watching his majesty fight all alone, without his soldiers and charioteers, stood turning, shrinking, afraid. Then he caused many chiefs to come, each of them with his chariotry, equipped with their weapons of warfare, the chief of Arzawa and he of Masa. Interestingly, the text employs the Egyptian word for chief, which usually indicated the ruler of a lesser or smaller kingdom. Therefore, it is likely that in 1286 or 1285 BC, Arzawa was still viewed as a distinct, albeit colonised, country. Arzawa continued as a Hittite colony for about another 100 years until the Hittites and the Bronze Age order altogether collapsed under the weight of a series of migrations and invasions by groups of mysterious foreigners. The Hurrians and the Kingdom of Mitanni To understand the significance of Mitanni in the Bronze Age Near East, it is necessary to know about the Hurrian people and their language. The Hurrians played an important role throughout the ancient Near East and were crucial in the formation of the Mitanni Empire around 1500 BC. For decades, the Hurrian language and people were complete riddles, and while it was apparent that the people used a cuneiform style of writing, the Hurrian language was not immediately recognised. The discovery of the cuneiform tablets at the ancient site of Amarna, Egypt, helped advance the general study of Near Eastern history and philology, but it did little to help identify the undecipherable Hurrian texts. When the royal archives of the Hittite capital of Hattusa were excavated in the early 20th century, Researchers were pleased to find bilingual Hittite Hurrian texts, which allowed them to finally decipher the language. To the surprise of most scholars, Hurrian was a member of the Caucasian linguistic cultural family, 
clearly separating it from the more common Semitic and Indo-European languages used across the region at that time. Immediately, those who studied the ancient Near East were faced with obvious questions surrounding the Hurrian's origins. Many believed that they had migrated to the Near East from the Caucasus mountain region, while others thought that they may have been native to northern Mesopotamia and the Syrian plains, or at least lived there at the dawn of civilization in the late 4th millennium BC. The Hurrian's written materials offer little information about their origins, but as with much of Mitanni history, outside primary sources give a number of clues. The Hurrians are probably referenced a few times in the Old Testament of the Bible as Horites or Horims. Genesis and Numbers mention that they lived in what later became the land of Edom before the Edomites inhabited it. According to the Book of Numbers, the Horims also dwelt in Seir before time, but the children of Esau succeeded them when they had destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead, as Israel did unto the land of his possession which the Lord gave unto them. This passage would place the Hurrians from the region between the Dead Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba sometime before the Edomites were known to be there in the mid-second millennium BC. But other evidence for the presence of the Hurrians in the Levant and or Syria remain scant, and it must be pointed out that the chronology of biblical events before the foundation of the Kingdom of Israel are not solid. Moreover, Although the identification of the Hurrians with the Horims is accepted by many modern historians, this identification is not definite. There are other sources that place the Hurrians in the Near East in the 3rd millennium BC which can be considered corroborating evidence for the biblical accounts. There are no mentions of the Hurrians in any written documents before the Akkadian Empire, but during and after that dynasty they were written about extensively by various Mesopotamian peoples, as well as the Hittites and the Egyptians. Generally, the Mesopotamians would refer to the Hurrians as Hanigalbat, but they would later also recognize the state of Mitanni in their texts as Hanigalbat. To make things even more confusing, some Mesopotamians would refer to the Hurrians as Suberians, a generic term for all northern peoples. Occasionally, that label was used in the same texts where they were called Hanigalbats. Similarly, the Egyptians would often refer to the land of the Hurrians as Narina, while sometimes referencing the state of Mitanni by name. All of these ancient references indicate that the Hurrians existed long before the state of Mitanni, but determining how long they were in the Near East, or even the extent of their geographic distribution, is a problem historians and archaeologists face. A major part of this problem is due to the fact that the Hurrians left behind few monuments or even buildings. Despite the dearth of Hurrian monuments, scholars have identified a few pre mitanni Hurrian, or at least Hurrian-influenced, archaeological sites. One of the most important of these sites was Urkesh in northeast Syria. The Hurrians settled and built Urkesh in the 3rd millennium BC, during the period of the Akkadian Empire, and excavations at the site have uncovered a wealth of Akkadian-era artefacts that have helped date the city such as a seal of Taram Agede, one of the daughters of King Naram-Sin of Akkad in the 22nd century BC. Located at an important junction of routes between the Levant, Anatolia and Mesopotamia, Urkesh was a trade centre that was home to at least 20,000 people during its height. Northern Syria was also home to two other notable pre mitanni Hurrian kingdoms in the early 2nd millennium BC, Urshu and Hashshu. The archaeological evidence shows that all of these Hurrian cities and small kingdoms may have been connected through trade and possibly diplomacy, but they were never a unified state. It was not until the emergence of the Mitanni state just before 1500 BC when most of the Hurrians were united under one kingdom. The reason for that unification, though, has been a source of academic debate. Studies of the Mitanni kingdom are full of many unanswered questions that are likely to remain unanswered for the most part, and one intriguing question pertains to the Mitanni kings and their ethnic origins. Although it is known that the vast majority of the Mitanni population was ethnically Hurrians, it appears that the kings may have been Indo-European, more specifically Indo-Iranian or Indo-Aryan. There is ample evidence for this suggestion, beginning with the names of the kings. All of the Mitanni kings are known today by their personal Hurrian names, 
but they also all took Indo-Aryan throne names. For example, these are the Indo-Aryan throne names of the following kings. Tushrata was Tvesa Ratha, or having an attacking chariot. Atatama I was Rutadaman, or having the abode of Urta. Atashumara was Ratasmara, or remembering Urta. And Shaushatar I was Sattva, or warrior. It is also believed that the name of the Mitanni capital, Wasukani, was derived from the Indo-Aryan phrase Vasukani, meaning wealth mine. Even more intriguing is a list of the Mitanni gods in a Hittite Mitanni treaty. The Mitanni king Shatiwaza signed a peace treaty with the Hittite king Supiluluma, the first in the late 14th century BC that essentially made Mitanni a vassal state of Hatti. Although the political details of the treaty are important and will be discussed later, the Hittite text references several Mitanni and Aryan gods. Shatiwaza was required to give an oath of fealty to Supiluliuma, the first on the names of several gods, which are listed as follows. The twin gods, Mitra and Uruwana, Indar, the Nasatiana gods, Elat, Samaminuhi, Tesub lord of Wasukani, Tesub lord of the Kamari. Elat, Samaminuhi and Tesub are all Hurrian gods, but the others are clearly Indic Aryan gods. The Sanskrit equivalent of the first four gods are Mitra, Varuna, Indra, and Nasatya. Thus, it's clear that the Mitanni kings, if not the Hurrian people, worshipped some of the most important gods of ancient India. The mentions of these gods certainly point to the Indo-European background of the Mitanni kings, but there are also other elements of Mitanni culture that indicate an Indo-European influence. Warfare played a central role to the success of any late Bronze Age Near Eastern Empire, with the chariot corps being an integral part of any effective army. The major kingdoms experimented with their chariot corps, adding or subtracting the number of men from chariot teams, as well as the number of horses used to pull a chariot. A Mitanni warrior named Kikuli even wrote a manual on horsemanship and chariotry that sheds more light on the Mitanni ruler's possible Indo-European background. Although the name Kikuli is Hurrian, the terms he used throughout the text were clearly Indo-European. Likewise, the Mitanni word for chariot, Mariana, is believed to have been derived from the Sanskrit word for young man, demonstrating yet another link between the Mitanni elite and the Indo-Europeans. Given that there are so many links between the Mitanni rulers and the Aryans of India, it begs the obvious question of how this connection came to be. There are essentially four theories to explain the link between the Mitanni kings and the Aryans of India, and proponents of all four theories generally believe that the Mitanni dynasty was part of a warrior band of Indo-Europeans who conquered the land of eastern Syria and northern Mesopotamia and the Hurrian population along with it. The Mitanni Indo-Europeans probably entered the region as a horde and then were hired as mercenaries before deciding to freelance and start their own kingdom. One theory among scholars is that the Mitanni were members of a band that broke off from the main body of Indo-Iranians that went to the Near East before then going back east to northern India. However, this theory has fallen out of favour with most. Today, the most commonly held theory for the Mitanni's Indo-European origins is also the most logical. According to this theory, a band broke off from the main body of Indo-Iranians in Iran and proceeded to the Near East and became the Mitanni, while another band went east to northern India. The third theory argues that the Indo-Aryans migrated from Iran to northern India as a group, but at some point after they settled in northern India, another band of Aryans migrated back to Iran and eventually the Near East, where they became the Mitanni. A final theory to explain the Mitanni origins is part of the indigenous Aryan, or out-of-India theory. The indigenous Aryan theory holds that the Aryans did not migrate into northern India, but that they had lived there for millennia as virtual natives. Believers in the indigenous Aryan theory argue that the Aryan migrations still took place, but that these migrations came from the other direction, meaning the Aryans migrated west instead of east, and according to this theory, the Mitanni were one of the final results of the Aryans' westward migration. Although the debate over the Mitanni king's origins will probably never be solved, it is almost universally believed 
that the Mitanni rulers were once part of an Indo-European warrior elite who imposed themselves on the Hurrians of the Late Bronze Age. The boundaries of ancient kingdoms and empires were less distinct than those of the modern world, and part of the reason for this is because the extents of ancient empires were often recorded in texts, according to the people who inhabited them more than specific geographic boundaries. In other words, ancient rulers took into consideration the people they ruled over, not necessarily the land they controlled. Boundaries also tended to shift more in ancient times, with buffer zones and borders between states being less distinct than in later eras. Some of the kingdoms of the Late Bronze Age did have distinct boundaries. Egypt's boundaries were fairly well defined, as were Babylon's and Assyria's, but Mitanni's borders were perhaps the least defined of all the Near Eastern empires. Mitanni's northern border was more or less a latitudinal line that began at Lake Van and extended west into Anatolia. The northwest boundary of Mitanni was in the Taurus Mountains of Anatolia. This region was known as Kizuatana and may have been the original Hurrian power center. Kizuatana maintained nominal independence for quite some time, and by the Late Bronze Age it became a contested land between the Hittites and Mitanni. When Mitanni was stronger, Kizuatana was in the Mitanni sphere of influence, but when it was weaker, the Hittites would exert control over it. The southern edge of Mitanni was even less distinct, with it being somewhere in northern Mesopotamia, around the Assyrian city of Asher. The eastern and western edges of Mitanni are better known, though, because most of the important Hurrian cities were located in those areas. The eastern part of Mitanni included Assyria north of Ashur, including the important city of Nuzi, but the western part of Mitanni was the most important and populous part of the empire. At its height, the western boundary of Mitanni stretched to the Mediterranean Sea and included such important cities and minor kingdoms as Alala, Aleppo, Imar, Taid, and Alshi. Mitanni also laid claim to Ugarit and Kadesh at various times, which brought them into conflict with the Egyptians and Hittites. Although amorphous boundaries were nothing extraordinary for the Bronze Age Near East, Mitanni's boundaries were even less concrete, and this has led some historians to postulate that Mitanni was not an empire in the strictest definition, but more like a confederation of Hurrian states and kingdoms. The lack of a clear border combined with the seemingly autonomous nature of many of the Mitanni cities does seem to corroborate this Mitanni federation theory. Nusi is one of the most important Mitanni cities that has been excavated and studied in the modern era. Located in what is today northern Iraq, Nusi was actually the largest city in the Hurrian principality of Arafa. Excavations of Nutsi have uncovered a large palace complex that encompassed about half the area of the walled city. A cache of cuneiform tablets was discovered, and later translated, which have given helpful insight into Hurrian culture and some aspects of the Mitanni Empire or Federation. Although nearly all of the names in the texts are Hurrian, proving that Nusi was in fact a Hurrian city, nearly all of the texts were written in Akkadian. This is not surprising when one considers that Akkadian was the lingua franca of the late Bronze Age Near East and regularly used in domestic, administrative documents, as well as for diplomatic letters. At its height of influence, the Palace of Nutsi was the home of a prince who served King Shashatar of Mitanni in the late 15th century BC. Like Nusi, the western city of Alala was also ruled by a local Hurrian dynasty, but subject to Mitanni control. Alala and some of the other notable western Mitanni cities bore the brunt of Egyptian and Hittite attacks. Despite the constant threat of being a battleground between the major Near Eastern empires, though, Alala and the other western Mitanni cities were generally the wealthiest and most productive, thanks to being located close to regular trade routes, Levant timber, and the Mediterranean Sea. Excavations at Alala and Nusi have helped researchers better understand Hurrian culture and the nature of the Mitanni Empire. But unfortunately, the two most important Mitanni cities remain elusive. Wasukani and Taid were the twin capitals of Mitanni, so one would expect that they would be quite large archaeological sites with plenty of structural ruins and other monuments. Unfortunately, though, Archaeologists have yet to positively identify the location of either city.
Among the ruins of several Mitanni cities, there are candidates for each, but at this time there have been no texts or archaeological remains that can provide a sure identification. Many believe that the Hurrian city at Tel Brak in northern Iraq was Tade, due to its size and location in the relative centre of the kingdom. Some scholars also believe that Wasukani was probably located somewhere in the centre of Mitanni as well, possibly at the headwaters of the Haba River in northern Iraq. Until those sites can be positively identified, however, the only knowledge modern historians have of those cities come from references in a number of late Bronze Age texts. By the time the Mitanni state formed in the late 16th century BC, the general extent of the kingdom had been established and a royal dynasty came to power. Historians have been able to reconstruct the order in which the Mitanni kings ruled, but unfortunately the dates and lengths of their reigns remain elusive. Unlike all of their contemporaries in the Near East, the Mitanni apparently never wrote king lists of their dynasties, or at least no Mitanni king list has been discovered thus far. If Wasukani is ever discovered, a detailed Mitanni king list may be one of the historical treasures found along with it, but for now, researchers are left to reconstruct Mitanni royal chronology based on Egyptian and Hittite texts, as well as the large cache of Amarna letters that were discovered in 1887. With that said, a combination of archaeological discoveries in the Hurrian homeland and the synthesis of the available primary sources have made it possible to determine the history of the Mitanni Empire. Paratana, who ruled in the early 15th century BC, is the first Mitanni king mentioned in extant texts, but there may have been others before him. It appears that Paratana inherited somewhat of an existing power structure from a royal predecessor, or conquered a Hurrian federation that was already in place. Whichever the case, the textual and archaeological evidence indicates that Paratana was a true warrior king who extended Mitanni's influence in every direction. In the west, he gained control of the important city of Aleppo and the smaller kingdom of Alala or Alalak. According to an Akkadian inscription on the statue of the prince of Alala, Idrimi, Paratana and a Hurrian warrior coalition attacked the kingdom for seven years. The text reads, However, for seven years Paratana, the mighty king, the king of the Hurrian warriors, treated me as an enemy. In the seventh year, I sent Anuanda, as messenger, to King Paratana, the king of the Hurrian warriors, and told him about the services of my forefathers, when my forefathers had been in their, the king's service, and when, what we had said was pleasing to the kings of the Hurrian warriors, and that they had made an alliance based on a solemn oath among themselves. The mighty king heard of our former services and of the oath they had sworn to each other. They had read the wording of the oath to him, word by word, as well as the list of our services. He accepted my messenger. I increased the gifts indicating my loyalty, which were heavy, and returned to him, his lost household. I swore him a mighty oath as to my status as a loyal vassal, and so I became king in charge of Alalak. The manner in which Alala was incorporated into the kingdom of Mitanni apparently became a pattern for later conquests. The Mitanni king would lead a Hurrian warrior coalition against a principality until it finally surrendered. But instead of executing the incumbent ruler, the Mitanni king would come to an agreement with the prince whereby he was allowed to keep his position. This situation was repeatedly played out in all the corners of Mitanni's geographical reach. Paratana was also able to take the important city of Nutsi in the east and Turka in the south, and by the end of his rule, the Mitanni kingdom stretched from the Mediterranean Sea to the Zagros Mountains and from Lake Van to northern Mesopotamia. Only mountains limited the Mitanni in the north and east, but to the south and west there were formidable foes who could check Mitanni expansion. The Kassite dynasty of Babylon was in firm control of most of Mesopotamia, but while their strength prevented Mitanni from moving further south, they had their own problems with the Elamites that in turn prevented them from moving north into Mitanni territory. As a result, the initial competition that the Mitanni kingdom came from the Egyptians in the west. As Paratana was expanding the boundaries of Mitanni, the kings of Egypt's 18th dynasty were likewise moving north of their borders into the Levant. 
Thutmose III is sometimes referred to as Ancient Egypt's Caesar or Napoleon due to all the lands he conquered. Thutmose III extended the Egyptian kingdom far into Nubian territory in the south, but most importantly, he extended Egyptian influence in the Levant to the cities of Byblos, Kadesh, and even Ugarit, which put the Egyptians and Mitanni on a collision course. It is believed the warrior pharaoh personally led a major military campaign into the Levant in 1482 BC that was accented by a seven-month siege of the city of Megiddo. After the Egyptians reduced Megiddo and its Canaanite inhabitants to vassal status, they turned their attention to Mitanni-controlled and influenced cities and kingdoms to the north and west. Approximately ten years later, Thutmose III returned to the northern Levant at the head of another large Egyptian expeditionary force, this time to face the Mitanni directly. The Egyptian force travelled by ship from Egypt to the coastal city of Byblos, where they then disembarked and marched overland into Mitanni territory, which they knew as Naharin. The Egyptians were victorious in three battles against the Mitanni in the region around Aleppo, and the historical annals from the Karnak Temple in Thebes detail how Thutmose III claimed the territory for Egypt and took several Hurrian nobles as booty. He set up a tablet east of this water, he set up another beside the tablet of his father, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Okaperkire. Behold, his majesty went north, capturing the towns and laying waste the settlements of that foe of wretched Naharin. He pursued after them an eater of sailing. Not one looked behind him, but they fled, forsooth, like a herd of mountain goats. Yea, the horses fled. List of the booty taken among the whole army, consisting of princes, three, their wives thirty, men taken eighty, six hundred six slaves, male and female, with their children, those who surrendered, and their wives. He harvested their grain. His majesty arrived at the city of Ni, going southward, when his majesty returned, having set up his tablet in Naharin, extending the boundaries of Egypt. It should be noted that Egyptian kings employed a fair amount of hyperbole in their historical annals, so a fair amount of circumspection is required when using these texts to construct a chronology. Unfortunately, there are no known Mitanni texts that can corroborate or deny Thutmose III's somewhat bombastic statements, but there is a text in the tomb of an Egyptian noble named Menkeh Perezeneb that does seem to confirm the Egyptian victory. The text reads, From the tomb of Menkeh Perezeneb, four Asiatic chiefs are shown bringing tribute giving praise to the Lord of the two lands, obeisance to the good God, by the chiefs of every land. They acclaim the victories of His Majesty, their tribute is upon their backs, being every product of God's land, silver, gold, lapis lazuli, malachite, every splendid costly stone. The sea, thy fear is in all the lands. Thou hast overthrown the lands of Mitanni, thou hast hacked up their cities, their chiefs are in caves. Despite the Egyptians' victories in their first encounters with the Mitanni, the latter would later use their home field advantage to take back much of the territory they lost. Given that the material culture remains of the Mitanni Empire are quite limited, historians have had problems creating a truly comprehensive image of Mitanni culture. The Hurrians no doubt played a major role in the religious aspects of the kingdom, but so too did the Indo European elites discussed earlier as did the Assyrians, Kassites, and other Semitic peoples of Mesopotamia. Just as the Mitanni kingdom was politically a federation of smaller kingdoms and city-states, its culture was also derived from a number of different sources. The Mitanni also exhibited some truly unique characteristics, some of which were adopted by later groups, while other traits were forgotten until modern times. Among all the traits that defined pre-modern cultures, none were more important than religion. Although ancient civilizations did not follow universal religions and therefore never promoted their theologies at sword point, their gods and goddesses were often what defined them as a people. The Mitanni kingdom presents an interesting case study in this regard because it appears that the elites worshipped Indo-European gods along with the native Hurrian pantheon. The Shatiwaza Treaty is the only text that mentions the Mitanni king's belief in an Indo-European pantheon, 
so scholars are left wondering about important aspects of any associated rituals. For example, it's unknown whether the Mitanni kings revered fire like the ancient Persians and Aryans. Other points of interest, such as if the Mitanni kings practiced ritual bathing, also remain shrouded in mystery, and these questions are likely to linger until one of the Mitanni capitals, and presumably its collection of Hurrian texts, is unearthed. Questions about how much, or how little, the Mitanni kings followed a religion similar to the ancient Persians and Aryans will continue to be debated by experts, but the overwhelming influence on the Mitanni religion came from the Hurrians. The Hurrian majority within the Mitanni kingdom worshipped the same gods as their ancestors did long before the Mitanni became a force in the region, and by the time Paratana came to the throne, the elites of Mitanni society also followed the Hurrian religion to a certain extent. The most important god in the Hurrian pantheon was the storm god Teshub, who was joined by his consort, Hepat. Another important Hurrian god was the sun god Shimigi, who brought life to the fertile croplands of the northern Levant. Little is known about the cults and rituals of the Hurrians due to the relatively few Hurrian texts that describe those activities, but some information can be gleaned from the later Hittites. The Hittites adopted many of the Hurrian deities, so it can be safely assumed that they also practiced many Hurrian-inspired religious rituals. The ritual sacrifice of dogs and pigs in a deep pit was one of the more unique aspects of Hittite religion, but excavations at the Hurrian site of Urkesh have revealed that the practice may have begun with the Hurrians. A large circular pit in Urkesh may have served as a place of sacrifice, giving inspiration to the widespread practice in later centuries by the Hittites. The Hurrians had the most profound influence on Mitanni religion, followed by the Indo-Europeans, but evidence suggests that they were also influenced by their other neighbours as well. Despite coming from some disparate backgrounds, the peoples of Mesopotamia worshipped many of the same gods and practised many of the same rituals. Many of the earlier Mesopotamian myths and rituals originated with the Sumerians and were then adopted by successive dynasties. The Assyrians were the Mitanni's closest Semitic neighbours, and it appears that they adopted one of their most important deities. Although feminine, Ishtar was a fiery goddess associated with warfare, an ideal fit for the bellicose Assyrians. The Hurrians also revered Ishtar, whom they knew as Shaushgar, going so far as to take her sacred cult statue from the city of Nineveh. The Mitanni kings considered the Ishtar statue to be one of their most prized possessions, so much so that when they concluded a peace treaty with the Egyptians, it was included as a present. Another important and unique aspect of Mitanni culture was the appropriation and use of land. In most of the major kingdoms of the late Bronze Age in the Near East, either specific temples or the king technically owned all of the land. Depending on the kingdoms, land could be rented out or even sold, provided that its use was acceptable by the king or temple. The situation in the Mitanni lands was similar, with the king technically owning all of the land, but the king allotted much of the land to the nobles through grants. The land grants could be inherited or could also be sold through a fictive adoption. Nobles who wanted to sell part of their grants would adopt themselves to others, who could then inherit part of the land grant by paying their new son, who was often much older than the recipient of the land. The Mitanni kings never seemed to mind the way the nobles gamed the system, and it probably helped to stimulate the Mitanni economy. The economy is one of the aspects of Mitanni culture that academics understand in quite some depth. In addition to the fertile lands of the northern Levant, as mentioned earlier, the Mitanni had the benefit of being located in an optimal geographic position. The Mitanni capital of Wasukani was more than likely in a central position, with Mesopotamia to its south, the Levant to the west, and Anatolia just to its north. The trade routes to those regions had almost certainly been established by Hurrians long before Mitanni became a state, and after the Mitanni kings came to power, they were wise enough to allow the trade to continue relatively unhindered. Indeed, the decentralised nature of the Mitanni government system was no doubt quite conducive to the lucrative free trade in the region. 
The local palaces became the nerve centers of the Mitanni economic system, and censuses were conducted through them in order to calculate taxes and the amount of conscripted corvée labor needed for public projects. Presumably, after the records were made and the taxes were collected, a fair amount would then be sent to Wasakani and Taid. The fact that considerable amounts of material wealth passed through the capital cities is known thanks to a number of texts from the era. Some of the Armana tablets indicate how much wealth Mitanni had, and how it flowed from that kingdom to the other kingdoms in the Near East. One letter details all the lavish gifts to Shrata of Mitanni sent to Akhenaten of Egypt in the mid-14th century BC, including some of the following. Four beautiful horses that run, swiftly. One chariot, its tulemus, its thongs, its covering, all of gold. It is 320 shekels of gold that have been used on it. One dagger, the blade of which is of iron its guard, of gold, with designs. It's haft of ebony with calf figurines, overlaid with gold. One bow of the Apisamus type overlaid with gold. It is four shekels of gold that have been used on it. One Maninu necklace, cut from thirty-five genuine lapis lazuli stones. One set for the hand, beads of genuine lapis lazuli, six per string, mounted on gold. Six shekels of gold have been used on it. One garment of blue-purple wool. One pair of shirts. Hurrian style for the city. One wash basin of silver, 140 shekels in weight. It is all of these wedding gifts of every sort that Tuzrata, the king of Mitanni, gave to Nimureya, the king of Egypt, his brother and his son in law. He gave them at the same time that he gave Tadu Heba, his daughter, to Egypt and to Nimureya to be his wife. The luxuries were wedding gifts in a sense but they were clearly meant to be an ostentatious display by Tushrata at the same time. These items were also evidence that a lot of trade was conducted between the two powers. Coin currency did not yet exist in the Bronze Age, so trade took place in kind and through bartering, though gold and silver were extremely valuable and served as a pseudo-currency. During the New Kingdom of Egypt, the Egyptians had plenty of access to gold, silver and electrum, thanks to their colonies in Nubia, which they used to import other exotic goods not found in Egypt, including lapis lazuli, horses and cedar. Mitanni was able to supply Egypt with lapis lazuli, which can only be found in modern Afghanistan. In one interesting Amarna tablet from Tushrata to Akhenaten, the former complained that he never received two gold statues from the Egyptians, and that gold is like dirt in Egypt. The tablet reads, I also asked your father, Nimurea, for statues of solid cast gold, one of myself and a second statue, a statue of Tadu Heba, my daughter, and your father said, Don't talk of giving statues just of solid cast gold. I will give you ones made also of lapis lazuli. I will give you two, along with the statues, much additional gold and other goods beyond measure. But my brother has not sent the solid gold statues that your father was going to send. You have sent planted ones of wood. Nor have you sent me the goods that your father was going to send me, but you have reduced them greatly. May my brother now give me the statues of solid gold that I asked your father for, and may he not hold them back. And with gold being the dirt in my brother's country, why have the statues been a source of such distress to my brother that he has not given them to me? The transportation of the gifts between the kings was overseen by officials from both kingdoms, but apparently merchants from the Levant buffer states also facilitated trade between the two kingdoms. An Amarna tablet, presumably from Tushrata to all of the Canaanites in his sphere of influence, states that they are to allow a particular merchant messenger named Achaea to pass freely to Egypt, to the kings of Canaan, servants of my brother, thus the king. I herewith send Achaea, my messenger, to speed post haste to the king of Egypt, my brother. No one is to hold him up. Provide him with safe entry into Egypt and hand him over to the fortress commander of Egypt. Let him go on immediately as far as his presents are concerned. He is to owe nothing. Unfortunately, neither of those gold statues have yet to be found, nor have any examples of Mitanni colossal sculptures been discovered for that matter, but there is one style of Hurrian art that became noteworthy. The only true art style that can be identified as Mitanni or Mitanni era 
is the Nusi Ware pottery. As the name indicates, Nusi Ware is a style of pottery that originated in the Hurrian city of Nutsi and was distributed widely across Mitanni, from the Levant to the Zagros Mountains. Nutsi Ware pottery beakers were distinct for the geometrical style patterns that decorated the vessels in three registers. The middle register was usually the largest and most decorative. Nusi Ware beakers have been discovered among the ruins of known Hurrian cities, such as Katna, where they were discovered in the royal tomb. Archaeological excavations have determined that Nutsi Ware and the Mitanni kingdom existed contemporaneously, as there are no samples of Nutsi Ware before the Mitanni, and few samples have been discovered that are dated after the kingdom's collapse. As this suggests, even though Nutsi was not one of Mitanni's capitals, it has become a source of useful information about Hurrian culture and the Mitanni Empire. By translating Hurrian texts from Nutsi, it is possible to uncover a lot of information about the nature of the Mitanni system. The archaeological and textual evidence indicates that Nuzi was a wealthy and powerful city during the height of the Mitanni kingdom. A number of Hurrian and Akkadian texts describe the importance of scribes in maintaining the city's armory. The royal palace of Nusi, as was the case with palaces in many Bronze Age cultures, acted as the centre for cultural and economic life in the city, as well as the residence of the royal prince or governor. The Nusi texts also make clear that the palace served as a source of supply for materials used to make weapons and armour, as well as an armoury for complete weapons and armour. Interestingly, the texts differentiate between Nusi natives and outsiders, although it is stated that the palace supplied Mitanni warriors from outside Nuzi, and in fact supplied multiple Mitanni cities with weapons. Nuzi clearly played a key role in the Mitanni Empire as an important industrial centre. The weapons and armour produced in Nuzi were used by the Mitanni kings to lead their armies in the late 15th century BC against Egypt and the city-states of the Levant. The Height of Mitanni Power Mitanni power in the region continued to grow during the reign of King Shaushatar, despite the fact his reign was marked by continued conflicts with the other great powers of the Near East. Shaushatar ruled Mitanni when Thutmose III was still leading his armies on campaigns, and his successor Amenhotep II was attempting to do the same. The Northern Levant became a buffer zone between the two states, as they traded cities and eventually came to a mutual understanding of the borders. Border disputes with the Hittites also became more common during Shaushatar's rule, or it may just be that due to there being more extant texts from his reign, it merely appears that way. The textual and archaeological evidence confirms that Shaushatar actively attempted to expand Mitanni's borders and found some success in the east. The king was able to consolidate Mitanni power over most of Assyria, conquering the city of Ashur during his reign. The conquest of Ashur essentially secured Mitanni's eastern border, because to the east of Assyria were the Zagros Mountains. Mitanni's southern border remained porous and somewhat amorphous, and Shashatar, nor his successors for that matter, did little to change the situation. Since Mitanni's southern boundary was basically all of northern Mesopotamia, there was little they could do to build any type of buffer state, and conquering Babylon was out of the question. With that said, Babylon never gave the Mitanni Empire very many problems. Most of Mitanni's problems came from the north. Beginning with the rule of Tudalia I, the Hittites began expanding from their heartland in central Anatolia south into Mitanni territory. The buffer kingdom of Kizuwanda became a battlefield between the Hittites and Mitanni, with the Hittites taking control of the region at some point after 1450 BC. The Hittites followed up the victory in Kizuwanda by taking the strategically important and materially wealthy city of Ugarit. Despite the loss of two important buffer kingdoms to the Hittites, the Mitanni Empire was still the most influential kingdom in the region. Its expansion into Assyria more than made up for its losses to the Hittites, and Shaushatar was determined to not lose any more territory to the other great powers. However, that obstinacy put him and the Mitanni on a direct collision course with Egypt. Two years after Thutmose III recorded a major victory over Mitanni, the two sides met again in Syria, but this did little to settle the situation in the northern Levant, 
and left the Egyptians with a very precarious hold over their possessions in the northern Levant. Logistically speaking, the Egyptians had a difficult time controlling cities such as Kadesh and Tunip in the northern Levant. The Egyptians were able to keep Byblos under their hegemony relatively easily because it was much easier to bring military forces to that city. Byblos was located on the coast so the Egyptians could send ships if need be. The other cities, though, were located inland, where any Egyptian force would have to march overland through hills, mountains and deserts. It was much easier for Mitanni forces to reach Kadesh and Tunip from their heartland, which the princes of the Levantine kingdoms and city-states understood quite well. The princes thus used the situation to leverage a better deal with Mitanni. So when Shaushatar sent Mitanni forces to the northern Levant and Syria to foment rebellion against the Egyptians, it was successful. Although Mitanni was able to successfully win back some of its lands from the Egyptians, fighting them and the Hittites was extremely costly. Shaushtatar fought one more battle with Amenhotep II before the two kingdoms decided to deal with each other diplomatically. According to a stela from Karnak, Egypt, Amenhotep II defeated Shaushtatar on the battlefield. How when the prince of Naharin, the prince of Hatti, and the prince of Shanha heard of the great victory which I had made, each one vied with his fellow in making offerings, while they said in their hearts to the father of their fathers, in order to beg peace from his majesty, seeking that there be given to them the breath of life. We are under thy sway, for thy palace, O son of Re, Amenhotep, the god ruler of Heliopolis, ruler of rulers, raging lion in this land forever. Like other Egyptian commemorative texts and still I, this one was full of hyperbole and it is unclear which side truly won the battle. It's likely the final battle between Shaushtatar and Amenhotep II was inconclusive, or even a Mitanni victory, because from that point forward, the Egyptians began treating Mitanni as an ally. From Shaushtatar's perspective, he had to make a decision on which enemy he would turn into a friend, Hatti or Egypt. With the Hittites being the more immediate threat, Making an alliance with the Egyptians was practical and logical. The Karnak text is also important because it is Egypt's first recorded entry into the Great Powers Club of the Near East. The three major kingdoms recognised Egypt, which in turn began a long relationship or alliance between Egypt and Mitanni. Artatama I came to the throne during a period that was filled with instability and political uncertainty. Paratana, the 2nd of May, have come to power after Shaushatar very briefly, but little is known about this potential king. And once Artatama I did ascend to the Mitanni throne, he continued his predecessor's policy by maintaining the alliance with Egypt. The Egyptian pharaoh at the time was Thutmose IV, who ruled from about 1401 to 1397 BC, and was known more for his diplomacy than his martial abilities. The diplomatic ties between the two kingdoms were sealed with a marriage. In one Amarna letter, Mitanni king Tushrata recalls how his grandfather Artatama sent a Mitanni princess to Egypt to wed Thutmose IV. When the father of Nimurea wrote to Artatama, my grandfather, he asked for the daughter of my grandfather, the sister of my father. He wrote five, six times, but he did not give her. When he wrote my grandfather seven times, then only under such pressure did he give her. Not only did Artatama ensure permanent peace between Mitanni and Egypt when he gave his daughter to Thutmose IV, he also established a regular practice whereby the Mitanni kings sent some of their princesses to Egypt. The Amarna letters that detail these marriages highlight some interesting aspects of Near Eastern geopolitics and some peculiarities of Mitanni and Egyptian culture. The Mitanni kings had no problem sending their women to Egypt, presumably never to be seen again. The Mitanni women were well cared for in Egypt as part of the royal harem, and they enjoyed all the privileges and amenities afforded to Egyptian nobility. In return, as has already been noted, the Mitanni kings were given generous amounts of gold and silver. Both sides were apparently happy with the arrangement, and although the Mitanni king sometimes asked for more gold in the letters, the Egyptian kings were always pleased with their new Mitanni princesses. Interestingly, the Egyptian kings never offered any of their princesses to the Mitanni kings. 
In fact, there is not a single case where an Egyptian king offered an Egyptian princess to any of the other great powers. Still, the arrangement was quite lucrative for the Mitanni kings, so it continued through the reigns of Shutana II, Artashumara, and Tushrata. Shutarana II's rule coincided with the reign of one of Egypt's longest living pharaohs, Amenhotep III, who ruled from about 1388 to 1349 BC. During Amenhotep III's rule, Egypt experienced an era of unprecedented material prosperity, and the Egyptian people were able to enjoy the spoils of the empire thanks to the past conquests of Thutmose III. Amenhotep III was engaged in relatively few military campaigns, as Egypt's northern boundary was secure through its enduring peace with Mitanni. The era of prosperity that Egypt enjoyed was also enjoyed in Mitanni, with gold and silver flowing from Egypt through its cities and Mitanni princesses in turn being sent to Egypt. An Egyptian hieroglyphic inscription on a scarab briefly describes how Shutarana II sent his daughter Kirgipa to join Amenhotep III's harem. Year 10, under the majesty of the son of Re, Amenhotep, ruler of Thebes, who is granted life, and the great king's wife, Tai, who liveth, the name of whose father was Yuya, the name of whose mother was Thuya. Marvels brought to his majesty life, prosperity, and health. Kagipa, the daughter of the chief of Naharin, Satyana, and the chief of her harem ladies, 317 persons. By the mid-14th century BC, Mitanni was in the midst of its period of greatest wealth and influence in the region, and about to have its most famous king, Tushrata, come to the throne. But before he did, the Mitanni state almost collapsed internally. After Shutarana II's quiet but effective reign, the Mitanni royal house was temporarily thrust into turmoil when a civil war among the Mitanni elites broke out after two branches of the royal family vied for power. Shutarana II's successor was Artashumara, the brother of Tushrata, but little is known about Artashumara's rule because he was assassinated in relatively short order by supporters of Tushrata. The level of Tushrata's complicity in the murder of Artashumara will probably never be known, but it appears that he at least turned a blind eye to the conspiracy. The assassination brought back a considerable amount of stability to the Mitanni Empire, allowing Tushrata to consolidate his domestic political alliances and to legitimize his rule to his people and the outside world. The primary source evidence shows, though, that Amenhotep III was not happy with the Machiavellian machinations in Mitanni, so to put the Egyptian king's mind at ease, Tushrata had Artashumara's killer executed, or at least a man who he claimed was the assassin. With the ugliness of Artashumara's assassination behind him, Tushrata was able to focus on continuing his relations with Amenhotep III and his successor, Akhenaten. The power dynamics of the Great Powers Club consisted of preserving the status quo, so minor powers were only rarely elevated to the status of a great power, and for the most part the great powers would cooperate to keep it from happening. The Canaanite city of Amuru was growing in power during Tushrata's reign, threatening some of the city-states and kingdoms that were under either Egyptian or Mitanni hegemony. Amuru was located in an area that stretched from the Orontes Valley in Syria to the Mediterranean coast. It was technically under Egyptian rule, but there was no local prince or governor who administered Amuru. In fact, Amuru was somewhat of a lawless region that acted as a buffer between Egypt and Mitanni. When a local potentate named Abdi Ashirta began claiming to be the prince of Amuru and threatening the Egyptian possession of Byblos, it threatened the stability of the region. According to a letter, the situation became so unstable that Tushrata visited the region personally and then requested Egyptian aid in the form of Nubian mercenaries, Meluha, to support Rib Hadda of Byblos. The text reads, The king of Mitanni visited the land of Amuru itself, and he said, How great is this land! Your land is extensive! May the king of Egypt send me his commissioner, that he may take it for him. Moreover, come yourself with all speed and take everything. Then return to get the archers later on. Moreover, get two hundred men of Meluha. Abdiasirta is very ill. Who knows when he dies? 
Abdi Ashirta was killed under suspicious circumstances after this event, so it is likely that either the Egyptians, Mitanni, or both somehow orchestrated his assassination, hoping that his son and successor, Aziru, would be more pliable. Aziru, though, proved to be just as rebellious as his father, leading a major attack on Byblos that resulted in Ribhada's death. Despite the somewhat unstable situation in the northern Levant in the mid-14th century BC, Tushrata was able to ingratiate himself even further with Amenhotep III and then Akhenaten. Thirteen of the Amarna letters are correspondences between Tushrata and Amenhotep III, Akhenaten, and Amenhotep's chief queen and Akhenaten's mother, Tiye. One letter details how Tushrata sent a cult statue of the goddess Shaushgar of Nineveh to Amenhotep III as a gift, just as Shutarana II had done during his reign. Thus, Tushrata, the king of Mitanni, who loves you, your father in law. For me, all goes well. For you, may all go well. For our wives, for your sons, for your magnates, for your chariots, for your horses, for your troops, for your country, and for whatever else belongs to you, may all go very, very well. Thus Soska of Nineveh, mistress of all lands. I wish to go to Egypt, a country that I love, and then return. Now I herewith send her, and she is on her way. Now in the time too of my father went to this country, and just as earlier she dwelt there and they honoured her, may my brother now honour her ten times more than before. May my brother honour her, then at his pleasure, let her go so that she may come back. Tushrata's decision to send the statue may seem like a minor event, but given the importance of cult statues in the ancient Near East, it was actually momentous. Cult statues in general were very important because they were believed to embody the earthly avatar of the particular deity. As such, they rarely left their temple, and having one taken in a war was considered a most ominous sign. On the other hand, to give one to another people as Tushrata did, was a way of spreading the deity's influence. Shaushgar was the Hurrian version of Ishtar of Nineveh, which is where her cult statue was housed before being sent to Egypt. The gift of the Shaushgar statue opened the way for a new alliance to be concluded between Egypt and Mitanni. Indeed, Tushrata and Amenhotep III seemed to enjoy writing each other, as many of the Mitanni Egyptian Amarna letters were between those two leaders. The two kings enjoyed trading gifts, and reading the texts of the tablets might lead readers to think that part of the arrangement involved the leaders trying to one-up each other in terms of wealth and ostentatiousness. Of course, Tushrata had no problem sending more Mitanni princesses to live in Egypt, as another tablet indicated, Say to Nibmurea, the king of Egypt, my brother. Thus Tushrata, the king of Mitanni, your brother. For me all goes well, for you may all go well, for Kalu Heber may all go well. For your household, for your wives, for your sons, for your magnates, for your warriors, for your horses, for your chariots, and in your country, may all go very well. Since you were friendly with my father, I have accordingly written and told you so my brother might hear of these things and rejoice. My father loved you, and you in turn loved my father. In keeping with this love, my father gave you my sister. And who else stood with my father as you did? I herewith send you one chariot, two horses, one male attendant, one female attendant, from the booty from the land of Hatti. As the greeting gift of my brother, I send you five chariots, five teams of horses, and as the greeting gift of Kelu Heba, my sister, I send her one set of gold toggle pins, one set of gold earrings, one gold mashu ring, and a scent container that is full of sweet oil. There is no evidence that the kings ever personally met and it is likely all the transactions were carried out by various emissaries and high-ranking nobles. Beside the laundry list of luxurious items that are listed in the letters between the Mitanni and Egyptian kings, the letters reveal a bit about the Mitanni idea of history. Although there are no extant copies of true historiographical texts from Mitanni, as there are from Egypt and Mesopotamia, some of the Amarna letters, especially the ones written by Tushrata, reflect on the reigns of kings earlier in the Mitanni dynasty. They certainly indicate that the Mitanni kings had an idea of the past and historiography, even if the idea was not well developed in writing. The Collapse of Mitanni After Amenhotep III died, it marked the beginning of the end of the long period of relative peace and stability in the Near East. 
When Akhenaten replaced Amenhotep III, he immediately set about to change Egypt, and today he is most famous for implementing an aggressive religious change that made the Aten the sole god worshipped. There are signs that Akhenaten met some domestic resistance to his new theology, but he continued his father's foreign policy of friendship with Tushrata and Mitanni, seemingly without issue. According to a letter from Tushrata to Akhenaten, the former officially congratulated the new Egyptian king by sending yet another Mitanni princess as a gift. Say to Nimurea, the king of Egypt, my brother, my son-in-law, whom I love and who loves me, thus to Srata, the king of Mitanni, your father-in-law, who loves you, your brother, for me all goes well, for you may all go well, for your household, for your wives, for your sons, for your magnates, for your chariots, for your horses, for your warriors, for your country, and whatever else belongs to you may all go very, very well. In view of friendly relations, Maini, my brother's messenger, came to take my brother's wife to become the mistress of Egypt. I read and reread the tablet that he brought to me, and I listened to its words. Very pleasing indeed were the words of my brother. I rejoiced on that day as if I had seen my brother in person. I made that day and night a festive occasion. Within six months I will send Kelia, my messenger, and Maini, my brother's messenger. I will deliver my brother's wife, and they will bring her to my brother. May Sauska, my mistress, the mistress of all lands and of my brother, and Amman, the god of my brother, make her the image of my brother's desire. Although Akhenaten has been portrayed as having no interest in foreign affairs, since they were essentially unnecessary to his religious reforms, all archaeological and primary source evidence indicates he was willing to maintain the status quo in the Levant with Mitanni and the Hittites. However, despite reaffirming Egypt's alliance with Mitanni, Akhenaten was powerless to protect Tushrata or stop the general decline of his ally to the east. Tushrata's time on the Mitanni throne ended just as it had begun, with plenty of chaos and violence. Historians are unsure of how Tushrata was assassinated, but nearly all agree that he was murdered by forces within the Mitanni royal family. One theory is that the faction of nobles who were initially opposed to Tushrata resisted him the whole time and eventually gained the support of the Hittites. Sometime toward the end of Tushrata's reign, a rival claimant to the throne named Artatama, the 2nd of May, have controlled a region of northwest Mitanni. As the rival faction within Mitanni fought Tushrata and his forces, Tushrata may have been murdered by one of his sons. Another theory holds that Tushrata's assassin was his nephew and future Mitanni king, Shutana III in the mid-14th century BC. Neither Atatama II nor Shutana III ruled very long, as they found it nearly impossible to consolidate their power from within Mitanni and simultaneously fight back the Hittites and Assyrians. The situation for the Mitanni Empire became critical after 1340 BC, though Atatama II initially had success re-establishing the dynasty and stemming the tide of Hittite and Assyrian aggression. However, the Hittites kept bringing pressure from the north and the west, while the Assyrians marched closer to the Hurrian homeland from the south and the east. The Hittites and Assyrians were both difficult problems to handle at any time on their own, but since they began their expansions at nearly the same time, and their campaigns coincided with the internal feuds in Mitanni, the Mitanni kings could do little to stop them. Although Egypt was their ally, and they had by then had a long tradition of friendship, Egypt after Akhenaten was experiencing its own internal problems and was unable or unwilling to help Mitanni. The Mitanni kings not only had to deal with the numbers of their enemies, but also the supreme capabilities of one of their enemies in particular. Supiluliuma I of Hatti. The Hittite king wisely used the internal struggles of the Mitanni royalty to his advantage, while at the same time leading his army south of the Taurus River against a Mitanni vassal state named Nukashshe. Tushrata was still the Mitanni king at the time, and although he lost Nukashshe to the Hittites, he was able to prevent their further advances into Mitanni territory. Tushrata would not have long to enjoy his proclaimed victory, though, 
as Superluliuma regathered his forces for an even larger, more sustained campaign into Mitanni territory. Superluliuma assembled his force in Hatti and marched across the Taurus River, south into Mitanni territory. The campaign began in the border region of Ishua before moving farther into the Hurian heartland and Wasukani. The war was commemorated on a later text known as the Shatiwaza Treaty. It read, I, the son Supiluliumus, the great king, the king of the Hatti land, the valiant, the favourite of the storm god, went to war. Because of the king Tusrata's presumptuousness, I crossed the Euphrates and invaded the country of Isua. The country of Isua I vanquished for the second time and made them again my subjects. I proceeded to the provincial city Suta and ransacked it. I reached Wasukani. The inhabitants of the provincial centre Suta, together with their possessions and together with their deportees, I brought to the Hatti land. Tusrata, the king, had departed. He did not come to meet me in battle. I took prisoner Sutatara together with his son, his Marianu, his brothers, and with all that they owned, and brought them to the Hatti land. Because of King Tusrata's presumptuousness, I raided all these countries in a single year and conquered them for the Hatti land. On this side I made Mount Niblani, on the other side the Euphrates my frontier. Interestingly, Tushrata apparently attempted the same strategy Paratana employed years earlier against the Egyptians by retreating to the Mitanni interior, but it was unsuccessful against the Hittites. Since Mitanni was much closer to Hatti than it was to Egypt, with some planning the Hittites were able to overcome the logistical problems of a long-distance military campaign. Tushrata met his fate at his own people's hands sometime after the Hittite destruction of Washukani, and this marked the beginning of the end for the Mitanni Empire. As mentioned previously, Artatama II won back some land Mitanni lost to the Hittites, but his victory was brief and unable to be followed up by Shutana III. What was left of the state of Mitanni effectively became a Hittite vassal by the rule of its last king, Shatiwaza or Kurtiwaza. The most important document from Shatiwaza's reign is the eponymous treaty he signed with Superluliuma, which made clear he was a subordinate to the Hittite king and that Mitanni was no longer a great kingdom. If you, Kurtiwaza, the prince and the sons of the Huri country do not fulfill the words of this treaty, may the gods, the lords of the oath, blot you out, Kurtiwaza and the Huri men together with your country, your wives and all that you have. May they draw you like malt from its hull. Just as one does not obtain a plant from Bubuwahi, even so may you Kurtiwaza with a second wife that you may take, and the hurry men with your wives, your sons and your country have no seed. These gods of the contracting parties may bring misery and poverty over you. May they overturn your throne, Kurtiwaza. The Hittite language text was clearly written from the perspective of the superior Sopiluluma to his inferior, Shatiwaza. Sopiluliuma never related what would happen to him if Sopiluliuma decided to break the oath, because oaths in the ancient Near East were meant for the inferior party to be followed. Interestingly, the text does offer a slight ray of hope to Shatiwaza that if he follows the rules, the greatness of Mitanni may return. If, on the other hand, you, Kutiwaza, the prince and the Hurrians, Fulfill this treaty and this oath. May these gods protect you, Kurtiwaza, together with your wife, the daughter of the Hatti land, her children and her children's children, and also you, the Hurrians, together with your wives, your children and your children's children, and together with your country. May the Mitanni country return to the place which it occupied before. May it thrive and expand. As it turned out, the Assyrians would make sure that Shatiwaza was never able to restore Mitanni to its glory years. In fact, the Hurrians experienced repeated setbacks and widespread devastation to their land at the hands of the Assyrians. Between the 14th and 11th centuries BC, the Assyrians were able to expand their borders from a city-state based around Asher, and in the process, the Middle Assyrian Empire became a major regional power in the Near East, not to mention a military juggernaut. The Assyrians also developed a sophisticated corpus of written material during this period and became exceptional diplomats. 
Since Middle Assyrian society became dominated by the military, it had something similar to the feudal structure that dominated Europe in the Middle Ages. Although the expansion of the Assyrian state during the Middle Assyrian period was fairly gradual, the rule of Asher Ubalit I in the mid 14th century BC is generally viewed as the beginning of the period and also when the expansion began. Asher Ubalit I was able to take advantage of troubles outside the Assyrian kingdom by annexing territories to Assyria's east after the Hittites attacked Mitanni, and by the rule of the Assyrian king, Tukulti Ninurta, the first in the late 13th century BC, the Assyrians had consumed the Mitanni kingdom east of the Euphrates River and were well on the way to wiping out that entire kingdom. The Assyrians may have been upstarts in the geopolitical system of the late Bronze Age near East, but they learned quickly and impressed their peers. The Assyrian king Asher Ubalit began cutting chunks of the eastern Mitanni Empire away, starting with locations in the Assyrian heartland such as Nineveh and Asher. An unknown Egyptian king, possibly I, had no problem forgetting about the Egyptian Mitanni alliance and welcoming Asher Ubalit into the Great Powers Club. Say to the king of Egypt, thus Asur Ubalit, the king of Assyria, for you, your household, for your country, for your chariots and your troops, may all go well. I send my messenger to you to visit you and to visit your country. Up to now, my predecessors have not written. Today I write you. Once the Assyrians were accepted into the Great Powers Club, though, they apparently had the same perceived problem as the Mitanni, not receiving enough gold from the Egyptians. Ashurubalit even complained in a letter that he was the equal of Mitanni, Hanigalbat, and thus should receive as much gold. Is such a present that of a great king? Gold in your country is dirt. One simply gathers it up. Why are you so sparing of it? I am engaged in building a new palace. Send me as much gold as is needed for its adornment. When Asunadin Ahe, my ancestor, wrote to Egypt, twenty talents of gold were sent to him. When the king of Hanigalbat wrote to your father in Egypt, he sent two talents of gold to him. Now I am the equal of the king of Hanigalbat, but you sent me not enough for the pay of my messengers on the journey to and back. Asher Ubalit's campaigns may have made him the equal of the kings of Mitanni, but his activities ensured that his successors would be their superiors. Assyrian king Adad Nirari all but finished off Mitanni during his long rule. And as was common with all Assyrian rulers at the end of the Bronze Age, Adad Nirari chronicled all of his major military campaigns. He mentioned several Mitanni cities by name and refers to the Hurrians generally as Subarians. Part of the chronicle reads Adad Nirari, illustrious prince, honored of God, lord, viceroy of the gods, city founder, destroyer of the mighty hosts of Kassites, Kuti, Lulumi, and Shubari who destroys all foes north and south, who tramples down their lands from Lubdu and Rapiku to Eluhat, who conquers Taidi, Shuri, Kahat, Amasaki, Hura, Shuduhi, Nabula, Ushukani and Iridi, the whole Kashiayeri region, as far as Eluhat, the fortress of Sudi, the fortress of Haran, as far as Karkamish, which is on the bank of the Euphrates, great-grandson of Asur Ubalit, the mighty king whose priesthood in the great temple was glorious, the peace of whose reign was established to distant lands, firm as a mountain, who destroyed the armies of the widespreading Shubari, who enlarged boundary and frontier. The Assyrians had pretty much conquered the eastern part of Mitanni at that point, but they still faced Hurrian resistance in what was once the western region of Mitanni. In response, Adad-Nirari I ended the Mitanni state and seriously threatened the survival of the Hurrian people. By the early 13th century BC, the conflict shifted from the surviving Mitanni to the Hittites and Assyrians battling for dominance, with most of the remaining city-states and principalities that had a notable Hurrian or Mitanni cultural background being part of Hatti. The surviving Hurrians no doubt felt a bit closer to the Hittites, as they worshipped many of the same gods, and also had a fair share of familiarity. The Assyrians, though, were not content with controlling their little slice of northern Mesopotamia. They continued to make forays into former Mitanni territory in Syria and the northern Levant. 
One of the last Assyrian mentions of Mitanni was made during the reign of Shalmaneser, the first in the mid-13th century BC. When, at the behest of the great gods, I advanced against the land of Hanigalbat with the mighty hosts of my lord Assur, I forced my way over difficult roads and narrow passes. Shaturara, king of Hani, the army of Hittites and Arameans with him, I surrounded. I killed countless numbers of his defeated and widespreading hosts. Against the king himself, at the point of the spear, unto the setting of the sun, I waged battle. I cut down their hordes, fourteen thousand four hundred of them I overthrew and took as living captives. Nine of his strongholds, his capital city, I captured. One hundred and eighty of his cities I overturned to tells and ruins. The army of the Hittites and Alami, Arameans, his allies, I slaughtered like sheep. At that time, from the city of Taidi to the city of Iridi, the whole Kashiari mountain region, to the city of Eluhat, the stronghold of Sudi, the stronghold of Haran as far as Carchemish, which is on the bank of the Euphrates, I captured their cities. Their lands I brought under my sway, and the rest of their cities I burned with fire. The Shaturara mentioned was a puppet Mitanni prince, who ruled at the pleasure of the Hittites. He may have had the same name as earlier Mitanni kings, but he was far from their greatness or power. By the middle of the 13th century, Mitanni had been reduced to just another Hurrian principality that needed Hittite protection from the Assyrians. The late second millennium BC was a period of unrest in the Near East, especially as the Bronze Age was swept away and replaced by the Iron Age. The transition to the Iron Age proved to be especially violent, and it brought about the end of the Great Powers Club as a mysterious coalition of warrior tribes known collectively as the Sea Peoples ravaged the coastal kingdoms of the eastern Mediterranean, and they destroyed the kingdoms of Ugarit and Hatti, and nearly destroyed Egypt as well. Since they were located further inland from the Mediterranean coast, the Assyrians did not suffer as much from the Sea Peoples' attacks, but the empire was not totally immune to the general situation either. A group of Semitic-speaking people, known as the Arameans, began to attack and ravage numerous Mesopotamian cities around this same time. The Aramean raids became the primary focus of Tiglath Pileser's reign, a fact mentioned in the historical annals. With the help of Assur, my lord, I led forth my chariots and warriors and went into the desert. Into the midst of the Alami, Arameans, enemies of Assur, my lord, I marched. The country from Suhi to the city of Karkimish, in the land of Hatti, I raided in one day. I slew their troops, their spoil, their goods and their possessions in countless numbers I carried away. The rest of their forces, which had fled from before the terrible weapons of Assur, my lord, and had crossed over the Euphrates. In pursuit of them I crossed the Euphrates in vessels made of skins. Six of their cities, which lay at the foot of the mountain of Beshri, I captured. I burned with fire. I laid them waste. I destroyed them. Their spoil, their goods and their possessions I carried away to my city Assur. Despite tiglath pileser's best efforts, the Aramean hordes eventually reduced the Assyrian Empire to its original heartland around Asher by 1050 BC. It will probably never be definitively determined how and why the Assyrians survived the collapse of the Bronze Age in the first place, but it was likely due to their military prowess. When the Assyrians crawled out of Asher after the interregnum imposed on the region by the Arameans and Sea Peoples, they quickly established themselves as the most powerful people in the Near East. There are numerous extant primary sources from this period, not only because the Assyrians became meticulous compilers of their annals, but also because other peoples, most notably the Israelites, also wrote about the Assyrians. Beautiful and detailed pictorial reliefs have also been excavated from the royal palaces in Asher, Nineveh and Kala, that depict numerous battlefield tactics and weapons in great detail. Ironically, the fact that the Assyrians kept such detailed records helped ensure that the Mitanni, who did not, would be rediscovered thousands of years later. The End of the Bronze Age The period in the eastern Mediterranean region immediately before the arrival of the Sea Peoples is generally viewed as a time of peace and plenty. Peace existed between the major powers of the region, 
Egypt, Hatti and the Aegean kingdoms and trade flourished between the Black Sea and Egypt and from the Euphrates River to the Aegean Sea. However, within a few decades, the Bronze Age system that had been carefully crafted by the various kingdoms of the ancient Near East through a combination of diplomacy and military conquest was quickly swept away by what one historian has called arguably the worst disaster in ancient history, even more calamitous than the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Still other scholars have stressed the importance of the movement of the Sea Peoples during this period as the catalyst for the collapse of the Bronze Age Mediterranean, and that they changed the face of the ancient world more than any other single event before the time of Alexander the Great. Essentially, no modern scholars mitigate the significance of the transition from the Bronze to the Iron Age, but there are a bunch of differing opinions as to what precipitated it. A review of the modern literature pertaining to the collapse of the Bronze Age Mediterranean political system reveals that most scholars favour one explanation instead of incorporating several into a cohesive theory. Some theories are easier to discount than others, while some are difficult to dismiss. But ultimately scholars are left with a dearth of primary sources, ultimately making a final resolution to the question difficult. One theory that sounds logical at first glance but cannot hold up to any reasonable analysis is that there were several devastating earthquakes. Although perhaps hundreds of earthquakes happened in the 12th century BC throughout the eastern Mediterranean, archaeological evidence shows that new dwellings were built at most of the sites affected, and as Robert Drews points out, any damage caused by earthquakes would have been limited since there was no electricity at the time to start fires. Two other theories that Drews refutes concerns the Sea Peoples directly, mass human migrations and extended and extreme bouts of piracy. The idea of mass human migrations was a popular theory for many decades, perhaps owing to the more known and studied demise of the Western Roman Empire, which was caused at least partially by waves of Germanic migrations. Nonetheless, Drews argues that there is no definitive evidence to support either mass human migrations or extended piracy as factors for the collapse of the Bronze Age, even as numerous primary sources seem to indicate that mass migrations at least played a role. Hittite texts from the reign of King Supiluliamas, who ruled from about 1380 to 1340 BC, indicate that a migration of people had already taken place from Asia Minor, modern Turkey, into the Levant. Furthermore, some Sea People's invasions had civilians accompany the raiders, an indication that they were attempting to migrate. Nonetheless, whether the mass migrations of the Sea Peoples and the piracy that accompanied brought about the collapse of the Bronze Age, or were the results of that collapse remain unclear. Similar to the earthquake theory, but more believable, at least on a localised level, is the role that drought or other environmental factors played in the collapse of the Bronze Age. No one will argue that environmental factors play a role in the development of any culture and that societies may collapse if the environment becomes too rigid, but both Drews and Nancy Sanders have pointed out that any evidence for extreme climatic change in the eastern Mediterranean region during the late second millennium BC is anecdotal at best. That said, it must be pointed out that drought may have played a role in the movement of at least some of the Sea Peoples and the eventual collapse of the Bronze Age, as there are primary texts that hint to some kind of catastrophic drought in the region during the period. For example, one letter written at the time indicates that grain was sent from Egypt to Hatti in order to alleviate drought conditions in Asia Minor, and in the 5th century BC, the Greek historian Herodotus wrote about how the Lydian people of Asia Minor were forced to move due to drought conditions. The Lydians were the first people we know of to use a gold and silver coinage and to introduce retail trade, and they also claim to have invented the games which are now commonly played by themselves and by the Greeks. These games are supposed to have been invented at the time when they sent a colony to settle in Tyrrhenia, and the story is that in the reign of Attis, the son of Mainz, the whole of Lydia suffered from a severe famine. For a time, the people lingered on as patiently as they could, but later, when there was no improvement, they began to look for something to alleviate their misery. 
Although Herodotus gives no time frame for when this migration took place, the importance of the drought is central, and as will be discussed further below, the Lydians are believed by modern scholars to be one of the major Sea Peoples tribes. Drought may have played a factor in the eventual movements of the Sea Peoples and the ultimate collapse of the Bronze Age Mediterranean, but the collapse of the political and diplomatic system that the various kingdoms developed also needs to be considered. The late second millennium BC Eastern Mediterranean and Near East was a time and place of peace and plenty, where Egyptians, Hittites, Mesopotamians, Semites and Mycenaeans traded goods and ideas, and where military conflict, although not rare, was often a last resort and never used in a total war capacity. At the same time, the system that the larger and more powerful kingdoms, such as Egypt and the Hittites, developed was all reliant upon the idea that every state knew its place in the international hierarchy. So if one of those pieces was somehow disrupted or even destroyed, it could have thrown the whole system into anarchy. Sandars, in particular, has argued that the Hittites provided stability to the Mediterranean and Near Eastern regions, and that the collapse of their empire was one of the major causes for the Dark Age that overtook the region. Indeed, the Hittite Empire had some inherent problems that were exposed with the onslaught of the Sea People's invasions in the late 13th and early 12th centuries BC. Perhaps most importantly, the Hittites were essentially a landlocked people whose capital, Hattusa, was located far inland in the mountains. Due to this location, the Hittites were forced to rely on neighbouring vassal states such as Ugarit and the Luka people, who proved to be unreliable. In fact, the Luka were completely untrustworthy because they are believed to have been one of the groups of Sea Peoples, as will be discussed further below. Moreover, the Hittite political and military system was extremely archaic, even for that time, as it was dependent on a feudal system and the use of chariots that were quickly becoming obsolete militarily. After the reign of Sopoluliamus around 1180 BC, the Hittite Empire was cursed with a succession of ineffective rulers and crop failures, so there was little the once mighty empire could do to stave off the attacks from the Sea Peoples and other migratory bands of people. Ancient letters found in Ugarit, an ally of the Hittites located in modern Syria, indicates a sense of impending doom among the inhabitants in the area. One letter from Ugarit's King Amurapi to the King of Alasia reported, My father behold, the enemy's ships came here. My cities were burned, and they did evil things in my country. Does not my father know that all my troops and chariots are in the land of Hatti, and all my ships are in the land of Luka? Thus the country is abandoned to itself. May my father know it. The seven ships of the enemy that came here inflicted much damage upon us. Amurapi also apparently asked for help from the viceroy of Carchemish, who responded, As for what you have written to me, ships of the enemy have been seen at sea. Well, you must remain firm. Indeed, for your part, where are your troops, your chariots stationed? Are they not stationed near you? No, behind the enemy who press upon you. Surround your towns with ramparts. Have your troops and chariots enter there and await the enemy with great resolution. Although the Hittites may have suffered more than any of the great powers of the time since their empire totally collapsed during the period, other great empires suffered and nearly collapsed as well. The Egyptian Empire did not collapse as the Hittite Empire did, but it was severely damaged by the Sea People's attacks, and even prior to those attacks, the empire showed definite signs of decay. Like the Hittites, the Egyptians provided a sense of stability to the region, especially the Levant so when the Pharaonic state began to weaken, it opened the door for interlopers to invade and settle. Egypt was also saddled with a royal succession problem in the New Kingdom, because Rameses II outlived most of his successors while ruling from 1290 to 1224 BC. By the time his successor did come to the throne, Menepta, king to 1224 to 1204 BC, inherited numerous problems including potential invasions by their Libyan neighbours. Along with the decay of Egypt and Hatti, an important component of the collapse involved the flourishing Mycenaean culture in mainland Greece and the Aegean islands. 
The Mycenaeans also contributed to the stability of the region, even if it was nowhere near as old or powerful as the Hittite and Egyptian empires in the 13th century BC. Despite being a younger civilization, the Mycenaeans had developed an impressive culture that was at least partially dependent on grain imports from Egypt, so the disruption of those grain imports caused severe problems in mainland Greece and the Aegean, which led to the Mycenaean culture disappearing shortly thereafter. It is obvious that the collapse of the region's political systems helped bring an end to the Bronze Age, but the question remains whether it was the Sea Peoples who brought about the collapse or if they were merely taking advantage of the situation. One final theory concerning the end of the Bronze Age is important because it relates to new military tactics and directly involves the Sea Peoples. Druze believes that a new method of warfare was the primary reason for the end of the Bronze Age, but he does not delve too deeply into the peoples who brought those tactics into the region, the Sea Peoples, or what compelled them to do so. Although Druze rules out piracy as a major factor for the collapse of the Bronze Age, Redford argues that one particular Sea Peoples tribe, the Shardana, may have proved to be an inspiration to others. He wrote that the military success of the Shardana may have prompted others to attack locales in the Mycenaean world with the aim of piracy, and Sandars concurs that the raiders had their eyes on material objectives like cattle, gold, women and other movable material objects. As the Greek historian Thucydides noted, for in early times the Hellenes and the barbarians of the coast and islands were tempted to turn to piracy under the conduct of their most powerful men. They would fall upon a town unprotected by walls and would plunder it, no disgrace being yet attached to such an achievement, but even some glory. The wealth of the established Bronze Age kingdoms no doubt was a pulling factor that enticed